Hello and welcome everyone to the second week of the Mythic Dungeon International. I am your host, Doe, with me starting out today, our mix, titles, ends, ironic. And uh, we're back. It's another weekend of Dragonflight. It's another weekend of dungeon delving. And uh, it's going to be a good one. We've got Group B. We finished Group A last week. We saw Echo and Sloth make it out of that one. Uh, group B, though, the question is, now that we're done with Echo... Do you feel like this group is going to be a little bit more competitive? Do you feel like there's a little bit more of a question as we look at the teams involved makes uh, as far as who might get through? Yeah, I, I think they're a little bit closer to each other. Of course, with Echo, it's always like, you know, they're Echo. But I want to say Sloth gave them a run for it. So that was also very exciting. But looking at this uh, matchup of teams today, there is a couple of teams that I'm so excited for. I'm really hoping Perplex is going to give us their all and really kind of play like they played when they were really, really good and consistently would, would eke up with Echo. But there's also a bunch of new teams that I'm super excited about and I kind of have to say it right from the get-go. There's a German team uh, with like full German players and I'm super excited for them. They're called Cement Gaming for weird lore reasons, but um, yeah, very, very exciting right. to see them. And Curious. I can also leak that they're probably not going to play uh, one of those team comps that we saw a lot of in the last weekend. Mm. So I think we're a little bit in for some surprises in terms of classes. All right, the secret tech possibly coming out from uh, Cement. Uh, do you think we might see the, the meta shift at all here in week two, Tettles, now that we've seen uh, a whole weekend of dungeons being run? Do you feel like comps are going to be uh, adjusted a little bit? I think, I, I don't want to say that comps are like super set in stone, but I think that the composition, especially after the interview that we had with uh, Jinji last weekend, kind of reaffirmed that that Feral Druid and Holy DK Shadow Priest comp that we saw a lot of was going to probably continue to be fairly popular. So whenever mm -hmm. teams deviate from that a little bit, uh, that's going to be a little bit of a shakeup in the meta. I do I do think that there are some opportunities for things such as uh, Rogue and Spreest, especially at the very high end, to also be possible in some of these dungeons. It just really depends on dungeon level affixes and the utility that is provided by those classes in those very specific situations. I can't. I can't hear Doa. It, is he talking? Neither can I. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I muted well. the cough, and then I forgot to unmute. I'm sorry. That is I'm sorry. God, that's so <laughs> awkward. That's, that's one. Chat, chat, chat. Type one. That is one mute. I made from it, Doa this week. I made it almost five minutes in. Almost five minutes yeah. into the broadcast this week. It's a, it's a new right. record. It's a new record, I'm ladies and gentlemen. Every, <laughs> I'm not on for every segment, but I'm going to need you guys to count every single time. Okay? It's it's not just Doa. It's for everybody. Yeah. All right. That's we got good. that well, one go. out of the Here's... way for today. You know, like it's done for today. That's good. Uh, you're very optimistic, Mix, and I appreciate that about you. That's, that's one of my favorite <laughs> qualities that, that you have. But let's let's take a look at our affixes for dungeons here. Uh, the key levels are a little bit uh, different. I'm kind of curious about that 20 ruby life pools. That was already a pretty quick dungeon anyway. But we might see some blazingly fast times this uh, this week. Yeah, we could see some pretty fast dungeons. I think the big thing to keep an eye on is which keys are swapped around at the high end. So, of course, last week we had uh, we had the Azure Vault at 23. That's been dropped to a 22. And in taking that spot of the other 23 dungeon, we have the Algathar Academy on Fortified, which means there is a lot of potential for, like, super high damage peaks because the trash packs will live even longer in that dungeon. We could definitely see some of the highest DPS peaks. We've, you know, even more than we saw last weekend. But in we terms also of, like, know... difficulty of dungeons... I don't think I think this week actually looks relatively easier compared to last week's because those affixes on the high level keys are not that bad. Yeah, we we were talking to so like we sent out like a survey beforehand and donuts were talking specifically about the Algathar Academy 23 being something that they're, you know, a little bit scared of because typically these MDI teams are more scared of sanguine just as a general affix because we see this in a lot of situations. Sanguine can cause a, a fairly large time loss. But in addition to that, like on that 23 level, that just opens you up for a, a, a world where you can have a lot of mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so looking through these, you know, what dungeon does look the scariest now coming into uh, to Group B, in your opinion? I'll throw that to you, Mix. Uh, I would have to agree with the uh, Agathar Academy. I think the 23 there's just not that many that have been run on life either 
So with that being 23, a lot can happen in there. And like uh, Teltra said, Sanguine is always a problem. But I'm also looking forward to, to some of the tyrannical keys. Like speaking about that Court of Stars, that could be very fun. Uh, or even the Temple. Yeah, some of the bosses in Temple get uh, extremely scary when you have to fight them for that longer amount of time because of tyrannical. So might see some uh, team struggle, but... You know, then again, why is Mari, I, I feel like Zyronic, never never really causes issues. Like, she's not, you know, she's not really a boss you're too concerned about. No one really has any complaints. Really? You know? Yeah, yeah, so I think she'll be fine. I, I think everyone will be jumping right into that temple. Yeah, they won't be, especially the first boss, it's fine. Why is Mari is the hardest boss in the game? <laughs> Prove me wrong. Bro. I... Dude, I, I don't think there's ever a time where, like, I tune into a, a team doing a key and everybody's alive on that boss. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. I got a theory. Whenever you get that circle on you on that on that boss, you just become a nervous bird and your brain stops working for a second. <laughs> and then you immediately jump into the puddle because you're trying to get away with the circle on you. And then you just die. And it happens to literally everybody. It's, or, or thundering comes out while the wash away is happening. You're like... Either I'm getting stunned by thundering or I'm jumping into the wash away and then you accidentally jump into the puddle and, the, and die as well. I, it, I swear that that dungeon makes people's brains do unexplained things well, sometimes. <laughs> my theory has always been that Wise Mari actually, one, like one of the hidden mechanics is that it has a eye detection through your webcam and it like it looks, at, whenever you look at something oh. other than her, like something on your UI sure. and then she's like, and then that's when it, the, the beam comes right at you, you know? Do any of you guys experience. do the do the counting? Like whenever I'm on Wise Mari, I go one, two, not save. One, two, not save with every of the little water smart. bubbles. And then I forget everything else that I'm doing because my brain gotta, is busy counting. <laughs> I got a week or for you guys if you want. <laughs> that, that, that puts oh, a yeah. bar on your screen with the timer. <laughs> hook us up, Tuttles. That might be... Well, I got, I got the hook up. Hold on. Keep talking, I'll find it. Is really good. He's, he's gonna post right now. <laughs> because, wow, what a guy! Because here's the secret right. thing, actually, about that, those pulses. It's actually three pulses, and then like it's an into instant explosion yeah. right after the third pulse. Yeah, exactly. So if you're dying to that at home. There you go. Little tip. But it's not like, is it like the same amount of time after the third pulse? Because it feels like it comes a little bit quicker after the third pulse. It's not like bum 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 explodes. Yeah. Like bum 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 explode. Yeah, and maybe exactly. I've got that wrong. That's, That's just kind of like the feel I get. Yeah. Well, no, there you right. go. We we could <laughs> we could dive deeper into into the the waters around Wise Mari if we wanted to, but let's instead talk about our uh, either the bracket or the first matchup. Let's let's check it out. There we go. Our first matchup here: the ban from uh, Boar's Money Crew on Court of Stars, and then we have the ban from Perplexed on the Azure Vault. So we are going to the Temple of the Jade Serpent. I told you, I told you, everybody just is excited to just jump into the tyrannical twenty-two Jade Serpent. Can't wait. <laughs> I really we like are watching starting with Jade that Temple. Ruby Life pools, though. I think that uh, I think that Temple of the Jade Serpent is actually very fun to watch from an MDI perspective. It's uh, so fast, and then whenever you see like some of the top teams, the strategies that they'll implement inside of this dungeon it is actually very dangerous. It is a twenty-two mm -hmm. tyrannical, which means that the trash should actually be. I don't want to say easier than last week to kill, but like last week they had bolstering in this dungeon, which is an added element of like danger. Um, but I, I think that like we should see some pretty large courtyard pulls just because it is a 22 tyrannical so the trash should be able to die especially whenever you're running this unholy death knight centric composition um, for ruby life pools I wonder how much has changed between time trials and now because both ruby life pools and jade serpent are two of the time trial dungeons so these teams they should be some of their more experienced dungeons yeah, that's true. I mean, that's going to be something where, you know, I mean, I would imagine all these teams have run a lot of these dungeons quite a bit, but uh, Ruby Life Pools, I like that it, it's going to feel like a little bit of a warm-up maybe coming into this one. The Affex is on the second boss. That might get a little bit <laughs> scary. Excuse me. But we will see. It was dying. As we're getting ready. <laughs> Map number one. That was Wise Mari. She just ganked me when, as soon as the camera went away. <laughs> she's drowned. lurking she's, in the shadows. But she's not. I'm newly drowned. Uh, she's not here. I've been getting. Uh, I've been getting the debuffs all year, dude. It's a. It's a season no. for, for debuffs. Eat your vitamin C. That's actually a myth, but it's still healthy. Okay, question, Zyro. Are we going to see double destroyer since it is a fortified region? Ooh, you think that's going uh, to happen? Oof. Last time was tyrannical. 
Fortified Raging. I mean, if they run, if they run Evoker plus Feral, they have two en enraged spells, right? So like, I, yeah. I don't see that being too too much of an issue. It's just the Fortified that I think mm -hmm. is the problem. And I think the comp that we think they're going to run has a lot of great tools for just living through the Fortified damage, right? It's still a level twenty key, so I don't think that like the dungeon affixes are too inhibiting to the double destroyer pull. I think if this was like a 23 fortified, we probably wouldn't see double destroyer, but I'd be very surprised if Perplex didn't go for a double destroyer pull here. Well, we're going to find out in just right. a moment as things get started. A lot of people, uh, you know, saying Perplexed is uh, the group to watch or the uh, team to watch in the group, rather, to get through. There's going to be some other threats, obviously, but uh, Boar's Money Crew has a work cut off for them coming to this first series, so uh, we'll see what they can do. I will say something about this this team that we haven't really talked about Boris Money Crew too much, right? This is a team that yeah. didn't qualify particularly high, but they have a substitute player from Time Trials to through this match. Hopeful's in this, in this group, and he is like a Fire Mage main all the way, so I fully expect him to be playing Fire Mage in this dungeon. I'm not sure how good it'll be on like our lowest key level that we possibly have, but this is a pretty mm -hmm. good dungeon for Fire Mage. A lot of priority uh, targets, so let's see how it goes. Here. Oh, yeah, there we go. The Fire Mage. Excitement. Here we go. I talked to Moat Moat going into Group A, and I was like, hey, what do you think are the chances on seeing this come out? And he was like, yeah, if we see a Fire Mage, Mage then maybe we're going to see Disc as well, because they work really well together. Um, but yeah, there we go. Big pulls on both sides. Yeah, here Going we go. Big really, pull from really both big teams. Here. Yeah, Bloodlust wow. on both sides is going to be popped here. And I'm just looking at the Fire Mage damage. I know you play Mage at the moment, Cyro. Tell me a little bit about about that damage. We're close to 1 million. Oh, can reach it? I'm not sure, but it's so, so close. 960k in peak for Hopeful here on the side of Boar's Money Crew. But Perplexed seem to have already at least activated the boss event while bringing the Defiler towards that boss area, finishing up that trash really, really quickly, whereas Boar's Money Crew is still fighting with some of it. Oh, they're already yeah, on well, boss Boar's as well. Boar's Money Crew already pulled the boss. <laughs> they had already started the RP. This yeah. is great. This is like, I mean, I would almost say Boar's Money Crew might be a tiny bit ahead here with that extra damage from the Fire Mage over the Rogue from Perplexed. Pretty impressive right away. Fire Mage is something that is like extremely strong when you have a priority target and you just want to do passive AoE cleave to everything around it. Because the way Fire Mage does damage right now is it does pure single target damage and then it just spreads its ignites through Fire Blast. And I mean, it's like the, the best single target in the game in a lot of situations and then it just gets free cleave from it. And you can see that, you know, bursting for almost a million AoE damage, keeping up with the Unholy DK is stupidly powerful. They are already falling a little yeah. bit behind Perplex, though. It looks like Perplex is getting a little bit more funnel onto the boss here. <laughs> I mean, they do have a, a Feral Druid, and even though there's been some uh, speculation on that, they do have some funnel going on. But also, something we should maybe talk about is Shine on that Rogue. Uh, looking at the time trials, there were a lot of Rogues played. But going into Group A, we didn't really see them all too much. Now coming back here for Perplex, how are you feeling about um, that pickup? in comparison to Shadow Priest, which is what we saw last week a lot. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. It seems like in almost all scenarios, Rogue is something that's just a little bit worse for damage overall than the Shadow Priest, but of course Rogue still does you know, have a lot of its strengths that it's had in previous expansions, right? It's still a relatively solid overall DPS spec. It can just, when he's playing Subtlety as he is right now, you can pretty much just choose between doing pure single target damage from Eviscerating or Black Powdering on AoE. Um, and then, of course, you know, typical rogue utility, right? Shroud, lots of single target CC, just really good overall dungeon control. And you can see, based off the damage meters right here, he's obviously just spamming pure single target damage and, let us, and letting us unholy and feral go crazy. So you can see the difference from, you know, having someone that's literally just funneling into single target is just, it's already put perplexed, you know, a solid 15 seconds ahead, even though they actually pulled the boss later than Boris Money Crew. Yeah, something I also want to note, on the side of Perplexed, we have, of course, the two Blood Elf racials from Ashine and from Swag. And on the side of Boris Money Crew, we also have two Blood Elves, but we have the Priest 
and a mage that can also perch. So that's going to be really, really helpful in this dungeon here. Now, uh, Perplexed is on the move, and even though Risen is looking like he's walking sideways here, I'm sure they're setting something up. I want to see if they're going for those double destroyers or if they're going to go a little bit more conservative, but it seems like they're on the run. The first destroyer has been pulled and they're moving towards the next one. This pull is massive. We've seen it last week, but it was tyrannical. We're now on a fortified week and those destroyers are going to hurt a lot. Keep your eyes peeled. They don't have bloodlust. They only have cooldowns available to them. And that's exactly what they're going to do. An army has been popped into this full damage from swag you can see it come out here and those destroyers are dropping really really quickly same thing happening really on boar's money crew though yeah same thing for boar's money crew and i think the important thing to mention for specifically for perplexed is that this is a lot more dangerous for them than it is for, for other teams that we saw last weekend one of the things that made this pull so so simple for a lot of the teams is that they had the vampiric embrace plus the nature's vigil combo that kind of just fully did all of, it, all of its healing for like the first 15 to 20 seconds of the pull and then the, the Revoker could just heal the group after that. Perplex only has the Nature's Vigil, and they still had made, made very quick work of that pull. Of course, Ryson had to use every single cooldown in the book to keep them alive. I think the only thing he has left is the Emerald Communion, but it kind of goes to show you, missing one of those defensive cooldowns for the group definitely causes a lot of extra stress on the healers. Of course, Monikrew, however, also able to deal with that pull, albeit a little bit slower than Perplex. I mean, they also started just a little bit after, but Cousin actually going down here in that AoE, I'm not sure if he got stuck on the floor as one occasionally does. It looked like he was walking in place there for a second, but I'm sure they will bring him back just now as soon as they can. Definitely not the best position, but Sky can rest being on that barrel druid, I think. So I can't see Sky though. Did Sky also die? There is Sky. Oh, Sky also died and he's Oh, I think back Sky also side. died. Oh, oh no, he no. pulled Thunderhead too. Oh, man. That's a this Shadow Melt? Case okay. For them. Shadow Melt? We're out of oh, fight again. Is he good? Okay, alright. But this yeah, is a huge yeah, time saved. Loss, right? They've already lost Definitely. like 30 to 45 seconds here from this. And one of the other things I wanted to mention too is at the end of the dungeon, what we should definitely take a look at is the healer damage difference. I noticed one of the reasons Perplexed was actually so far ahead of Wars Money Curve after that first boss. If you looked at the overall damage meters when the boss went down, so this includes the trash because they just changed it into the boss, I think Bryson was doing nearly 100k DPS like overall, but uh, Cousin for Wars Money Curve was actually doing like 30k. And yeah, you know, power infusion yeah. does factor a little bit of damage, but it doesn't make up like 60k DPS. The big, as far as I understand it, the big difference between Evoker and this priest notably is AoE burst, which Evoker is just really great in. And that first boss has so many like small AoE targets that you can like pull your damage into. Uh, I would love to see a boss damage breakdown between the two healers. I'm not too sure how that's going to look, but in the overall, definitely that Evoker topping topping the disc there is no question about it but let's see how they move on perplexed have pulled the boss into uh all of these ads here and we need to look out we saw some boulder action on the curbs of these pathways in group a and they also seem to play the strat without having done any of the dragons so they started at the very far side of one of the dragons and are now moving in towards the middle while the dragon is flying making the most out of the reduced space that they actually have here this is really important if you play this key on life you usually do one of the dragons so you can walk into one of the directions but you can see fire gold coming down in the background and you don't want to be in range for that so they're they're like inching one step at a time to make sure that they have a lot of room for kokia once again it is fortified so that boss should be just a tiny smidge easier than it was last week and of course, a little bit of a, you know, routing differences from this week to last week. Last week, we saw most of our teams opting to go for a counterclockwise uh, pull pattern around the circle here in the second boss room. Perplexed opted to go for the clockwise one, what we saw from Sloth last week, and they actually skipped that very first three pack on the right side on their first time around when they went for the double destroyer pull. And they ended up doubling back when they pulled the boss here, just pulling it with the boss to get a little bit ex extra free count while they start off the boss. Health bar is very low here, but Ryson not really wanting to expend many of his cooldowns because he knows he's going to need pretty much everything to deal with the next trash pack. There you go, good execution from yeah. Perplex. Still no deaths on the board for them as we, you know, approach what should be Don't the last trash it. pool in the dungeon. <laughs> and I, do they have yeah, the shroud here? I believe they do. Yeah. More than enough 
time to actually skip uh, or percent rather they needed about 70 to skip or to play everything here they had 76 going into this area meaning they can skip the bridge and now this pull like you said is going to be so crazy the flame channelers they have a spell called i think fire uh, something you want to always interrupt that it hurts so bad you need to interrupt it as fast as you can uh flash fire i think it is and then on top of that you have the high chandler rivali and rivali has cost some wipe last week's as well so you need to really make sure that everything is under control we have one more aoe purge from swag that elf is available uh, to make sure those shields go down from these ads so Rivali doesn't stack up on shields. But they're doing so much damage. They nearly finished all of this pull already. And they are close to killing Rivali on top of that without Bloodlust. Really, really nicely done. Super, super clean. Like, like, yeah, like you were mentioning, it's not just about the AoE damage on the group from the lightning storms going off. It's the fact that there are multiple interrupts that you want to get. Not only the flash flyer, like you were mentioning, but also the shock blasts. If those go on anybody other than the yeah. tank, you are 100% dead, like, unless you immune it off. So, yeah, great execution for Perplexed. And look at, the, look at the speed of the dungeon here. Last week, we were talking about how teams wouldn't have the Bloodlust just barely going into that pull. Now, of course, it's a fortified tyrannical diff, but the Bloodlust still isn't up for Perplexed yet. They are destroying this dungeon. They could be on record pace here. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be something Yeah, we well, also right? dropped it two levels, so maybe okay, that also listen, plays into it. Tiny, <laughs> tiny details, you know, tiny, tiny details. <laughs> They're pushing yeah, into phase two and they still don't have lost. They're so crazy fast. It is unfathomable. Two seconds remaining on that blast loss is going to get popped basically instantly as soon yeah as soon as it comes up you can see it coming in now this phase is usually the scary but once again we are in a fortified key so they shouldn't have any problems with it whatsoever even if somebody dies here they still have two battle wrestlers available to them and perplexed are showing up i want to say this is exactly what we wanted to see from them just you know really speedy perfect execution echo level type of gameplay and you're giving it to us i'm so happy one zero for perplexed yeah that was incredibly fast by perplexed and we knew the 20 was going to be quick but I, I don't know if i expected it to be that quick but uh you know we were watching that during the game and and uh, we were all talking about just the damage difference between the preservation evoker and the priest on the other side so I don't know, was was it mostly that? Because I felt like Boar's Money Crew was going okay, but Perplex just getting I, everything done so much quicker. I think that I think that some of the pulls Perplex were doing was the big one. And like this pull in particular, so we didn't see this pull last weekend. This is actually double destroyer on the flame gullet side. And how Perplex set this pack up is they had to wait for Flame Gullet to to perch and to fly away. Um, before they were able to pull into this and then they had basically perfect timing to where they were able to uh skip thunderhead pull trash into this boss and and i thought that the, just the routing by perplex in this dungeon so it is a little bit lower of a key level you're, you're waiting on things like patrol timings and whatnot but perplex had their damage down so well that they knew when the patrol timings were going to be set up in a way that they were good good to go they were gonna have thunderhead in a good position they were gonna have flame gull in a good position and i thought that their routing was going to be the big difference um, just coming into this. Again, we talked about it a little bit before the match started about that rogue. I, I did kind of expect to see the rogue from some of the dungeon or from some of the teams this weekend. And uh, it makes sense that it's being swapped out for like that shadow priest in this dungeon in particular. I think it actually performs quite well in a plus 20 level. And Perplex should be super happy with this Ruby Life Pools. It really starts them off on a, on a good foot. They have what is effectively their version of like a best run that they possibly can have. And like if they if they had any preseason nerves and stuff like this, this is like a super veteran team. But say they had a little mm -hmm. bit of jitters coming into this, there, there are no more after you have that run. No, I mean, and the thing we got to keep in mind too is that this team, of course, like took a one of the weekend cups over Echo uh, back in Shadowlands too. So. They, they've been good for a long time. Uh, this is par for the course for, for Perplexed. And I gotta say, like as, as an evoker healer, it's so nice when you get to have an all melee uh, DPS crew too. It just makes things one so of the, much easier. One of the things I wanna one of the things I wanna highlight on the screen is like we see a shine's damage at like 162k effective DPS. And you do see the other two DPS over 200k. You could add another DPS that adds a little bit more overall damage to the dungeon. 
but at the end of the day, there's like a critical mass for the amount of overall that there is to be had in like this level of a key, especially in a 20. And so a shine is going to be really focusing on priority damage on that sub rogue, just making sure that he's instead of pressing black powder, he's pressing eviscerate on like a lot of the high priority mobs, which Ruby life pools really does set itself up well for. Well, also the other thing I wanted to highlight there too Ooh. was the healer damage. Bryson was doing 60k DPS. Yeah, you can see yeah. that. Cousin was doing 25k. That's just a class difference right there. I mean, Evoker is so, so strong and just putting out all of its AoE and like two GCDs yeah. and then it can just heal for the rest of the time and do that mm -hmm. much damage. It's so disgusting. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, our Warcraft Logs uh, graph, which I personally love. And you can see that very first pull on both sides of the team just spiking in damage nearly four million for both of them and then towards the end there was uh the spike that just completely moved aside that is that big pull on rivali where it goes really high i think um mm. and th that's just where both money crew was so much behind perplexed they, they were very close before but overall less one second here one second there and it added up it's fun. I actually, I think it's cool that you're seeing similar spikes from Boar's Money Crew as you are perplexed. It means that they're doing, you know, similar pulls. And while Boar's Money Crew is the lower seeded team coming to this, they, they are like the eighth seed on the weekend. Uh, they're 20, 23rd seed overall or something like that across the whole entire tournament. I, I thought that they were actually having a fairly competitive uh, dungeon. Now, it, it, yeah. of course, it ended up being very heavily perplexed favored, which is which was to be expected. But I thought that Boar's Money Crew actually showed a lot of promise there. Oh yeah, totally. It makes me uh, look forward to the rest of the dungeons in the series, and I suppose that we'll talk about the next one we are going to. It's Temple of the Jade Serpent. We chatted about this one a little bit before the day began. It is tyrannical, which is a little bit scary. You've got uh, Spiteful and Quaking as well along with that. Uh, it's it's going to be tricky, but uh, you know, how, how worried are you really coming to this one? I think more than anything, we're looking at how the, the trash poles are handled, right? I think of the last room in this dungeon before the boss. We saw some last week take the whole room if they want to be very bold. It was scary because I believe it was fortified last week. Uh, this week might be a little bit easier to do some of those bigger ones, huh? Yeah, I think yeah. the big point here has to be that there's a lot of melee comps right now. Like, you're <laughs> often playing three melees in many of these MDI teams that we are seeing. And as somebody who is a, a self-announced Zook Zook melee brain, I can tell you that's not going to be fun with the Spitefuls. Like, there's, there's not a lot of room to walk in many areas of the dungeons. The, the hallway to Wise Mari, uh, the library area, where it's just, it's a small pathway. And those Spitefuls are going to spawn and you're in there with a lot of melees. It is going to get a little bit spicy, I think. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff you can do to kind of mitigate that, if, if everybody kind of backs away, like the Evoker is going to have Permeating Chill, which makes your blue spells slow, so you can just Azure Blades a bunch of them at once, and that makes it a little bit easier to avoid. But, like, you stand next to a Spiteful Shade for, like, one second, you're going to lose, like, 50% HP. So it'll be something to watch as we get into our second dungeon and see if uh, Boar's Monarch right. can tie it up. Here we go, giant first pull coming out for both teams, nothing being held back here as everything across the board has popped, both Bloodlust being put to use, and we can see the Fire Mage is back in play for Boar's Money Career, so they seem to really like that class for a lot of this stuff. Let's see how good it can do compared up against that Destro lock here. Everything going down very, yeah. very quickly for Boar's Money Crew. Oh, but so many oh. deaths are coming out here. What is happening? Did the droplets stay alive for too long in the back? That must have been the case here, as they're going to quickly run back. Looks like Hopeful's trying to keep the pull alive with Chuckles there. They've got a lot of Spiteful Shades. They might have just barely been able to keep the pull alive here. They've just got a couple of these droplets left. But that's so many deaths on the board. Perplexed already done with the trash packet on to Wise Mari. Yeah, the way Perplexed handled that and was able to kind of pull Wise Mari, get away from these Spitefuls, was really, really beautiful once again. I was a little bit scared for Wolf Disco, just for a second, but then I remembered he plays Warlock and they're basically a tank in cloth. So uh, uh, he, of course, lived <laughs> without uh, needing any external existence, uh, assistance there. But yeah, Boar's Money Crew, unfortunately, a lot of deaths. They need to try and catch up with, it's not going to be easy. But perplexed, 69% boss HP. Very nice. A tyrannical 22 is what we're on. So we're going to spend a little bit more time on these bosses here. 
and you can see how they're dealing with this boss. We talked about it going into this tournament, uh, that even with Thundering, there's so much going on where you always kind of want to find your friends and then get away from them. And then you also need to walk in a circle and dodge away. And they're doing a really fantastic job spreading out from the get-go, making sure that somebody gets targeted and not everybody has to run instantly, but still be in range for your friends to actually get that thundering debuff cleared when it comes and wise mari is dropping consistently but boris money crew is on the on the rise they're trying to catch up here they definitely are they're keeping it close they're doing roughly the same amount of single target damage right they pulled the boss roughly 20 percent behind perplexed and they're keeping it pretty close to that mark so i don't think the single target damage is too different between the groups between the two teams rather but uh, i want to talk about something that we uh that we learned about these two teams from our player interviews. Every single week we send out a little, you know, spreadsheet to the players, ask them to fill it out and ask, you know, ask them some questions about how they feel about the weekend. We had two differing answers about this dungeon. You know, we asked the teams what they think will be the hardest and easiest dungeons every this this weekend. Perplex said they thought Temple would be one of the harder dungeons. Or as Money Crew said they thought it would be one of the easier dungeons. And uh <laughs> well when you think the dungeon's easy yeah. and you wipe I mean, sure. uh, that can always happen, right? There's yeah, always that, true, that, that little bit of nervousness. You're, oh, Swag actually going down here for Perplex Last towards second. the end. But no worries, he's just taking a shortcut to the other side. You know DKs <laughs> don't have much, much mobility. Uh, is going to be much quicker to, to release and be back here. Uh, no, I don't think it was on purpose, but still, it's not terrible to, to actually die there towards the end. Also, notably... Perplexed switching to that Resto Shaman is something we've seen a lot. It helps with the Curse Dispel, it helps with the Interrupt, and it also has a little bit of a different damage profile to Evoker, a little bit more single target heavy. Similar, I would say, to the one of Disc Brace. So I'm really curious to see the overall damage uh, after this key here, but Perplexed is on the move, pulling the next big pack here. And this is another one where you really have to pay attention to those Spitefuls and make sure you're keeping those under control. I like the decision of going Warlock here just to add another range but wolf disco already showed how much damage he can do uh, previously so i'm really curious to see where that yeah you can see him rising right now mm -hmm. and the gateway already set up to let the team skip past that three pack if they're if they do make that choice so yeah going pretty well for them already you can see they just had great execution there making sure that they had pretty much a lot of personals up even spiraling being committed to make sure that they didn't die to the explosions uh yeah, the skip. small shaw went off. So yeah, and they do skip past, but just for movement, because they are going to be pulling this three pack on top of the book here, uh, just to get a little extra free cleave and to start the boss RP. So yeah, pretty good execution already. Yeah, it, Perplexed again, just so good. It also gets them away from those spiteful. So it's a really, really nice uh, the niche technique to make sure that you're making the most out of the space that you have. As soon as they spawn, we can saw them uh, gate over and everything was far, far away from them. Now here they have enough room to dodge once again. On the right side, Boris Money Crew is on that same pole that we just saw Perplex on. Of course, they're going to be a little bit behind, but they're deciding to run here through that corridor and that also works of course a little bit scared for nate as he's dropping just a tiny bit but is going to be okay as they move towards that book at the bottom of the floor perplex has already started the boss fight yeah perplex is already on the boss fight and wars money crew is going to need to do a lot of work here to catch up fortunately for them hopeful has described himself as a picasso on this second boss in in temple of the jade serpent so we'll have to see what Fire Mage can do. I actually think Fire Mage is insanely good on this boss because it can cleave its ignite between the two bosses, so it can do really good overall damage. They're going to have to do a ton of overall damage to catch up on this boss, though, because Perplex is already halfway through the boss, and Boar's Monikru still hasn't pulled it yet, only just now spawning. So let's see what they can do. Yeah, the team is pretty low here, but hopefully they can recover. Cousin has his hands spread out over the teams, making sure that they're well protected, even with those spitefuls walking around. There's one more tiger in the melee area that is going to die due to cleave and now peril and strives are the only targets that they really need to worry about mostly that spiteful is going to get fear nice little fear coming out there for cousin and uh, yeah pi coming up in five seconds 
Is there any target we can use it on? Maybe, I guess, hopeful once that combustion comes up? Yeah, probably. I mean, I think he's oh, just, just going to get it instantly. Time. Yeah. yeah. He, he just got yeah. it instantly. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense to Good me. Perplex. They are catching up a little bit. Honestly, they are. I <laughs> mean, I'll perplex so low at the end of the boss here, but I think this is just full min max from Ryzen doing as much damage as possible. And then it can top up the group after the fact. You know, if the group doesn't die, you're doing your job perfectly as a healer. They have really, <laughs> really nice patrol uh, standing right now. They didn't have to wait, something we saw in group A just a lot, where they had to stand and wait, make sure that that infester walks around. Not going to be the case for a perplex as they move on to the next big area. They're not satisfied with only pulling two of those mobs. That's not going to be something they're looking forward to. They decide to go all in. They're pulling the entire area. No bloodlust available to perplex, but they're in it to win it everything is now going for them they have some aoe cc's coming out here making sure nobody is going to die slt has been popped you can see the defensives light up for wolf disco and ryzen making sure they're going to survive as the pack slowly but surely drops but this pull is crazy and I mean, it's not done yet, right? Because once those shots start to die, they explode for massive damage on the group. And then they have to run away from the spiteful shades after the fact. And you know what? Ryzen's like, you know what? My team doesn't need any healing. I'm going to go pull those two mobs over here that we need us <laughs> on, on top of all this. And then they're going to pull the, the boss on top of that. So we're hyping them up for how dangerous the pull is. But it's just, it's nothing to them. That was easy. That was like a walk in the park. Perfect execution. You can see essentially every, every cooldown expelled across the board. Actually, not even every cooldown. AG is still available for Ryzen as he pops it at the start of the boss here. Now, yeah, about, Arnie's so. back too. Wow. Wow, That's definitely. I mean, how crazy. much do you want to pull Perplexed? Yes, but Boris Money Crew seems to be thinking the same thing. They're now also pulling most of this area. There's one more trash pack in the background. I'm not sure. I don't think they want to add this one, but the CCs are coming out, making sure that everything is under control. We can see that their group is taking massive Ooh. damage. Cauterize proccing for Hopeful. He still goes down. Now it is on the rest of the team to survive this the damage is ticking oh. on cousin he also falls nate is going to follow and chuckles and sky are trying to recover this but it is going to be so so hard for them there is no coming back that's another full team white for boris money crew and so much time lost it, they just didn't have the healing prep for when those minions exploded that's what happened they're hopeful hopeful popped cauterize just ticked down to the AoE damage, and then after he died, Cousin got that curse on him, and the mage is the curse to spell. I, guess, I suppose the Feral Druid could also dispel it, but, I mean, maybe the Feral Druid wasn't aware that he had to get the curse to spell there, and then Cousin went down, and then at that point onwards, it was just... Uh, it was just too hard to come back from. Really unfortunate to see. I think Boar's Money Crew is definitely a better team than what they're than what their seeding would describe, because, you know, they kind of remind me a little bit of, like, Levels last weekend. They're a team that mm -hmm. actually plays really, really well, goes for all the most difficult strats, but it just doesn't quite work out for them. So while they might not be able to compete with, you know, a, a super high-caliber team like Perplexed, I could definitely see this team making a run on the lower bracket. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that's a fair assessment. Same as Levels, if you're trying these big, volatile polls and you're not just there yet in the consistency department, then that's something that can happen and that's going to throw you back so, so far. But keep in mind, for these teams to actually pull like this, they did this in practice and it worked. So it's just a, a matter of consistency and variance that it is going to come down to that unfortunately cost them these team wipes here, but they're back into that room. They're not going to let that stop them. They're throwing up a fight, even though it seems a little bit lost at this point. Giving up is not an option for these MDI teams, and they're trying to make back that time. I do want to say they were catching up quite a bit, but of course, Perplex already finished with Liu. Now on to the next room. I'm curious to see what we're going to do here. It seems like another Whoa. just pull everything pull coming out of Perplex. SLT has been popped instantly. Wolf Disco so low. That curse is on him, but he survives. Dark Fact now also being used after the fact, after he dropped extremely low, just to make sure he's a little bit more stable here as the rest of the team yeah. is doing 
damage. They're blasting this entire pool. They even have Bloodlust, but they don't want to use it. They want to save it for that boss here as the pack is dropping lower and lower. Really beautiful to see these kind of pulls from Perplex. That's my favorite thing about the MDI when we're just going, oh yeah, how many pulls? Just as many as the dungeon has bosses. Let's go. <laughs> just again, great execution there. I'm actually a little surprised. You know, I feel like there's room for them to do a little bit more here. They could actually pull that into the boss and make that work too. They would just have to pull a little bit late because I think there's a really bad overlap with when the trash would die versus when you go into the intermission phase. And having like 20 spiteful shades chasing you down when you're also trying to kill off the intermission ads really wouldn't work out so well. So there's definitely like some timing where they could pull trash with the boss, but I imagine that they probably knew they were pretty far ahead in the dungeon and just opted to not go for it. We'll see. I you know, yeah. I really you know, that's just one tiny potential thing that they could do a little faster, but that's like only if they really have to go for it because this is a very difficult boss in its own right on the 22 tyrannical. Now, of course, they do have the warlock, which is going to be swapped to that imp pet here for an extra dispel on the group so they don't have to worry about the damage from these debuffs too much here. So, I mean, they should be pretty safe here. This, just, this, this boss is just going to be really long on this tyrannical key level. Yeah, they also have army available. I'm going to assume that cooldowns, like the rest of his cooldowns, come back for a swag in 15 seconds, and that's when Bloodlust is going to be popped. Otherwise, I can't explain why they're waiting on that for now, but we're going to see uh, one more time how that damage comes out of this team here. I'm pretty sure we have that Bloodlust now available. Hopefully they're not forgetting to press it, as some teams have prior uh, in MDI situations. <laughs> but, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I imagine it has to have been popped, right? I mean, we must have missed it or something, because that, you know, that does happen. Our observers can miss the Bloodlust sometimes, so yeah, maybe they'll pop it after this intermission, if it hasn't been popped yet, we'll see. The the DK pretty much has all of his buttons available, right? So yeah. that would be the time <laughs> to pop the it. That's the part that's confusing me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Perplex is just giga chatting. They're like, now nah, we don't need it. <laughs> But a shot uh, down okay. to 55%. There we go. Army is going to get sent here. I'm not sure. They were wait maybe waiting on another cooldown there with a Bloodlust. They had one death earlier, but two battle resses available to them as they didn't use it on that death. And you can see that boss melt. Shaft out is down to 30% and dropping even further. Niche little tech here. You can actually pre-AMS uh, the debuffs that come out. Just make it a little bit easier on your healer if you're a DK on this fight. But of course, with all of the classes that they brought, not an issue for them. Bloodlust still on 2 seconds at 2 HP. And the boss goes down and a 2-0 for Perplexed. That's right. Uh, a very smooth 2-0 for uh, Perplexed as well. I believe they only had... Uh... Yeah, something like one death between the two dungeons. So that was about as clean as it can be, huh, Tuttles? God, you love to see that. I think that they were holding Lust there for the Infernal. Destro Warlock Infernal is actually pretty what? good single target damage. No. Destro, Warlock, Destro Warlock's Fern is good single target, man. They're holding it for they were that. Holding it for, they were holding it for army and unholy damage. The it's Ferny Sands, man. <laughs> no, All no, right. no. Maybe, they, maybe you're right. both right, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think overall, though, this, the dungeon, um, you know, it could have gone a little bit better for Boar's Money Crew. It wasn't too bad from them. I think that overall, this was mostly the perplexed show, though. I think that their ability to be able to do some of these um, insanely large pulls on this 22 level was quite impressive. They also were running that Warlock, which they got some value out of, like that gate that they had set up to the side. That probably only ends up saving them 10 seconds, but that's 10 seconds in in a 11 or 12 minute dungeon. That ends up actually being a lot over the course of the entire dungeon and we're uh, relative to some of the other uh, things or tech that you could see. In addition to that, I think that this pull, by the way, the way that they have this set up was insane. They they went like Infernal Stun into Blasphemy, into triple, uh, into like Shockwave, into Cap Totem. I thought it was so sick. And then like they dropped the Shadow Fury on top of it, had everything stunned up for like a large majority of like the beginning of this pull. And then once uh, those lesser Shaws ended up dying, they just kind of kited out. Uh, kited it out for a couple of seconds. They kited out the spitefuls, and they were able to maintain full uptime on their melee. It, it was this is a scary pull. I am surprised that Divine was able to live a pull like this. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like once hey. the cooldowns were done, he just did a really good job of uh, <laughs> creating distance. You just gotta, you gotta get away, you know. Yeah. 
Well, then, uh, you know, we did see some of these uh, bigger pulls at the end here, but again, on a tyrannical week, these mobs, they're, they're scary, but they're still not as scary as they were last week. And uh, here's some numbers to kind of uh, break down. Uh, once again, you know, right away, I'm kind of looking over at the uh, the healer damage. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of other big factors that, that made a difference in this, but, you know, the priest just is not pumping out as much as uh, some of the other specs uh, we, we've seen in MDI so far. Yeah, that was something I was specifically interested in, as my understanding is that Rest of Shaman and Disc Priest have a similar just pattern of damage, but you can see, I mean, of course, Perplex played the dungeon till the end, whereas Money Crew didn't, so there's True. going to be a little bit more damage that is going to factor in here. But even then, uh, definitely a distinctable difference in both of these classes, I would say, and we're looking at the graph as well. Actually crazy how much more, yeah, the, that was the healing where Boris Money Crew died. You can see the first big spike, damage looking pretty even, but then there was so much damage going out onto Boris Money Crew that unfortunately killed them there. Dude, the yeah. spikes on some of these pulls, like that, that one for Perplexed at, on the damage graph at like eight minutes where they're doing two million group DPS, that is absolutely absurd. Divine wasn't even, he could actually have played something like more damage focused trinket wise we we did see that the tank from boar's money crew is running that like uh my tank's an elemental trinket the the spiteful storm or whatever not spiteful storm um get, uh, the boon he was running that boon trinket which Ooh. does a little bit more aoe damage but divine was instead playing that yeah. manic grief torch and that allowed him yeah. to do a, it's a little bit more boss damage and it yeah. doesn't make him immobile <laughs> Also, the best yeah, part uh, about Manic Grief Torch is whenever one of your teammates dies, you can run that weak aura that pings them uh, and says, thank you for resetting my Manic Grief Torch. <laughs> this is a very infrequent occurrence for Perplex. This is not something that happens very often for them, though. Maybe that's why Swag died at the, at the end of the first boss. You know, food for thought. Uh, it could be. Reset the uh, Grief Torch. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an efficiency thing. Yeah. Thinking about the items. That's always nice. You know what else is nice? Having our MDI companion thing, uh, if you're watching on Twitch, there's a little uh, little app off to the left side of your screen. You can check out the builds, you can check out the items, you can check out the talent trees. And thanks to Wowhead for helping us out with the tooltips. It's pretty cool. I use it quite a bit. I think it's so interesting that they force Feral Druids to play uh, D-Curse. So generally on live, like if you can get away without playing D-Curse as Feral, you want to avoid it at all costs because you actually lose a decent amount of... Uh, um, like survivability value because you lose end up like you end up losing like three survivability points or something like that to take D curse, mm -hmm. but they're effectively forced to take it with how big they're going on like those missed color pulls. Um, yep. Those missed color pulls putting out two of those touch of karma style curses at a time. Basically, you have to have them plus the shaman to be able to get both of them off. Yep, makes sense. Any other uh, any other things jump out? from any of the talent builds we've seen? I did not see anything else. Nothing <laughs> did you guys see anything? In particular. I'm not oh, sure. I've been kind of keeping an eye on some of the priest builds to see if people are running mine oh, or not. It kind of seems like you can get away with, with either style since there's a good amount of AoE either way, but that's been kind of interesting Can we get a cauterize check on Hopeful? He played Cauter. Oh, I took Cauter eyes. Let's go. <laughs> he procked it. That's player. how I know. He did proc it. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, a hopeful, uh, you can also uh, see him stream from his POV. Uh, obviously, day's pretty much over for MDI uh, for Boar's Money Crew today, but uh, they'll be back tomorrow in the lower bracket. So if you want to check out uh, a POV, that's one to uh, keep an eye on. So you can jump over to his Twitch and maybe uh, bookmark that for tomorrow or something like that. We do have some players uh, here and there streaming their POVs, which, if you're trying to learn, is a is a great way to uh, to kind of to do that. So, yeah, p yeah, players are allowed to co-stream this MDI, right? That that's yeah. one of the changes that we have this season. Yeah. Cool. There is uh, another no, player that's co-streaming. Uh, in trouble. <laughs> I, I have to shout yeah. him out because uh, he's a German demon hunter, and you know how I feel about demon hunters. So, you're gonna see him later in game three. Punky is streaming as well. Uh, Ponky Ponky is the Twitch, and I think he's been chatting here as well. So, if you are interested oh, in Demon Hunter Chatter. Mythic Plus, then that's a place to check that out. You were all chatters. What do you mean? <laughs> a little bit. A little I'm bit. a streamer. I'm a streamer, not a chatter. Uh, <laughs> You're a chatter. Very different. <laughs> 
We'll leave that definition up on the screen uh, later on. But uh, for now, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, it's going to be Dire Wolves taking on Ducks Can Fly. We'll see you in just a few on MDI.
Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International, everybody. Your host, Doe here, along with Dratnos and Mix. And a special guest this weekend, we got uh, Mr. X joining us as well. Uh, rating extraordinaire, M-plus enthusiast. Uh, how how you doing over there? R rating extraordinaire. I, we, we just yeah. killed the Mythic Krog yesterday, like, basically with half the people <laughs> dead. But yes, rating extraordinaire. Uh, a great. Hey, I mean, Dragonflight's down. been... Yeah, Dragonflight's been awesome. Uh, super stoked to be back here. Uh, watching some of the best players play. All right. Well, Dradnos, first time we're seeing you today as well. Uh, what do you think of our uh, first match? I think much as we expected, right? I was impressed by the level yeah. of, uh, of play from Boar's Money Crew as well, though. So should be fun to see them down in the lower bracket. Yeah, they will go down to face, uh, I believe, whoever loses our next one here, which is going to be Dire Wolves versus uh, Ducks Can Fly. As you can see later in the day, we've got Donuts versus uh, Makes His Favorite Team. And the whole wide world, apparently, <laughs> Cement Gaming. And then Empyrean versus Who Let Them Cook. And uh, yeah, so a lot to look forward to yet uh, today. But let's talk about our next series. Let's talk about Dire Wolves versus uh, Ducks Can Fly. Now, uh, Dire Wolves, uh, that, they just announced today, actually, that they had picked up this WoW team. Uh, this team was known as Ethical last season. They're from the Oceania region, uh, and uh, you know we'll see if they uh, uh, we'll see if they've adjusted to the sleep schedule. That's that's going to be the tough one. Uh, Makes is the person who is far uh, the most far removed sleep schedule wise from NA on the broadcast right now. How what how, do how tough mean? do you think that is? I went to <laughs> well, bed I mean, at out of us here, you're the one who's like the farthest away from the time keys. zone. Yeah. <laughs> So you're saying it's um, totally so fine. So in my experience, you know, wolves usually win against ducks, but then ducks can fly, oh, as the team is telling us. So really, this should be a very close game, I think. Okay, based yeah. purely on the animals that they represent. Well, yeah. also, like, it's, uh, what, the 10 versus 16? So, like, two of the closer teams we have, I think, in terms of, like, yeah. first-round matchup, right? So it should be pretty competitive. That's true, too. I, I feel like Dire Wolves is maybe coming into this one, I mean, obviously is a little bit more favored based on results and the time trials and things like that, but they've also got their new org to try to impress, you know? That's that's a bit of pressure, too, that they're going to kind of be handling, so it's going to be interesting to see how they can uh, how they can go through all this, especially, again, when you factor in the sleep schedule stuff. That is not easy sometimes, uh, even if you're a gamer that, you know, never sleeps and is on 24-7. It's still rough. But, uh, but Dratnos, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, ducks can fly. The animal uh, or the so team, your choice. In time trials, this is a team that busted out a couple of cool specs that we didn't see too much of uh, in the, the competition. So we've seen a devastation evoker out of them. We've seen druids, but not mm. the not the feral kind, the balance kind actually uh -oh. uh, has been being used by them <laughs> a little bit as well. <laughs> Uh, and we've seen even we've seen some a couple of the other less common picks that are that we have already seen, such as uh, DPS Shaman uh, coming out Mage as well. So who knows what they're going to land on for the weekend here, and if they have different plans in different dungeons. But I think that's a, a team to look at as having some exciting off-meta potential. You know, I, I feel like because of who we've got on the desk right now, we can have an objective discussion about balanced druids and M plus. So so let's let's do that for a minute. Now bounce druids like they do do a pretty substantial amount of damage. They're not terrible or anything like that. But why? What what's the main reason, uh, Matt, that we haven't seen them over uh, feral so far in MDI? In your opinion? I mean, well, feral is just really uh, strong right now. But I also think, uh, at least for me, balance like to be able to kind of keep all the the dots up in this type of thing, like stellar flare applying to all these targets, like. Uh, I feel like if you were to bring a druid, like you're probably looking at like Resto or Feral is the way to go. Uh, where balance isn't bad, I think it just falls behind a little bit. Right on. Oh, well, here's our dungeons interesting. For this match. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. So the double ban on Ruby life pools, huh? Now, I mean, arguably that's the the easiest quote unquote dungeon we've got in the pool this weekend. Uh, can Can you explain that, Dratnos? Well, so it's the easiest in terms of like, okay, which of these keys is easiest to time, right? Like you get these, you get these five keystones in your bag, and you're trying to, sure. you're trying to make one of your one of them go up. The Ruby Life Pools is the easiest one for sure, but you know you're playing against another team, and the fact that it's such a low key means that you're obligated to be just going so fast, and you know a five second mistake is a much higher percentage of the dungeon than it is in one of the longer dungeons. So uh, I think that probably explains why the teams might be a little bit more. 
hesitant to go into to Ruby in particular. That does mean we start off in Halls of Valor, 21 bolstering tyrannical Halls of Valor as well. So uh, one of the longer dungeons we have, of course, since it's the first map in our best of five, the teams couldn't ban it even if they wanted to. Uh, but yeah, I, I think this this one, this combination of affixes is it's it's kind of nasty in Halls of Valor at MDI level in particular. My my feeling about Halls of Valor right, is like bolstering. Usually it's not too bad in here because usually you're kind of only pulling, you know, five, six enemies at once. Maybe that first pull is a little bit bigger. But in MDI level, like you have a lot of 10 enemy pulls, 12 enemy pulls here that have some targets that can take bolstering stacks and really murder your tank in particular at the end of those pulls. So I'll see. I'm, I'm curious to see how well these teams manage that affix in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, my... immediately you think of, like, the first big pull where everyone seems to pull all the trash right into Heimdall. Like, Makes, do you think that's something that you can recreate on a week like this? I mean, I think the teams are going to try, maybe. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure how it's going to go, because last week that was already a little bit spicy, and back then we had a 22 Halls of Valor fortified. Um, now, I think the 21 Tyrannical should be doable. You just need to really take care of these balls and make sure your damage is pretty even. Now, with DK, that shouldn't be too much of a problem, I think so, because there is always, or in most pulls, there is one higher HP target, and you can kind of, like, put your wounds on that, cleave down from it, and just pandemic, um, or epidemic, rather. Uh, I, I don't know about the others, but I'm very much looking forward to what classes we're seeing. Like you said, Dratnos, there could be some surprises. Oh, oh, uh, oh, and there we are. Go. We're getting an enhancement shaman. Yeah, so direwolves here are running the... Uh, oh, we've got the adventure guide open from our observer on the wow. direwolves uh, side. Look at the very top left there. New, uh, okay, well, let's see what quests <laughs> were picked up from that. But yeah, you can see direwolves going right into the boss here. And this is, uh, this is that pull that both teams are actually going to attempt. Storm Drake damage is vital here, right? That's the, that's the mob you need to make sure is dying first in this pull. And I'm actually a little bit worried about, about Direwolf's side here. That mob is dying a lot slower than the others. That is a large dragon. That is going to be potentially killing Jack here soon. Okay, so Jack has spell block running. The next breath shouldn't be too bad. But the one after that, spell block is going to have expired for... Actually, Spellblock is maybe going to expire even for this one. Here comes that breath. Yeah, Spellblock is down. Ooh. Oh, wow. Very, very sketchy. Yeah. yeah. Both teams still have that Storm Drake up, and we can see that Direwolves, in terms of boss HP, have already progressed quite far, but they really need to finish off that dragon. That's exactly what they're doing. Both teams have killed it. Now it's only about happy feet and dodging these swirlies and dodging a breath, making sure you're not taking any unnecessary damage here, as that could p potentially cost you your life and these teams move further on. Now we are seeing enhancement, we're seeing Shadow Priest, and we're seeing Rogue. And then my question is, who are you actually putting that PI on? Because we saw PI on Mage, we saw, of course, PI on Unholy DK. But are you giving PI to the Enhancement Shaman or to the Rogue? I think you're supposed to PI the Shaman, but I actually am not sure on that between the two of them, which is which is better. Yeah, I, I will look for it next time PI Curious. gets used to see who, who it lands on. I think it's supposed to be the Shaman, but I actually, yeah, I've always had a, a better target than either of those specs. In these groups, just usually. give it to the give it to the tank. I'm sure that's going to yeah. be yeah. Give very it to the healer. Worthy. Tanks do a lot Luke of damage. Is <laughs> but yeah, Direwolves finishing off Himdal and they're moving on. Gonna do another big pull. Let's see how big their goes. They're pulling the stairs. It seems like both sides of the stairs together with the pack that's standing at the top there. Now you need to make sure there's a lot of frontals in here that could cost you your life. But the Mystics are the ones that you need to keep under control. Room cover, of course, also needs to be interrupted. And you want to kill everything at the same time. Those interrupts are working beautifully for Direwolves. And Ducks Can Fly are on their way as well. And they don't seem to want to be wow. stopping. This pull is going and going. They just pull oh. everything. Chassel going down for Direwolves. But I think they can finish the pull here. They have a battle rest. But look at what Ducks Can Fly are doing. Yeah, now it looks like that PI hat. Okay, it land it's landed on the Enhancement Shaman here during this pull, although the Rogue is still just destroying these damage meters for Ducks Can Fly. And this is a lot of enemies. I don't think they got both sides from the bottom of the stairs, but they have an extra pull or two relative to... Actually, 
No, they must they must have skipped some of these, right? This this can't be How many I think enemies they even put came into one this pool? Side, upstairs. They, okay. And so maybe it was a shroud at angle as well table. for from the bottom of the stairs, right? Uh, maybe. We'll have to we'll have to ask our analysts what exactly was going on there. I was a little bit distracted by direwolves. I just saw a big pull in motion. The Duck Clan Fly finished it off. They're now on to twenty one percent. Yeah, they definitely right? skipped something. They definitely skipped something. But direwolves now neck and neck. You can see a little bit of sap and mind tooth action as they move okay. on to the. Do they know they still have to get percent? That's so, just skipping everything. <laughs> The nice thing about this Redux, I, I don't think they plan to skip those mobs forever. I think they're just doing this yeah. out of order. They want to be killing these two mini bosses now, and then either towards the end of the mini bosses, they'll pull those three in, or they'll be pulling those three and maybe some of the other mobs into boss. Uh, because, you know, it's a tyrannical bolstering boss, but bosses yeah. don't actually get affected by bolstering. So one of the most efficient ways to, to mitigate the bolstering affix is to pull trash onto bosses. Uh, and I think that. Ducks can fly. Skip here is designed to to set that up. They have got their first mini boss down, and they're going to be pulling the second mob here into the three pack. Meanwhile, dire wolves are going for huge pull into both of the mini bosses. Now, the mini bosses, I believe, do get bolstered. So, uh, Olmir is going to get quite large here. The good thing about Olmir, though, is that he doesn't do any unavoidable damage. Right? You can kick and uh, dodge all of his abilities. So, as long as Soulstein mm -hmm. doesn't get bolstered, you're not too sad here. Oh. The Eye of the Storm wow. is definitely doing some damage. SLT already being deployed in a tyrannical key. You maybe would have wanted that for the boss, but 21 shouldn't be too difficult. They still have some other options that they can use to, to deal with it, but they're definitely killing all mirror next and then dealing with the shield maidens and now ducks can fly right doing exactly what you said you can see goat face running down the stairs coming back up pulling everything that they skipped and i really really like this technique where they're pulling stuff onto the boss i just think that that's exactly what you want to do in the mdi like one mob gaming is basically banned even if it's a boss if you can pull something on there you have classes that do good aoe like the shadow priest like the enhancement shaman then that's going to be so worth and i think that actually is something that should pay off in the overall time of course it's going to depend a little bit on how the rest of their route looks but so far i'm really liking this yeah now we've talked a lot about the feral druid and unholy dk's ability to do extra damage to that primary target but on the side of ducks can fly you know enhancement shaman is actually phenomenal at that at that as well uh dealing damage to that main target that they're they're pumping into uh, and the rogues are not bad at it either they of course, it's not the same as it was before patch 8.1 when, uh, mm. <laughs> when they, after, uh, Zul oh, oh. in Old Deer. Oh no, Mirage getting zapped there. Is that a cheat death prop, yeah. perhaps? Uh, well, okay. we'll see in a second. Doesn't seem like it. It should show on the overlay if it gets procced, so... Uh, apparently survive without it, All which right. is very good and very important. Uh, you don't want to proc that now if you can avoid it. One more time, Eye of the Storm is going to come in. Shield Maidens need to be a little bit careful with these here, but Thundering is up. That's going to give you that nice little damage amp, so they're definitely going to use that. Also helps with healing, and Direwolves and Ducks can fly are kind of neck and neck. I mean, of course, there is a 10% difference in the team's trash count, but boss HP looking super close. Those. Yeah, Ducks Can Fly are going to be getting this boss dead about 10 seconds or 15 ahead of Dire Wolves. But I think you would trade, I think you'd rather have the 8% count, especially in a dungeon as long as Halls of Valor, than those 15 seconds. We'll see though, I mean, definitely either team's game at this point, and another crucial resource that Ducks Can Fly have that Dire Wolves don't is their battle res, right? And the 5 seconds of death timer from that uh, death earlier for Dire Wolves, so... That could be huge as this dungeon progresses. One downside of the Ducks and Fly comp is they don't have a good way to cast a battle res. They have to use the engineering res if somebody does go down. So that's the flip side. Although, you know, 40% of their team can onk, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, we do have a double onk in case. So that should also be very helpful. But let's see how big they go here. We can see a Mind Sooth being used and then... They're instantly pulling the same pack, and that's going to be pulled into the pack that's at the very far end. 
Quoru actually getting a bunch of hits here. Fade is going to help lose that aggro and get that thunder caller in. Hopefully needs some more interrupts, but the team has got it under control. The pull is now together and they can actually do the damage. We can see the boon from Mirage coming out. Lots and lots of damage left and right. But same thing is happening on the side of Dire Wolves now. The Abomlimb also coming out for 40, making sure this pack is under control. I love when that is popping. You can just see the tank is running away and the DK has basically the entire pole in his hands as they are running off. And Ducks Can Fly have made the skip. Uh, there is a little bit of porting currently happening. Um, the Direwolves also skipping. And let's see if we're going to skip the Dragon or not. Seems like both teams are opting for a Dragon skip. Yeah, this is Dragon is... Uh... It's not bad, but it's pretty inefficient, right? That's the, the problem with fighting it. It's kind of hard to do a lot else with it uh, or bring it forward, particularly on a bolstering week, right? Like, you're going to have you're gonna have a big problem with it yeah. getting bolstered at the end of the pull, probably. Uh, so both teams opting to skip it instead. Ducks and Fly are going to be taking three bulls into Fenrir. Meanwhile, Direwolves are taking this Valor Jar pack into the wolf. Now, this is a scary pack. Those bear traps are going to be awfully lethal, so everybody has to really watch their feet and make sure they don't step in one of those. You're also looking at those marksmen. Not only are they doing a lot of damage to your tank with those snapshots, but every time they jump to the side, they're going to start doing a frontal that will kill anybody it hits. So, uh, death grip coming in really big here for dire wolves. Maybe one of the reasons they can do these four mobs and ducks can fly can't, uh, or are choosing not to, is the dire wolves have access to that death grip to just yoink those uh, marksmen back in whenever they jump out like that yeah absolutely i think especially with death's echo which is something most dks are running 40 actually dropping on the floor here i think that was one of the bear traps there you're gonna get two stacks on your death grip which is just so valuable also gives you uh two stacks of uh, your death and DK and your death set bonds, but the grip in dungeons is just, it's chef's kiss to me. Fenrir are now on the way to phase. 8% to go, but Ducks Can Fly have finished that off already. They're still behind in that trash count. I'm, they, they need to go bigger somewhere to make up for that. Whoa. So, Goat Face now on the way to get, uh, it seems like, all of the wolves. Is, is that what we're doing? It yeah. does look like it. Now, we saw okay. we saw now doing this with, uh, I think, one less pack of wolves, but one higher key level and fortified instead of tyrannical. Bolstering is potentially going to be... Actually, bolstering is not even that bad on this poll because the wargs get bigger from the alive wargs that are near them. So when <laughs> I guess when the first, like, three die is probably when you're going to be at your highest level of danger here. But if you, can, if you can kill them all around the same time, it should be pretty safe here. And there's big AoE damage coming in. Devil Volcanics panic. are griefing their range, <laughs> on that pillar yeah <laughs> you can't leave you can't you can't dodge the volcanics you just got to tank it but uh, obviously you lose your cast whenever that happens unless you're uh, in spirit walker's grace <laughs> i'm sorry they're getting knocked up back yeah. there it looks so funny just every time Koro and maza go up uh or look at some maza uh go up Whoa, it's just comical to me yeah dire wolves are doing it with the boss they are taking all the wargs wow. into fenrir and hollow here is just on a, a mission hollow and so they're 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 both of their range players right now are playing at kind of max range from the boss and they're just moving and the way this works is if you are moving you see hollow there in uh, in ghost wolf and with the move speed increase from being fixated by the boss if you're moving when a wolf starts jumping at you it's not going to hit you because if you're far enough away it's travel time by the time it lands on where you were you're not there anymore and it can't hit you so uh, Direwolves are actually making a very dangerous pull possible through... You can see on the damage meters that it does sort of int your, uh, your range DPS from actually being able to do any damage <laughs> on the pull, but uh, you know what? It's worth, right? We got to do all this trash with boss, and with this strategy here, Direwolves are actually going to accelerate ahead of Ducks Can Fly. Ducks Can Fly actually going to have to use Luca's Ankh there as well. Yeah, he dropped there for a second, which is just too much damage going out. But of course, on coming in clutch is going to allow him to come back here without using any battle resses. And Direwolves, like you said, beautiful 
play with the wolves here. Shazzo, of course, not having too much fun on that boss pole, but it doesn't matter. You're finishing off Fenrir in so much time. That Bloodlust was extremely worthy, and they're now finishing off the rest. They're on 80%, so they're going to need a little bit more if they want to skip everything and only do Kings next. I'm curious if they're going to pull some Sentinels up like we saw from Legendary last time, or if they're actually going to do some more bulls. It looks like bulls. So it does look like bulls. It looks like bulls maybe are going to get snapped up with them. So you can do this, right? You can, if you walk through this portal and mobs have threat on you, they will eventually snap and, and chase after you. Uh, and that, I, I guess they're probably just going to take these bulls all the way with them. I think because the bulls are animals as well, you know, they're not, they're not Valajar. They're not actually going to social uh, pull the other mobs with them. Oh, no, we saw Meld. Okay, so they're not going to be snapping the bulls. They're going to be doing the two Sentinels. <laughs> yeah, all right. Jack Jack got the bulls, melded them off. Easy. Yeah. Okay. My Just bad. a little bit of uh, mob control. No, I was excited for the snappy bulls. Yeah, I thought it was good. I, I thought, thought we were going to do something cool. But <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's going to be the two Sentinels up at the end. Uh, and that's going to make an easy 84% for them, which 84 is the magic number to make the kings 100. They've grabbed a couple of the uh, wag the, the mead, and they're going to be throwing yeah. that on the mobs here. Doing that's going to make it so that they can do all four of the kings at once. Not actually too bad with bolstering to do it this way as well. It's, it's almost safer to do it this way too, because the kings only have one ability each instead of the later ones having multiple abilities. Meanwhile, Ducks Can Fly have gotten to their 84.4, so they, they're actually good. They've gotten their last little bit of count. They're going to be doing mm -hmm. the same thing, but a little bit slower than Dire Wolves, but they don't have to deal with those two Sentinels, so they're actually still not far behind, and they have five seconds of Death Timer in their favor. I think Dire Wolves are maybe 30 seconds ahead here. Yeah, we're going to see how this one plays out, how quickly they'll be able to group up those kings. Of course, these bolster as well, and with the way that you're activating them, uh, it's very hard to deny that bolster. You're going to have mm. to have very specific Ooh. damage uh, profiles, but Sentinels coming in here for Dire Wolves. So this is scary because the Sentinels mean that Unruly Yell is not going to be kickable, which means people are going to be... Ah, but I see, because it's a 21 for, uh, Tyrannical and not a 22 Fortified, it's actually not that much more lethal to have that happen. Uh, you, you only have one mob with the Unruly Yell ability, right? Uh, and it's going to be mm -hmm. casting for free, but it's only doing about half of everybody's health. It is going to kick them if they're not careful of it, but... Uh, they're w watching and making sure that they're not going to be interrupted by it. Uh, and yeah, you can see there that damage going out on everybody is exactly that. The only real lethality here is if that overlaps with a Wicked Dagger on somebody, but that is what they are all using defensives uh, to, to handle. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And you can see them finish off this pull. There is only the Sentinels now remaining that they're kiting out, dealing with the Crackles. The Kings have died. And that's actually really nice because you're waiting for God King Scovold anyway to actually run up and, and do his thing. And even though the RP got uh, reduced significantly, there is still like some of it. So that was nice to kind of skip that time there. They have a thundering right from the get-go. Uh, I believe it's going to run out a couple seconds into when they're pulling. Yeah, exactly like that. Jack holding on to it, but Ducks Can Fly are finishing off the Kings as well. And like we said, they didn't need the Sentinels on top of that. And of course, I'm not sure if all of the Kings are as low as the one that's in front here, but it seems like they're doing a really, really good job of dealing with the bolstering here and killing everything simultaneously. Yeah, now they're going to have to wait for that Scovald RP, so we'll get a little bit of an idea of how much of a boss's percent health is the lead for Dire Wolves, but... I suspect that, you know, 30% of the boss's health, that's going to be really tough for Ducks Can Fly to overcome. They are going to need to do a lot more single target than Dire Wolves. One saving grace here for Ducks Can Fly, their Bloodlust is going to be up sooner. So maybe they will get a Lust and maybe Dire Wolves won't. And maybe their comp does more single target as well. And maybe with all of that coming together, they can close this gap, but it is going to be a large large undertaking yeah it's definitely not going to be easy there was a little bit of a similar situation last weekend where we were like oh you know if, if you hold on to that bloodlust and you're using it with the runes and you're gonna have so much damage but in the meantime the other team had already killed but then there's those five seconds on top of it so really it is going to come down who has the better single target here and uh, i mean 
I really like uh, I really like how the rogue and the enhancement shaman was looking here. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of AOE with the flames. But just comparing the two teams, I, this could be neck and neck. The rook might might actually be the, the little tail on the scale. Is that how you say it? Tail on the scale. It's probably uh, not a thing. <laughs> Sorry. I think like finger on the scale <laughs> is what we've got. Maybe. Yeah, tail on the scale. Is that a, is that that a German idiom? Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I tried to translate it, but <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, there's tip the scales as well. That's a, that's an evoker ability. <laughs> as well so it's okay it's okay <laughs> we're just gonna ignore this <laughs> but yeah right, Dire well. Wolves finishing off god king's skull seven percent to go until they can fight odin you can see that army is ready with army being on a pretty high cooldown i think it definitely makes sense and you're probably gonna see it being held until the rune buff comes in that would be crazy min maxing but i think oh, it's actually worse hello Shh. Okay, so what happened there? <laughs> if you kill Scovald, you lose the shield buff. But the Ragnarok cast projectiles could already be attacking, so you need to not kill Scovald at those exact timings like that. You need to stop damage and make sure you don't kill the boss like that. Luckily, they had Ankh and they had Mass Res, but this means the game is going to be so close right now because Direwolves just are now 25 seconds of death timer behind. Uh, and you can see they were trying to stop damage there to avoid exactly that, but the uh, last couple of dot ticks ended up causing that to happen. Anybody who's done some Halls of Valors this season uh, will have had that happen to them and, <laughs> and know that you got to play around that. So... Uh, Maybe they were trying to beat that Ragnarok and ended up just not quite being able to do it. So Odin is getting pulled here for Dire Wolves. We will see how much slower Ducks Can Fly are on that pull. I suspect also Ducks Can Fly are going to get to lust their first runic brand, whereas Dire Wolves are not. So this is actually, I mean, it's going to be right down to the wire. We are going to see Dire Wolves almost certainly finish the dungeon first. And then it's going to be a question of can Ducks Can Fly catch up in those 25 seconds or not. 55 seconds until their Bloodlust is available. That's actually going to line up almost perfectly with the first Runic brand for Ducks Can Fly, whereas Direwolves are just going to get to use it to send Odin home on the second Runic brand, probably. Yeah, I'm just staring at the cooldowns. I don't think Mirage's uh, blades are going to be ready for that rune buff, but everything else nah. should be available. We can see the PI being held as well, making sure that they have everything once that comes around, once that bloodlust is going in. And then on the other side, Direwolves did exactly what we were talking about, 4D sending all of his CC CDs, including that army, into this damage buff here, trying to make the most out of it. But like you said, those 25 seconds seconds are going to be so crucial oh, wow. between those Wolf, two so, teams. They just do so much damage in their cooldowns. They don't even need to get to the second Runic brand. They are going to stop the clock here at 2114, which means Ducks Can Fly have only a tiny bit of time in this Runic brand uh, to be able to make this oh. one work. A long run coming in here for their seconds. Shadow Priest as well. 10 seconds. And they have so much damage with their Lust, with all of their cooldowns here, with Power Four, Infusion, with everything three, coming out, but it's just two, not going to be one. enough for ducks no. can fly wow wow indeed that was a uh, closest dungeon yet by a lot this uh, weekend and and man you know both teams looking very clean aside from that that little unfortunate incident at the end of skullvald for uh dire wolves but it uh, nearly cost them but in the end they got the dungeon anyway but um, through most of that ducks were looking really good i mean they had uh, one death to dire wolves two for a lot of that um, they played it very, very uh, cleanly. Uh, you know, Mr. X and I were talking about this a lot. There was a difference in the Fenrir pulls. We're going to get into that later as we look at some replays, though. Yeah, no, this is the the first pull that uh, I think we we're talking about from uh, the side of Ducks, where uh, it looks like they just go right on through. They do the AOE Mind Sooth. They pull all these to the right side, a uh, left side here coming in, and they skip that first Sentinel there. This is a massive pull where uh, watching this when you guys were talking about it, I was like, well, they are going to make up like a ton of time here because they were a little bit behind. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like this was where like one of the biggest differences occurred, right? Ducks choosing to fight the wolves separately from the boss, whereas uh, dire wolves fight, fought the wolves with the big wolf. A lot of wolves going on. This is scary, yeah. though. These wolves on bolstering like having them out, oh, yeah. out there like that i mean that is tough yeah well 
We didn't see it, but yeah, there was uh, the on the direwolf side. They pulled a Fenrir and all the wolves at the same time, which was again, yeah. I think that was scary, what but they won off. them the game. That was the yeah. uh, the only thing that was really a big difference between the two teams in terms of time at the end of it. I think. Yeah. And yeah, of course, here's, here's the, the end. Of, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is uh, the Ragnarok cast goes off. This is unlucky. yeah. Look, see, they're, they're trying to stop damage here. They're just casting they're power shield. Stopping. They're not attacking. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it wasn't enough oh. though. Dots ticking. <laughs> Crucial. Chompy was Chompy was still DPS. Like that was Chompy. Blame Chompy on that oh. one, I think. Oh. I mean, uh, so you yeah, know, once you're in a feral the... groove, it's hard to hard to get out. <laughs> I mean, look at the DPS comparison. Of course, I mean, Death Can Fly. We're actually nearly finished with the dungeon as well, so I feel like the overalls here are actually somewhat. Um, yeah, somewhat something we can look at and actually deduct something from it. 40 going in with 161k. Don't nerf Unholy DK. Um, and on the <laughs> other side, we have Enhancement Shaman, Moza, coming in with 129. That's just such a massive gap between those two DPS. Yeah, yeah I think we that the Enhancement Shaman is... I, I think it's doing a little bit more to that primary target on a few of those pulls, so maybe it gets a little bit of extra value uh, relative to the Unholy there, but I mean, you can't you can't argue with the just the so much more damage from uh, the top two damage dealers even of dire wolves. You can look at that that graph of damage done, but I mean, really, a lot of it was just finding a way to make that second big spike, that twelve minute spike, happen. Right, the one with uh, with the wolves on the on Defendry, Right, that was where they cut a pull out of the dungeon, and that was where they got to do you know way more DPS because they were just pumping into a boss with all the wolves there. Of course. You know, the Shadow Priest and the, the healer are not too happy there. But the thing is, with Volcanic Active, it's not like Ducks Can Fly were getting good value out of their Shadow Priest either, because their Shadow Priest couldn't free cast on that pillar because they were getting knocked up by the Volcano every couple seconds anyway. So, uh, really, really good innovation from Direwolves, and I think particularly good given the Volcanic Affix. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but that's that's a really good point too. If you're doing the, the regular post-up strategy, uh, you're going to get a lot more of those Volcanic hits too, so... It's going to result in a lot less DPS. Interesting. Well, really, when it comes down to it, I mean, there were such minor differences between these two teams in that first dungeon. That makes me very excited for our second dungeon, which is going to be our, our first Court of Stars of the weekend. And this is one of the higher key levels. I believe it was at 22. Uh, we've got uh, Sanguine Explosive uh, for the two affixes, of course, Thundering. And uh, it is Tyrannical. So this one, this one could get a little bit messy, couldn't it? Uh, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. I, I do wonder what... Uh, you know, Ducks Can Fly is going to do in terms of, like, composition, especially uh, after how good the Unholy DK and Feral Druid uh, I know end up working mm. out for Dire Wolves. Like, are you going to run the Rogue again? Uh, I, I think Court of Stars, you're, like, you can do some massive pulls. Like, I think that's where Sub really shines, like, in those massive pulls, like the uncapped ones, like, where you can just go crazy, but that's also, like, where Unholy and even Feral are great at now, so... Uh, for me, it'll be interesting what they decide to run comp-wise. Yeah, last week we saw I mean, both Sloth and Echo really focus on the Unholy, DK, Feral, Druid, uh, Shadow Priest, Trinity for their DPS, and they didn't really deviate from that uh, all weekend. And that, you know, they, they were the two fastest teams as well. So it seems like there are some, there is some room for variety, but I feel like there are three very clear front runners. Uh, what would you agree, Mix? I just wanted to say that we know that Ducks Can Fly can whip out at least the Unholy DK because Moza played Unholy DK in some of the time trial keys. So that is an option for them to switch that over if they so choose to do that. I think they're going to stick to the Rogue. And then I'm really curious what we're going to see from Core. I think it might just stay on the Shadow Priest. Um, but yeah, Court of Stars should be really, really fun. I'm looking forward to this dungeon. We barely saw it in Group A. There is a lot of stuff you can do in terms of pathing and how you want to pull around your CDs when you want to do the big pulls and, and that kind of stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it's always one of the keys that I look most forward to, like most of the Legion keys. And uh, <laughs> both of these teams are getting ready to, to get in there. Yeah, Direwolves off to a good start, representing their uh, their new organization well. Of course, this was the team that was known as Ethical uh, last season, picked up by Direwolves now, just announced uh, this morning on uh, Twitter, actually. So doing their new uh, team proud, and we'll see if they can close it out with a 2-0. But Ducks Can Fly uh, certainly looking like a threat here. I mean, that last engine was extremely close. It was pretty much just as clean the whole way through, just little differences in what they pulled, when they pulled. 
And this Court of Stars, uh, I could easily see being an opportunity for them to, to tie it up. And they both uh, ended up, I believe, banning, what, the uh, the Azure Vaults out of the series, right? Where I think they both That's did, right, they yeah. didn't really like that. Uh, you do have the Temple of the Jade Server, which Ruby they're Lifeboats. both pretty close. So we'll see. Maybe they can oh. force the next map. Aha! Right. Okay. Okay. I was wrong. No rogue. We're seeing Feral come out. Moza staying on the Enhancement Shaman. And then on the other side, Dratnos, there's something I think you're very familiar with. Yeah, we've got the Vengeance Demon Hunter from uh, from Dire Wolves. A lot of good stuff you can do with that spec uh, in this dungeon as well as we've got the boat ride going. <laughs> Looks like maybe a little uh, uh, displayed a little bit differently for our observer than it might be for the players, but I'm sure once they get off the boats on the side of Dire Wolves, it's going to all work out. Uh, how it's supposed to look is how it, is how it is over on the on the side of Ducks Can Fly. But yeah, so Vengeance Demon Hunter, you've got this sigil of silence that. I think is going to be kind of the all-star ability out of them. Obviously, the warriors have AoE interrupt as well, but the thing about the warrior AoE interrupt is it only actually silences the mobs if it kicks them. Whereas the Vengeance Demon Hunter one, it will kick that. It, it will silence them even if they weren't currently casting, which can be really powerful against like those imp pulls in particular. It does look like maybe it was not just a uh, an observer issue, perhaps on the side of uh, of Direwolf. So we'll get that checked out and. Uh, potentially start it back up again if we need to here. Maybe they thought they get automatically ported in the MDI or something. <laughs> We're going to figure it out, I'm sure. But those teams are going to make sure that they're starting at the same time. No unfair situations happening here as these teams reload that key. It's going to take a few seconds. Uh, usually that's uh, about a minute or two because uh, they have to go out, reset, all of that. Um, sometimes even get the key again. So uh, we'll see. We're gonna we're gonna start in just a second, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds like uh, sounds like Grand Magistrix Elisand uh, successfully blockaded the boats on the side of Direwolves, so they weren't actually able to show up for them in that run, uh, which. <laughs> we are, we're just going to do a quick little restart here for both teams, of course. Nothing had happened in that run yet anyway, so absolutely no problem uh, there. And yeah, Court of Stars, we'll get to see the boat ride once again, my favorite part of the dungeon. Yep, the yeah. warriors come down from on high that will uh, remake that one. Uh, we're going to have a talk with the uh, the boat drivers, make sure they, they arrive. And uh, the gondoliers. Yeah, that happens sometimes, right? Oh, I mean, sometimes your ride share, per, they cancel on you, right? You, you know, you can see them coming towards you, and then last minute, canceled, right? I hate it when that happens. It must be a you thing. It never happened to me. Must, must yeah, I was be. kind of thinking the same thing. I'd never really have that happen to me either. I was like, this sounds like something that <laughs> is <laughs> Dell exclusive. Well, you, you guys have to min max it, right? You have to. I don't know. You can't order something too delicious, right? If you're ever if you're doing that, you have mm -hmm. to get something that's like not delicious enough to tempt the person into just no, you know, no, no, no. It and canceling the order. I'm talking about ride share, not ordering food. Oh, okay. I'm talking. I was thinking about food delivery. I see. Oh, yeah. oh wait. I'm curious on that, Dread. No, so you purposely ordering not good food in the hope yeah. that <laughs> somebody it's, you gotta get it's like eighty percent. Yeah. Huh? So you get a pizza, but then you make sure that one of the ingredients is like something that most people wouldn't really want, you know? Well, because they're going to steal it like, if it smells too good, safe. right? Like, you got to make sure that it's not wow. over the threshold of, That's... like, you know, better than the uh, Where are you guys uh, ordering stuff? It's a very grim worldview. <laughs> it's, it's like the food's being stolen. Doe is just ordering multiple say. cars that aren't coming. I'm just playing around What's going on with y'all? That's not happening here. Okay, the thing I learned well. from this conversation is do not go outside, okay? That's all I'm learning. It's Stay like inside. Mad Max here. Make your own pizza in the oven and, and you're safe. Nobody's stealing your food. Nobody's leaving you on the street. <laughs> That's right. Like, Dratnos is going to step outside and end up in the Thunderdome after the, uh, the broadcast if he's not careful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see the Thunderdome Court of Stars 22 we've, we haven't talked about the affixes yet that are going on in this run but uh, we do have Sanguine and Explosive joining Tyrannical in this one which are both going to serve to I think limit how big the pulls can be or particularly how long they can safely be doing a big pull and uh, at the end of the pull it's going to really reward the, the team that can manage that Sanguine affix as best as possible it's kind of scary uh, because obviously movement becomes an issue with, uh, you know, I think of like the first boss and the last boss, obviously, that you have to watch where you stand. Adding uh, explosives to that really, well, I mean, never mind. That doesn't really change it. But 
they're they're gonna be too difficult affixes to uh to deal with. That point totally failed. I'm just gonna put that out there. I had an idea in my head, and then it just kinda left halfway through. But No problem. I'm still thinking about, Sometimes I'm my still thoughts about also that, leave me control. halfway through. It'd it be, be happening. There, there you go. <laughs> you should try playing but, melee, Doa. <laughs> I, I played Melee for until BFA was the first time I played ranged, actually, since Vanilla. So why did you pick up a healer now? So much responsibility. Uh, Well, I, I played healer back in, like, uh, Burning Crusade and stuff like that. But I never really thought oh, of that same. as... I don't think of that as ranged. I, 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 I mean, I guess it is, but you're, you're healing. But so it's more responsibility. It you're standing. You can yeah, agree exactly. on that. I wanted to try the new class. I hadn't healed for like years. Some get, I wanted to give it a try. It's been fun, but Matt will be excited about this. I'm thinking about going back to Beast Mastery next season. The easiest spec. That was in your special. World. That was your calling. I feel like Doa. I feel like Beast Mastery <laughs> Hunter was here. You're, you're kind of coming to terms with the fact that you're 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 a BM player. <laughs> it's okay, uh, I have you know a question. you question. Okay. Because cause we're ahead. seeing so many off-meta classes, like particularly this week, and we haven't even seen all of them yet. Uh, I just got a preview of something as well that's going to be a treat later. I want to know what class chat is playing at the moment as main, and everybody just write it at the same time, and later I'll go in the VOD, and I'll, I'll promise i read all of them. So I want to know what class are you playing as main right now, chat. That's something I'm very curious about. So we know Dratnos plays all the tanks. We know that Mex is playing uh, Demon Hunter and uh, Death Knight right now, right? Mm -hmm. But what is what is Mr. X playing on live right now? Uh, I'm playing Sub Rogue right now. Uh, oh. Our guild didn't really have a rogue, and I was like, why not? Uh, it's been super easy to get into groups, because rogue is never something where you're like, oh, we definitely don't want to have one of those. Um, I, I don't know what to play as a second uh, character. I'm kind of like going through the process on that. I, I'm, I might wait and see what goes on with Rhett Paladin. I don't know. Ooh. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's wow, I mean, once big all rework coming, come right? Through. But, At least it, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be new, it'll be fun, it'll be a little fresh, so maybe give that a try. Yeah. Yeah, I've That's been playing a little bit idea. of Rhett even just on live right now, but the, the, talent, the talent rework's coming to that spec and that class in general. Really exciting yeah. for uh, Look crazy, yeah, yeah. I, I think Rhett's going to be still... a really good. I I wouldn't be surprised if we see if we start seeing it in uh, in in competitions like this one even after after ten point zero point seven. That's uh, hmm. that spec is getting a lot of of neat toys and I mean especially when you like dude when you look at a dungeon like Court of Stars, you ever play a Rhett Paladin in here? You've got either Radiant Decree or Wake of Ashes that just stuns those imps on like a, a very short cooldown as well and does a bunch of damage too, so just completely trivializing that section of the dungeon. Uh, really nice. Nice little bonus in this in this dungeon in particular. True. Hmm. A little season two preview perhaps. I'm not there's well, an enhancement challenge. I think it, Shadow Priest been playing a little bit. I think Beast Mastery is probably that's probably pretty good for you, though. It's got a nice, you know the the it's, best of both worlds of melee and ranged, right? You as yep. you can move well, as while we used casting. To call it, as we used to call it when Matt and I raided together, we used to refer to it as long melee. Because, you know, you're yeah. basically a melee spec. You don't have to sacrifice anything for your range. You don't have to stand in one place for any amount of time. So, you yeah. know, you just keep those you get the stacks going bow, and... you can just auto attack. And you're pretty yeah. much you're pretty much good to go. Uh you barb yeah. shots in there, maybe a kill command, and I think you're 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 doing it. You just complain about your uh, your pets once in a while and, and you're good. That's beast mastery. You're like, it's oh my probably pet a got stuck somewhere and respawned. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise enhancement is always an option. I've been playing I've been leveling a Shadow Priest too. Trying it out. We'll see. Well, don't worry. You won't have to hear about this much longer, because we're only moments away from getting our second map started between Dire Wolves and Ducks Can Fly. And we will see if Ducks Can Fly can tie it up. I think it's totally possible. Ooh, don't step in that. That looks dangerous. Why is that guy hitting those vases? There's a lot of strange things going on in Suramar. Those were the yeah, bizarre I mean... goods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, break you remember those, that world quest? Enforcer? <laughs> Where you would stomp on the on the berries to make wine. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see yeah, this intro. I'm yeah, thinking right. of that quest, just <laughs> standing there, jumping around in that, in that bottle, not a bottle, like a 
Wine press. I don't know what you call this. Yeah. Tub. Wine press, right? Is it a big bucket? What is it? A bucket, bucket? Like a big, it's yeah. a very it's a big wine bucket. Press. It's a wine press? Press really? wine. Yeah, okay. you press. I mean, you're pressing it with your feet. You're pressing your grapes. Isn't it called a wine press? Okay. I don't know. It could be. We'll Something figure else. it out. Got the the boats rest. are rolling. The boats. Let's go. They're here. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, back to those team comps. We talked a little bit about that Vengeance Demon Hunter, and now the Feral coming in for Ducks Can Fly as uh, a deviation to what we saw in the previous key. I'm really excited every time I see 40 on DK. I think the first time I watched MDI, I saw 40 on DK pull like massive amounts of DPS, which was one of the things why DK looked really fun to me. Um, so yeah, shout out for, for giving me that class, uh, definitely. Now that I'm here, I can finally say it, but Goatface is already running here with that little uh, okay. garden at the door, seeing some, so, some moves. Ducks Can Fly had to pull that with them, or chose to pull that with them. Direwolves actually don't. They, they can imprison it and run past. And imprison, imprison and sap are the two CCs that won't get you in combat uh, with the mob when you walk past it. So direwolves don't have to fight that. What that actually means is the thundering timer is going to be a little bit better for direwolves as they actually hop around this little fountain here. And this is actually something you used to... You used to be able to accomplish this by skipping over on the right-hand side of that bridge uh, in Legion, but they increased the constructs, guards, uh, like detection radius uh, so that it would see you from a little bit further away so you can't do that anymore but direwolves have found a way to do it even now and this is going to be a huge pull with only one construct in it constructs are the thing that limit you on how much you can pull at once in this dungeon because they have you really need like three kicks on them or two kicks with a shaman which uh, that's part of the reason you're seeing resto shaman in this dungeon i suspect oh, oh. no an arcane Things manifestation is in combat for, for ducks, ducks can fly can that is fly. Yeah, that, that thing is almost never supposed to get pulled. That uh, Those big arcade manifestations are really nasty enemies that it's very hard to safely fight them with anything else. So not something you'll see almost ever in MDI level of keys. Meanwhile, direwolves are just doing this rolling chain pull here. Uh, through all these mobs, and they're doing actually a pretty good job of managing sanguine healing as well. If any of the mobs start getting sanguine healed, it's not a big deal. They just want to avoid the boss taking any ticks of sanguine healing. I really love how they were running to that beacon and holo disabled it while already in fight with the boss. That's really, really nice min-maxing we're seeing here. Wow. But now you need to be so careful because patrol captain Gerdo, he casts a lot and you do not want to spawn these sanguine patches under him. That's going to be a very bad time if it happens. We're seeing substantial amount of sanguine icker healing in the details meter already as holo is on the way once more to disable yet another beacon it seems like. But yeah, they finished off the trash finally and can now DPS the boss down. And Ducks Can Fly are on their way as well, not yet in fight with the boss, but doing a lot of trash that is right in front of it, the construct being pulled up, uh, just to make sure it doesn't get healed. And that's kind of the challenge with this, with this dungeon here, right? Not a lot of room in many spaces and a lot of puddles on the floor. Yeah, the Sanguine healing is definitely, you're going to see that on top of the healing meters for both teams on a lot of these pulls, I suspect. Direwolves here, three of these Duskwatch uh, are spawned by Gerda. One of them was from the very start of the dungeon. It's going to be interrupted and just brought in and cleaved down with the boss. The other two were handled with Hex and Imprison uh, to keep them out of the fight. And they just have to DPS the captain down to 25% here, and they will win and be able to uh, have it poison and die. Ducks can fly, on the other hand, have started the boss as well. They are a little bit slower here, and they are also going to be a little bit behind on count unless they uh, start pulling trash into the patrol captain here. There is some trash that would be pretty good to pull, though, down or behind the back there. There's the guard and the worms, at least, that is a bit of a free extra count that Ducks Can Fly might be interested in picking up, maybe after they've handled their signal beacon CCs. Meanwhile, Direwolves here, they're actually bringing their healer back with their tank for this next pull. Somebody in the group, looks like Chompy, is going and setting up a skip here, is just running past and running ahead to update the checkpoint, open the door mm -hmm. to the other half of the dungeon. And the other four players here, notably including the healer, are setting up for a dock pull, it looks like. Or maybe not even dock pull. Maybe it's just going to be a little bit of a pull. Maybe they're not even pulling anything. Yeah, they're just... Yeah, I think they were just waiting, trying to make just sure that the door. they can pass safely. 
Um, and that's exactly what happened. Chompy opened the door and now they're on their way. Uh, whenever Ooh. we see Court for the first time, I feel like we have the duty to remind everybody that both of these teams are going to have the same events here in this area that they can trigger. So there's not going to be any unfair buff uh on one side that the other team doesn't get they have the same buffs and they know what buffs they're getting so all is equal between them but a big big pull to start us off here for direwolves yeah sigil of silence carried a lot of weight there stopping all of those imps from casting for basically their entire lives this construct now just needs to be interrupted and besides that uh, they've just got to make sure that jack lives those shadow slashes uh, or that they stop those and this actually is going really well for Direwolves. They've done a great job here of managing these mobs, and Jack still hasn't even proc Last Resort, which you gotta be really delighted about being Avengers Demon Hunter at this point in this dungeon with Last Resort still available. That I would have I would have expected it to have proc'd already on some of those earlier pulls, and the fact that Jack has kept it alive means that he's gonna be so safe now for the rest of this dungeon. Yeah, and they already pulled the first enforcer, killed that. Now Imakacha is with them and she is going to be the target for the next minute or so we are in a tyrannical key so maybe it's not going to take that long but you can see them already make way for the other side as they're trying to cross the bridge as most of the events are over there maybe even trying to pull something into here as you don't necessarily want to do single target dps there's a little bit of an oopsie going on for ducks can fly they're currently doing the harbor but i believe it was luca who fell there for a second yeah maybe dying after doing the skip to open the door and then rejoining the group there four ducks can fly meanwhile direwolves are pulling into the next set of imps that's going to be again sigil of silence just entirely one button uh handling that entire pull basically no! for them unfortunately we have a death coming out here this is going to have to be a battle res because you can't actually release when you're in combat with one of the three mini bosses and they're still in combat with i'm a cut you here they also have uh, a mistress an inquisitor and an Enforcer, it looks like, in this pull with them. They're setting up to line of sight this Enforcer, making sure that they respect that mob's damage. Uh, and they, are, they don't have Nature's Vigil or Vampiric Embrace available to just be able to brute force through it, nor do they have Spirit Link Totem. So really heads up decision here, just, just making sure they don't take too much extra damage. A little bit of niche DK knowledge, maybe. Uh, obviously, other classes can do this as well. But with the DK, you're just going to have a grip or a stun, depending on what you're skilled in for the Eye of the Storm of the Inquisitor every single time, making that mob super, super safe. So you're not going to deal with the Eye of the Storm damage as long as there's a grip available. You can just grip it, interrupt it with that. And that should be making those pulls just a little bit safer for Direwolves here. And uh, you can see that uh, Balgar is running up here as the rest of the team seems to go into hiding. Yeah, it looks pulling, like while that mob was the running harbor. at them... Yeah, look at this sequencing from Direwolves. This is so creative. They're deciding to go around this dungeon in a completely different order. That is going to be the last resort here for Jack at the start of this poll, so that is a big safety net that they are losing here. Sigil of Silence once again helping group these mobs, uh, all keep these mobs all grouped up nicely. And this is a lot of damage that's coming out, even though it's tyrannical and not fortified. That uh, cast from the mini-boss here, the Impending Doom, just does so much damage. You can see Nature's Vigil and Vampiric Embrace both being used here to help keep the group topped through this damage. And Hollow, it looks like, setting up now to go and use the Wounded Nightborn here. This mob has quite a bit of arm time. It takes quite a while before uh, it summons the thing. So got to make sure you go and start that early so you're not just sitting around and waiting for the third mini-boss to come join. And then rejoining the group is Hollow. 90% trash count here is not quite enough for the Dire Wolves. They're probably going to be looking to grab a two-pack here into the mini-boss. And that should be 100% after the... Uh, there's you, you do get like 6% from the mini-boss at the very end of the dungeon. So uh, here comes that probably final pull of the dungeon before boss, mini-boss, boss for Dire Wolves. Ducks can fly on the other hand. They are looping around. Because they didn't do that bridge pull that Dire Wolves did, they have a much harder time navigating around this area. They can't just go over that bridge in the middle. They have to go around the back where the boss is. They are still doing good work here, though, getting their next imp pull going. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see these teams aren't that far away from each other. 
Uh, a little bit, uh, of course, is going to be the penalty that they got from those six deaths on the side of Ducks Can Fly, unfortunately. But both of these teams are on their way or dealing with the third of these mini bosses previously to Talixe, and that is exactly what you want to be in right now. Now, Ducks Can Fly need a little bit more percent to make sure they can actually move on, but I'm sure they're going to try and find it. And speaking of trying to find things, Jack is now also pulling a little bit more here, it seems like. Maybe these two are coming into boss? It seems like it would be awfully slow to do anything else. Yeah, it yeah, seems like exactly that. Both of the death scripts have come in, and now the rest of the way, they need to walk as they pull the boss up. It seems like everybody is going to stack up. Now, it is going to be tyrannical sanguine on this boss here as well, so you need to really make sure that the Inquisitor and the Mistress die in a place where they don't cause too much harm, as there's a lot of ads on this boss, and you need to watch your feet. You can see they're stepping pretty close to each other without triggering the thundering right away, making sure they can make the most out of the buff uptime now there needs to be an interrupt and in comes the infernal eruption everybody stacks up for that and after that they can spread out a little bit more beautifully done those sanguine patches you can see them in the background not posing any problems whatsoever and in 20 seconds they will have blood loss i don't think they'll use it here though jack ends up not using the sigil of silence on this first set that's actually really it's really smart to do that. A lot of people will just commit everything to that first set of imps, and then the second and third you won't have anything for. Direwolves here doing a good job, though, of spreading out their effects to stop those mobs, right? And uh, having a much easier time as a result. Uh, and this boss, even though it's 22 tyrannical, those imps still are not going to pose them too much trouble because they have just so much AoE damage uh, in their comp as well. They're just able to, to get those things killed very quickly, very reliably. Yeah, but you can see the damage coming out on both teams. Don't, those HP bars don't seem to be topped at all. Both healers are completely pumping right now. Healing Rain being deployed as soon as possible whenever it is ready, trying to keep everybody in it, making sure that they're getting at least a passive healing from that on top of everything else. Both teams holding on to their bloodlust. Ducks can fly, need more percent and more boss damage to catch up here. And Direwolves have that damage. Vengeance, and we talked about it at the beginning, Vengeance will also be able to use their Spectral Flight and actually see the Spy in the next event. Of course, they're going to need all of the clues first, so you need to be really quick with the clues and collect all of them, but then the Demon Hunter, similar to the Paladins, can actually use that Spectral Flight and make sure they see the Spy. It's going to light up red for him in comparison to all of the other white silhouettes that we're seeing, um, so that's going to be really really helpful to not run around and look for that spy ducks can fly now also trying to finish up the boss here hollow just doing nothing here for direwolves not doesn't have even a job doesn't have somebody to go talk to looks like the other five clues have all been found and so jack will be uh, identifying that spy really quickly ducks can fly it looks like they're setting up a little bit of a, a split plan here they're sending luca uh, and quarter there to go inside and get the clues Maybe just Luca actually is doing it, and everybody else is going to go and get them that last little bit of count that they need, uh, because they are, of course, a tiny bit short. So this is a good way to speed up a little bit in theory, although it is still, I think, slower than what Direwolves were doing in that area of the dungeon, even if they, they got there at the same time, which obviously Direwolves got there a little bit faster. Here comes that spy now for Direwolves, and they just have to deal with this mini boss and the last boss. Let's see how long it takes Ducks Can Fly to solve this puzzle. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be the question. They don't have anything to actually see the spy, so they need to find it naturally. Which sometimes, if you've ever been in this dungeon before, can wow. be tricky. But Luca found it, was in here. You know, he familiarized himself with the environment, making sure that he was going to find that spy instantly. I think it was what's going on. Well, he was collecting the clues, here. right, um, while they were doing DPS. Yeah. So, yeah, he, uh, they, they were able to actually get quite a good bit of, uh, of time save on that. And I think now they're uh, they're probably going to end up being about a minute behind Direwolves here, which means if Direwolves have a couple of deaths on the last boss, could be Ducks Can Fly able to overtake them. Of course, last boss here on 22 Tyrannical. It has been nerfed a little bit since the start of the season. Still quite a scary encounter, uh, and one that does require a lot of precision from the group, right? You've got to make sure that you are 
baiting correctly, baiting in a nice spot, uh, especially in an MDI, because you, you want to make sure that you're not being inefficient and like dodging and having images all over the room. So I expect we're going to see the teams doing a pretty good job there. Yeah, you can actually see there's a world marker already down uh, as they plan where they're going to, to have all of these mechanics happen on this fight. Yeah, absolutely. And Bloodlust is available for Dire Wolves. I'm just looking at the cooldowns. Army is going to be up in just a little bit. It's probably going to line up with that Abomination Limp. We can see the PI should be ready then as well and everything else just coming up nicely for the Dire Wolves. Now they need to make sure that they bait here really, really well. We have Chaz on the outside. Um, actually not that far on the outside here. It just looks like they're just the yellowing it. Yeah, yeah they're, I guess I they're not yellowing gonna... it, but they're keeping it close to boss, which is nice. This yeah. is a way to reduce movement on this as well. One of the benefits of Direwolves' comp as well is that they're playing a Death Knight, which means you have AMS, IBF, and then AMS again that let you just clear those tornadoes. So you don't have to worry as much about getting boxed into a corner with a bunch of those stunned tornadoes because your DK can just clear a bunch of them throughout the fight. You can see there's AMS being used. AMS mm -hmm. doesn't even work on the AOE anyway, since it's physical damage. So the best use for it is literally just clearing out some of those tornadoes. Yeah, and we just saw the puzzle box come out of 40. That means it's time for damage. You can see him rise up on that details. But of course, wow. Chas is going to be right there with him. Look at the damage that the dire wolves are pushing out with that bloodlust. Advisor Melandros is melting in their hands. Of course, Holo and Jack are helping together. They're a full DPS as well. And this team seems to take that 2-0 in the second game of the day, 18, 17% remaining as the boss is dropping lower and lower and lower. And I really like the routing that we saw from Direwolves here. Ducks can fly, though, doing a really good job of, of closing this one up towards the end here. And if they hadn't wiped early, it actually feels to me like Ducks can fly had a, a faster strategy even perhaps in uh, in this quarter stars. They're only going to be 35% of a boss's health behind with a full wipe on their side. Really, really good showing for, you know, a 16th seeded team. But yeah, it is going to be Dire Wolves stopping the clock there at 17.09 in Court of Stars. Yeah, the Dire Wolves win it 2-0, but uh, Ducks can fly. Definitely looking like a major threat in the lower bracket. Uh, like you just said, Dratnos, it really was just a matter of those deaths at the beginning that cost them the time, that uh, probably cost them the map, and maybe a game three. So a team to watch later in the weekend, but for now, Dire Wolves will move on. Yeah, uh, I'm excited to see the Ducks Can Fly team uh, you know, compete in that lower bracket, because like you mentioned, Dratnos, right? Uh, it, the, really, just the wipe at the start is like 30 seconds a time. Like, the, the route was pretty good. Uh, these seems really competitive, but uh, Dire Wolves, I think like a lot of us uh, probably predicted advances uh, here, and I think this is actually probably the first wipe that happened uh, you know, from Ducks Can Fly at the start. Uh, they lost, I believe, pretty much everybody there at the rip. Yeah, it was like three or so or four, and then uh, a couple more throughout. But these first pulls in this dungeon can be extremely rough. It's very easy to get uh, caught in something or not kick something at the exact right time. Like, uh, I, I was, I've been talking about it. I had a very traumatic Court of Stars yesterday, and it, was, it looked a lot like that, uh, that first pull for Ducks. Only at a much lower key level. <laughs> <laughs> this quarter stars is gonna live on infamy. The Della quarter stars every time I, I have like nightmares, man. <laughs> was there only one wipe like that, or were there a lot more for you? It was. It was uh, everything you can imagine. I see. Yeah, I've, I've been in the, in some thirty death quarter stars. It's uh, it's a dungeon was, that can do we that at, to you. I think we were like 23, 24 by the end of it. We timed it by like less than a minute, but it was it was a nightmare. But. Uh, that's the last thing people want to hear. It's like a right certified no now. lever. Me, Doa. Yeah, we. My my second group, man. The first group fell apart. The tank left immediately. The second group, though, they stuck it out. We got it done. Just like Dire Wolves, getting it done here. Looking at the numbers, you know, again, the the DPS, you know, more or less higher across the board. But uh, we were talking about this earlier that Ducks Can Fly, uh, you know, may have had a slightly more efficient route. Yeah, yeah I think it's so. just the I mean, unholy DK damage again. Yeah. You can go, DK is uh, very absolutely. good and does not need Insane. any nerfs. <clears throat> <laughs> if you say enough times, it'll be it'll be true. <laughs> yeah, somebody has works, to right? listen at some point, right? 
Right. Yeah, you can look at the Sanguine healing as well. You can see that a little bit more happened for Direwolves, but on the other hand, they did bite off a much bigger first pull, right? They did. They basically did this rolling chain pull into boss, and I'm surprised that it didn't end up being much faster than Ducks Can Fly when you look at the end here, right? Like, it seems like doing such an aggressive pull at the start of the dungeon would be a way to make a huge time advantage over the other team, but when you factor in the fact the other team had a, a full wipe and, you know, 30 seconds of death timer uh, against them... It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like that was actually faster for uh, for the wolves there. It seems like ducks can fly. Maybe their starter dungeon maybe it was slower, but they they seemed to speed up really nicely towards the middle and end of that dungeon, and uh, they nearly were able to claw it back at the very end. Especially if there hadn't been that death timer uh, that really slammed the slammed the door on them. Yeah, I mean, both dungeons really were were within a pull uh, or like a small change. Of being, you know, dead even with uh, both of these teams. So, you know, I, I feel like in a different universe and one of the many, you know, strands of universe or whatever, we have a situation where, you know, Ducks doesn't maybe wipe or maybe they decide to pull all the wolves on the Fenrir and we've got a, a tool for Ducks can fly. It, it's, it was legitimately that close, which is always fun to see in MDI because I feel like a lot of times you end up with a team that looks noticeably <laughs> ahead, especially in some of these groups where you have you know, more of a difference in seating coming in uh, from, from time to time. But, uh, but yeah. Ducks are a threat. <laughs> I'm I'm biased, DK yeah, very man. true. Very true. I mean, nothing, nothing to see here. <laughs> only the truth. <laughs> but actually, I'm really excited for the next game that's coming up because if you've been watching our chat, they've been spamming for like two hours uh, about the Cement Gaming, the German team, and. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a I'm a small fangirl as well, and I'm looking forward to see them. <laughs> it's it's been subtle, your your excitement about uh, cement, you know, it, it, hard to pick up on. If you, uh, I'm glad if you didn't tell us directly. <laughs> it's almost so, so thanks. almost yeah. as slightly as my love for DK is it. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, DK <laughs> might get nerfed. We'll cement. see what happens to cement. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> huge cement fan. <laughs> Just in general. It's such a strong substance to make driveways out of. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about cement. The lore behind like the rock, name, we, we, they told us, um, is apparently that their healer was queuing as shaman into a key. And the title of the key was LF Cement. And then they whispered him asking, you cement? Okay. Which, I don't know why, but apparently that's what? the lore. So now you know um, why they're called that. I don't know. <laughs> hmm. All right. It just well, keeps on I mean, giving. there's a lot of stuff that happens in the world of Warcraft. Mm. It's one of those. There you yeah, go. Yeah, they'll be... Uh, now we know. Yeah. Well, we'll see. They'll be we'll up against the uh, Donuts. We'll yeah. 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 NA's and best hope. an exciting uh, team, too. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah you're top, right. Top seeded yeah. NA team, so uh, cool. for any any North America fans, that's uh, our our first real uh, you know high seeded team in the uh, in the bracket that we'll get to see in the next series. That's right, the team that two owed sloth in uh, Group C uh, back in Shadowlands Season Three fr fairly recently. So we'll see what they can do against Cement Gaming, the much lauded, the much anticipated German team. After the break, don't go anywhere. The Mythic Dungeon International will be back in just a few.
Hey, we're back for our third match of the day here on the Mythic Dungeon International. Your host, Doe, here along with Dratnos, Tettles, and Zyronic. A full NA desk to, uh, you know, maybe see the, the NA hope get through and move on in the upper bracket. We will see if Donuts, uh, minus the despair, can take on the German squad Cement. Uh, it's going to be a tough one, I think, for uh, for Cement. Obviously, Donuts coming in as a higher seed, coming in with some pretty substantial results in uh, MDI and things like a great push over the uh, over the seasons. But uh, Tettles, uh, welcome back. Uh, what, what do you think we're going to see in this one? Yeah, so uh, Makes, before the break, was hyping up Cement a ton. I guess I'll come and talk, in a, talk up Donuts a little bit. Uh, they did compete in yeah, the last MDI. Period. They had a player named anarchy on their team and now they uh, anarchy has since quit the game and now stove is playing in his replacement stove has been doing live keys for a very long time um just like a well-known european high key pusher the rest of this team is na though so they had to they had to source a new player as you know north americans we have to occasionally import some Local players resource. this is typical for a region yeah <laughs> um, and and yeah they've been practicing a ton they started practicing even before time trials, they, they were they have been putting in some serious hours. All right, but uh, here is a uh, cement gaming, and uh, I believe uh, you can go and see Pocky or Ponky rather stream. Uh, yeah, they are streaming right now. So if you want to get a player POV, if you want to learn a little bit about uh, that role, you can go uh, check that out. Of course, stick with us here, too. But I think it's important we talk about when some of the players are streaming as well, since they are allowed to do that. And, uh, you know, if you're playing that class, if you're playing that spec, you can you can learn a lot that way. Um, maybe don't go into your next M+, and, like, tell your tank to, like, pull the way you see an MDI. But, uh, you know, maybe learn about the button presses, at least. Yeah. I, I was I think, pull, out I think that pulling the way that we see in this Ruby Life pull should be good. I think it's valuable. <laughs> hmm. I, mm. I don't recommend. I don't know about that one. Don't recommend. Well, we got a ban on Knock the Defensive and a ban on Court of Stars, and uh, we are, like uh, Tuttle's mentioned, starting with that Ruby Life Pools, which is going to be Fast and Furious, as we've seen already today, since that is uh, just, quote-unquote, just a plus 20. <laughs> well, things, we'll see where just things go from 20. there. Now, now, this dungeon was actually banned by both teams in our last series, um, and we were talking about this a little bit, where, you know, because it is one of the quote-unquote easier keys in uh, MDI this weekend, that's going to be something where the pressure's on to be perfect, and we'll see which team is more perfect-er as we get into this one. Mm. Another Enhanced Shaman. Back-to-back -back series we see an Enhanced Shaman played. Interesting. What do you think of that, Tails? I, I do think that the enhance is pretty good. I mean, we talked about the enhance a couple of times on MDI, uh, in the MDI format. Generally, it doesn't see a lot of play, kind of similar to the sub rogue, because of um, a large amount of like. It, at some point, you're not going to be doing enough AOE damage. But donuts on the left hand side of the screen are actually running that sub rogue, so we're actually seeing a little bit difference in composition from what we saw last weekend. Now we did see perplexed earlier today. They also played the sub rogue in here again. Both of these classes do kind of similar things. Uh, they're both right, great yeah. at funnel. Some of the some of the absolute best funnel in the game comes from both the subtle two rogue and the enhancement shaman. But generally, they're seen as uh, difficult to slot in just because the dungeon trash packs are not living long enough. But I think at some point, especially in like this twenty fortified ruby life pools, we just have enough AOE from some of these other specs. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think I think my understanding is that they're better at funnel, but their option to do like mass AOE is definitely like lower potential than the rogue and the feral because feral and rogue can just blast the aoe without doing as much funnel yeah as choose to but it doesn't really have that option so i mean they'll definitely blast the boss damage and that's what we'll see from that enhance it's going to do like tank levels of overall but it's going to do so much prior that it just definitely makes up for it plus wind fury yeah and it, i think that this dungeon yeah wind fury is like eight eight to nine percent damage on your tank by itself by the way but uh i think that one of the big things like ruby life pools in general is one of the dungeons that priority cleave is uh, the most valuable and like that funnel damage that we talk about is some of the most important because i mean this is the first boss uh melodrissa chill will like you get these whelps you get the whelps in the boss and basically you're able to like primordial wave or you're able to like uh, sure can storm eviscerate the boss and just make sure you get your like lava lashes out or you're getting a, a bunch of bonus resources and you just convert that into single target damage super hard to the point where you'll if you like looked at the damage that was dealt to the boss after um, after this happened, you would see like the enhancement shaman or the sub rogue are doing you know twice the amount of damage to the second closest right. target. 
Okay, so cool. one quick question. Looking at the uh, looking at the UIs for both team here, teams here, something has to be pointed out. There's no way Thomas right. didn't actually have bloodlust, right? That's got to be a spectator bug. <laughs> Imagine if they were this far ahead and they didn't hit bloodlust still. That'd be kind of wild. I feel like they have I mean, to. Do you, they have to do you need it. lust for that first pull? I feel like you don't need it, but it's definitely like a safety thing, right? Now, unless, you know, there is a possibility that they just are saving the bloodlust because it is a low key level. They have Man. the employee DK front cap AoE. Maybe they could be doing some ridiculous, like, double destroyer plus something else pull coming up here. Uh, that would mean you only I mean, get one dungeon in the dungeon. This dungeon is 1051. Yeah, you'd only get one lust, so. Either way, great split know. for donuts there. Definitely on pace with Perplexed from earlier today. I actually want to go look up the, that's the split in that dungeon for them because that was a ridiculously fast dungeon for Perplexed. It was something like sub eleven, right? You said ten fifty one was Perplexed time. Yeah, two. I think this is going to be two first boss split. Okay, so they're pretty much on pace, right? They're they're a couple seconds behind, and that's kind of what we expect. That donuts is the, the second highest ranked team coming into this weekend for this bracket, and you know they're a great team. We know them from last year. You know, slight changes to the team comp from last year. They don't have Dorky anymore, they don't have Anarchy anymore, but it's still the same base of yeah. players, and they're still insanely good together as a team. And, I mean, they're going for the big pulls here. Check it out. Double Destroyer pull coming up for the team here. We're going to see that Nature's Visual pop from Smacked here in a second, in the massive AoE coming out for Donuts. Slight difference for them. They don't have the Army of the Dead for Cryptics. I believe Perplex had that available when they went for this pull last time around on the other side, but still looks like it's going pretty well for them. I think that like overall, you're you're very worried about these destroyers. The Inferno cast is is probably the most uh, lethal part of this. In addition to that, you you do have uh, you're playing that preservation evoker, and you see right on your screen there that he cast um, that AOE soothe on all these mobs once they start to get low. That was actually a great play, and that's one of the big advantages of the preservation evoker, especially in like raging situations. Um, is like whenever you're gonna get the raging inferno casts that can cause people to go down especially if they also have bomb or uh, potentially even your tank is taking some of the damage from the flame dance that coupled with raging assuming that you don't have that like oppressive roar overall talent into um can be problematic but you did see timber he perfectly soothed the whole entire pack as they started to enrage and it just makes that pack a lot less lethal on it on this 20 level problems for cement gaming coming through on their side here Two deaths on the first double Blazebound Destroyer pull here. They did commit their battle res to res up Ponky, and Ara did use that uh, that onk to get themselves back up. So, major cooldowns expended just to live through that pack, but they're already a pretty significant amount behind already so far in this dungeon, right? You'd have to say in the realm of like 30 to 40 seconds, so... I mean, eyes on donuts here. Let's see if they can compete with Perplex time. I think that's the main thing that we're looking forward to here. How, how are you feeling about them going um, towards that Thunderhead side as opposed to Flame Gullet side? It seems like teams are kind of still 50-50 on which side they want to. We know last week Sloth was going towards that Flame Gullet side first. We know that we saw Perplex go towards that Flame Gullet side first. And then we see, we've seen Donuts um, start towards that Thunderhead area. And now they're looking to pull this last Blazebound Destroyer, which will activate the second boss here. And they're also grabbing this patrol oh, back into it. They got Flame Gullet. They got Flame Gullet. We have body pulled the He's dragon. In. All right. So Flame Galay is that's, here. That's bad. That's just that's, extra count. That's that's pretty bad actually. Look at Cement Gaming. So if Cement Gaming can effectively not body pull this, I think they win the dungeon. I'm not po I'm not positive on that. You are gonna get a, well, a lot of bonus count, but the issue with Flame Gullet is that he's so inefficient time wise. So here's something actually they can do now. Uh, th th there is something that they can do here. I'm pretty sure you can skip the patrol of warriors now yes. at the end of the dungeon that they uh, okay. that they would shroud through and pull like at the end of the shroud. So that's two less mobs that they have in the in the mass pull at the end. It's not it's not great, but I mean it's something, right? But yeah, I mean look at the difference here now. Cement Gaming has finished off the destroyer. They can just pull these two Cinder Weavers plus the Flame Dancer into the second boss if they want to. And they will actually be ahead of Donuts in this dungeon right now because of, because of the Flame Gully pull. I mean, that's that's really unfortunate for Donuts. But Cement is just not Cement gaming, that. you got to pick it up. We gotta pick, oh, pull the boss. you got to pick it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that... Okay. Donuts body pulling Flame Gullet, awful. Very, very bad. Cement Gaming, if they were able to chain the, that three pack into the boss, I think that they would be somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 seconds ahead. Right now... Um, 
both of these teams are pretty even. You do see there's a 7% count differential between the two teams. But in reality, that's... N I don't think that's going to be like a that big of a deal because more often than not, teams are only pulling very specific mobs. Like Zyronic was saying, they're only pulling, you know, uh, the flame channelers. They're pulling that thunder collar that are at the very end, and they're doing it in one singular pull. Uh, if for some reason Cement Gaming has to two pull the end area, that would already be a, a pretty large mistake in regards to their routing, especially compared to some of the other teams. But I think that as it currently stands, that chain pull it it may end up costing them um, this run a little bit. But Do Donuts certainly made the first error by having to kill Flame Gullet. You know, honestly, I don't... Obviously, I would rather pull the two Warriors than, than Flame you know, Flame Gullet, right? But e those Warriors are yeah. actually really annoying for that mass pull, right? Two extra things putting out those Thunderclap UFs on the group. Those are often a very large contributor to wipes on that pull, right? Too many players getting that debuff reduces their haste by a ton, means that they don't have... You know, enough resources, just enough globals to, to live okay. or kill the mobs quickly. I mean, it, it, it makes that pull safer. Look at the boss position from Cement Gaming. Cement Gaming, I think, is going to lose oh, no. 10 or 15 seconds off of this boss positioning as well. A lot of teams have been playing this strategy that's very dangerous where they are um, tanking the boss up against this back wall that you see on like the left side of your screen from Donuts. Um, and so it's more dangerous. But at the same point, it, it allows you to just completely like be standing next to the exit once the boss dies. So now Cement Gaming, if you look at that, they have downed uh, the second boss in Ruby Life Bulls, and now they have to run to this area, whereas Donuts is down the second boss, and they're just standing here, and they're ready to shroud into it. Yeah, look at that. I mean, the, the 12 seconds or so that they killed the boss ahead of Donuts just got completely eaten up by the travel time they had. Any advantage they had was now lost. Let's see if Donuts is going to skip anything here. Ooh, yeah, look, they, they skipped the patrol. This Oh, I was worried about this. Cement's two pulling this area. Uh, so I was looking at their count. I think they need to be at like around the seventy-four percent mark to not have to two pull this area. Um, it's safer, is what I will say about it. But it is certainly less time efficient. Oh, of course. Oh, do they have? Okay, they have that channeler in the back. Maybe that was. I, I didn't quite see. Maybe they CC'd that ahead of time just for safety. Got the mm -hmm. Zephyr up for uh, for this lightning storm. Lots of cooldowns Another being submitted. Already used the rewind and stasis. They have only the Emerald Communion left in terms of like actual group CDs. They did just use a belt oh, there, so uh, to make sure that the high channeler didn't get the shield on him. We we burn a B res there for, on the side of donuts. I think I think that overall it's okay. We do still have one um, battle res left going into the final boss. Uh, donuts should have their lust up. So we did get confirmation a little bit ago from uh, admins that. Donuts did lust the first pull, and like we were talking about, it was just like a little bit of a, a graphical error. Uh, but their lust should be back up at this point. They're going to be able to uh, put it on the boss and make sure that they are able to skip as many flame spits as reasonably possible. And Donuts is able to down this pack. Uh, they're a little bit off on track. <laughs> we, are, we are improvising our route heavily here. And now we are well, deci we've decided that it's warriors into the boss. You know what? Warriors into the boss. Don't get thunderclapped. Okay, Smacked already got thunderclapped right at the start there. Cryptic's got thunderclapped. We love this. Minus 50% haste. The Lust will be back up for them at this point, so they're probably just saving it for when one of the bosses hits 50% and they go into that second uh, phase of the boss encounter where flame spits go on multiple players in the group. They haven't it yet, though. Cement Gaming doesn't have Lust available for them right now. I was about to say, I, I, I oh, think there might be a chance that Cement Gaming with their comp... Um, has the opportunity to be able to catch up because I do think that they have a little bit more single target damage. So I mean, one of the one of the downsides of Feral uh, is that they do a little bit less single target. Donuts just now popped the lust. You can see the uh, very glowy animation coming out from the Evoker's hands. Okay, they do have that. Oh, what what is the, what is the Evoker lust called? It's something of the Ancients, right? <laughs> I'm not an. I'm not. An I actually, I don't know. know. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. You've just asked a bad question. I'm not sure what <laughs> what their lust is called. I'm sorry. All right, Donuts is going to be able to down the final boss. You know, it's not without mistakes. There were... I would have liked to have seen a clean run from them, especially since we would have been yeah. able to compare uh, their run versus Perplexed. 1206, they're able to get out uh, of the first map unscathed, though. There you Fury go. of the Aspects, Donuts. by the way, Tuttles. 
Oh, yeah, no. I, was, I was just about to say it's Fury of the Aspects, but uh, either way, it worked out for them uh, <laughs> using Blood. their Evoker Bloodlust, which is well known as a Fury of the Aspects. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, to uh, take down that dungeon a little bit quicker. But Cement was right there, uh, certainly not moving at the speed of Horrid Cement. Much faster, in fact. They gave Donuts a run for their money, but uh, Donuts. The NA hope, as uh, as they're known, were able to uh, take victory. But this could be a close series as well, couldn't it? Yes, yeah, Cement Gaming were looking quite good, quite clean throughout their run as well. First pull of the dungeon was also uh, one that we saw both teams going all the way on, but their comps were a little bit different uh, as well with how they set up uh, their entire dungeon game plan. Damage on the side of, uh, of Donuts was, of course, fantastic. Although I was actually really impressed by how much damage Cement were doing on a lot of these pulls as well. Uh, with the, there's a slightly different comp, the Rester Druid as well, coming out. Something that we hadn't seen yet, this MDI. And I was definitely looking forward to seeing out of them. Although you'd be forgiven for thinking they had a Moonkin there, given that the Rester Druid was just vibing out in Moonkin form. I think sending the Convoke uh, in that form as well. Landing, you know, if you land one Starfall in your Convoke, that's, uh, that's going to be better than doing it in any of the other forms. And yeah, look at the damage they were putting out on this pull. Yeah. Damage that their Demon Hunter, their Havoc Demon Hunter there, actually playing Elysian Decree instead of uh, the... Fodder to the Flame as well, which is a little bit more consistent, right? You get to use it whenever you want instead of whenever the demon decides it's time to show up. You get to make sure you're using it in AoE instead of procking and having to kill the demon wherever it is. Uh, and then, of course, we have this uh, this big old double pull, double destroyer, started by a couple of teams last week and uh, a little bit more realistic this week on the lower key level too, uh, but did die a little bit slow. Uh, on the side of donuts, a little bit, a little bit of those two destroyers being alive at the end, uh, especially with the rogue in your group and the, I guess the maybe, maybe that's just unavoidable, but uh, it did seem like. And then you also have these two scorchlings here that usually get pulled into that pull, uh, but it went much better than it did, of course, for Cement Gaming. This was honestly, if this hadn't happened for Cement Gaming, I think they potentially are in the same time frame as this run for Donut, which has got to be really scary for Donut because uh, this pull. You know, ends up costing deaths and reses for, um, and, and a lot of time there for some <laughs> gaming. But Donut here have uh, what Cryptix has has coined a for fun dragon <laughs> being uh, brought into this pull. <laughs> Defeated a, a few short minutes ago, Flame Goulet, uh, and making an the appearance. Bonus gullet. <laughs> yeah, the little the little bonus dragon. Now, to their credit. They were able to recover this pretty well. They were able to set up their count pretty nicely, uh, and they were able to sort of capitalize and and not actually be too inefficient in terms of how much time it costs them in this dungeon. But you know, if this had been a twenty-four fortified instead of a twenty fortified, that dragon would have just been the the end of their their dungeon right there. So uh, worked out pretty well for them, I guess. And they ended up being fairly cornered by the end of that boss, but were able to get it done. But actually, again, if you look at the damage done here for both teams, Cement Gaming were just melting Kokia, and they were. They were really accelerating on this boss. Unfortunately, the way that they were pulling this boss, they were pulling away from the end of that of the boss room, right? Rather than uh, what Donut were doing, which was fighting the boss such that it would end right at that wall where you want to be at the end of it. So uh, that was one of the big kind of differences between the two teams. Uh, and that saved Donuts a little bit more time. And then because they had a little bit of extra count and maybe uh, reacted to it well, they got to Shroud at the end of the dungeon and uh, skip the Warriors and the Channeler, do one pull where Cement Gaming did too. So... You know, maybe two or three kind of pulls worth of advantage for donuts throughout that dungeon. Minus one for that dragon coming in made it a very close game. How, how are you feeling about the uh, yeah, DPS mean, if... difference between the healer specs? Go ahead. Yeah, so Timber, you know, obviously on the Evoker is just it's always going to do a lot of, of damage. A lot more than the Rester Druid, although the Rester Druid does have some similar benefits of like it's pretty pretty global not intensive to do good damage right like you press sunfire you press nature's vigil and you're doing mm -hmm. most of that damage right in the same sort of way that the evoker is pressing fire breath right and they're doing almost all their damage uh, out of that global as well so yeah i mean it's tough to say right you're also getting the benefit of that mark of the wild out of having the rest of druid there and you don't have to play the dps druid right so you get to play that havoc demon hunter and all that extra havoc damage and the chaos brand and I don't know. I, I could be convinced by the argument, but I do. Th I think that yeah. The obviously the donuts comp is what we've seen a lot of other teams running. Uh, although with the rogue instead of that shadow priest, which uh, is something that I'm I'm curious about. We've seen that from a couple of other teams so far this weekend. Well, it looks like this. I wonder how much of that is like just we happen to have teams that like rogue 
in this weekend versus teams have tried the Shadow Priest and tried the Rogue and like the Rogue more. I'm not sure which of the two explains that more. I do think it's very good that teams are still willing to uh, try to adapt the meta because the meta on live right now is not very... Um, it's not very stale. Like a lot of different stuff on live, especially at the highest level, is being is seeing pretty good play. And and so the fact that MDI teams still don't know what the exact meta is, or the fact that they're not necessarily copying just what we saw last weekend, I, th I think is very good because we saw Perplex. They ran the Rogue in their first dungeon. They ran the Warlock in their second dungeon. Now that in Holy DK and that Feral Druid are both pretty good, <laughs> so uh, th they can stay. But but at the same point, just not being fully locked into that Shadow Priest Rogue Unholy DK comp or really thinking about. Um, where can we utilize other spec strengths? I think that that's actually very good for just this cup in general and kind of uh, adapting, like, what, what are we going to see towards globals and, and trying to get to that point where the meta is a lot more uh, refined and, like, determined. Yeah, I, we're even seeing uh, different enhancement shaman builds, which is which is kind of neat. Uh, Winfrey Totem on, on live... A lot of times you don't run it because you don't know if the group you're going to end up in is going to benefit from it all that much. And we did see the Enhancement Shaman in our very last map not run it. They didn't run Win Free Weapon. They didn't run Win Free Totem. They went down to uh, Elemental Blast. And uh, that is going to help uh, pump out a little bit more single target damage, which on a Tyrannical Dungeon, you know, maybe you go for that. But uh, it's just kind of a different take on it. So it's interesting even within the specs to see little variations here and there. We even saw uh, an Unholy DK change in talents, right? We saw Bursting Swords on Cryptics versus not Bursting Swords on the other DK for a little yeah. bit more AoE damage. But here we are, already oh, on the yeah, Temple of the Jade Serpent. Both teams going right into this very first pull. Same as what we saw in the first series of the day. Everything being pulled for both teams into the end of this first hallway. Actually, I think Simon Kimmy didn't get those last three mobs, but here we go. Double Living Water pulled for both teams. It's going to be crazy if they can live through it. You can see everything is popped for both players. Ascendance even being committed, I believe, for Timbermaw here. It's huge. Dude, look, look at the healing. Uh, we, we saw a Stove on the side of Donuts as well uh, be able to hit that, that 50k HPS threshold, um, where it's now smacked is at that 50k HPS threshold. On the right side, we see Cement Gaming. Look at their Prop Paladin healing, man. Prop Paladin Alive is something that we, we actually oh, see man. fairly often. It's it's a little bit slower than Prop Warrior is what I would say, was what I would say about it, especially in like an MDI situation. But... It is so safe in a lot of spots that uh, you're going to be running into a lot of issues. You, it, you have options of utility to be able to get the group out of um, precarious positions. You have additional interrupts with that Avenger shield. In addition to that, you have insane amounts of off healing. You have the ability to be able to sack people. Um, you either have bop or spell warding. I think it's so cool that we're seeing a prop paladin uh, in MDI, especially after all the success that they've been having on live. All right. Teams on to the hardest boss in the video game. Why is Mari? Players will just go one shot left and right on this boss, even though it's not a 23. You know, it's 22 tyrannical, so these debuffs, when they go out, are going to do a ton of damage. Going to have to commit personals or externals to make sure they live. And then, of course, just the affixes, I think, are pretty mean for a high level B quaking on this boss, when everyone is so stacked running together for the wash away. It's, uh, it's pretty annoying, because he, you know, he spread a little bit too much, you accidentally dip in the water. That's a one shot. You gotta play this perfectly. Here Dude. we go, quaking at the start of Wash Away. Three players stacked, everyone drops to 20, they cannot step in the water. Whew, scary moment. Do you know that uh, Eltharian's running Storm Eater's Boon as well? <laughs> On that prop oh, paladin? man. <laughs> My tank's an elemental. Some damage. <laughs> uh, I, prop paladin damage is very, very good. Um, it's Yeah, I know, I know. On, on live key sized pulls, it's one of the it's probably the top damage tank in the game. Now in MDI sized pulls, the pro warrior, <laughs> the pro warrior is definitely going to be uh, doing a little bit more. Uh, but but I do think that this is like a really solid option. Hey, so let's see. I mean, let's look at overall like the, the difference between the teams, right? I think the Shadow okay. Priest is definitely like a slightly stronger pick than either the Enhance or the the Havoc. You know, Havoc in these settings is something that I feel like it doesn't really excel at anything, right? It's not like the best at anything. It's just overall quite good. And, you know, it, you know, bringing that magic damage taken debuff for the group is pretty solid too, right? Is the, uh... You're never, you're never gonna die on it as yeah, well. You're never mad. Also, yeah, they, they live through everything. I, I'd say it's probably most similar to, like, Rogue in that aspect, right? Except it doesn't really good AoE damage. Really good AoE damage. Good they AOE. don't lose a lot of single target to be able to do, uh... Pretty, pretty good AoE. Uh, Donut's able to down the first boss in 3 minutes and 8 seconds. Cement Gaming, 
a little bit behind. Uh, they they did they did a slightly slower variation of the first pull of the dungeon. I I think that that's where a decent amount of the time loss is going to be um, for cement gaming on this first boss split is just coming out coming out of this with that like second pull or like the slow chain that they did. All right, if we go into another massive pull coming out from Donuts here. If they do anything similar to what we saw from the other teams, it's going to be the first three packs here. Yeah, they've got the fish, yeah. they've got the songbird queen. And they have the two monks from the start as well coming in too. So gotta keep an eye on those burning flame debuffs that the monks toss out. Those can do a ton of damage to players, even though it's not fortified. You have to keep an eye out on that. They have a few dwarf racials. Priest still already used his on the priest there. Looks like they just used one on Timbermaw. Cryptic's got his dispelled or I messed it. Didn't quite see. So far so good with those debuffs, and this is going down nice and clean for them. Unholy DK is just doing work to this pack. Oh yeah, no. Un Unholy is is very, very strong. Um have some boss splits for us. The first boss for Perplex um, was done at three minutes and four seconds, whereas for Donuts it's done in three minutes and eight seconds. Did you see that right there, by the way? So for uh, for the keen-eyed viewer, Timbermaw was so, he jumped up on the ledge and soloed that book for his team to be able to get the boss activated. What we saw earlier from Perplex is they gated across and then uh, grouped up the pack on top of the book to be able to get, get the bosses activated. And so it took them a little bit longer. I think that the way that Timber just did that for Donuts is is faster. I, I, I really like the way that that is uh, done. And now look at this. Donuts have engaged the boss. So for those who don't know, the boss, once it becomes active, like once the book is dead and then the RP finishes, the boss just becomes active. And now Donuts has pulled all of this trash into the boss. I think that that is so, so sick how they just pulled that off. That is pretty wild. And I'm wondering how Timber Mod did enough damage to do that. Because that book is going to have something like 400k HP-ish, right? On this on this key level. And I'm, I went and looked at his talent build. Did you see his trinkets he's running for this dungeon? He's running uh, Desperate Invoker's Codex. For maximum okay. target damage output. So, do you think he codexed the, the book, then? Yeah, he's Stormkeeper to so, codex it, I think. So how the codex works is it stacks up over time. Um, and then once it's at max stacks, you're able to use it, and it does a little bit of damage to you. Actually, it does a lot of bit of damage to you, but it does some damage to you, damage. and it does, you know, a, a 300k hit to a mob. And it, as a healer, it's like flat damage trinkets for healing uh, are normally pretty solid. That trinket is typically seen as fairly grief because you can die with it. But in an MDI situation, everything is so scripted, everything is so planned that he knows that he's going to be used in these specific situations. He's not going to be lobbing it out right before Shaw's die or something like that. And he's going to take like 150, <laughs> 150k hit. <laughs> he's, I, I think that, that that has to be the way that he killed the book, right? That's, that's so yeah, cool. Yeah. I mean, he killed it in like three or four globals. And, and, unless his Shadow Priest gave him a few extra dots too to help. And yeah, he definitely popped that trinket just to help out a little bit. Now, the interesting thing about that trinket is, right, with the stacks that stack up over time when you're in combat, in Mythic Plus, like, that trinket doesn't see a lot of use because, you know, every time you reset combat in between in between pulls, yes. you lose your stacks, which is not fun. But the way teams yeah. pull MDI-style pulls is you are almost constantly in combat. This is, like, almost the first... This is the second time they've dropped combat this dungeon, right? They dropped once after the first boss, now they've dropped twice. They'll probably drop one more time after third boss, but they won't drop combat again after that. So, you know, from starting to pull trash in the fourth boss room area until the end of the fourth boss, he'll keep those stacks alive. Like, he's going to start rolling his stacks right now, too. So he'll be able to pop that pretty, oh. pretty often. Dude, did you see? Okay, so Timber is actually running Hex in this dungeon. More often than not, I haven't seen Shamans Ooh. run Hex in, a very, in like, basically don't. this whole entire expansion. I thought that they, they weren't really able to talent it, but Timber is running Hex in this dungeon, and he Hexed that Mistweaver. And so that's going to force the Mistweaver to probably come into the boss... Uh, or come in later whenever they have the boss engaged. Donuts is actually going a little bit smaller um, than what we saw from Perplex earlier. Perplex was able to get this whole entire room dealt with in one singular pull. Donuts um, going a little bit smaller here, playing a bit more conservative. They do have uh, dispels covered from those Mistweavers. It is very dangerous, but they have the ability to be able to get those uh, dispelled off. Um, just assuming that Cryptics is also running Room of Corruption after checking he is. I would have liked to have seen them do the full room in one singular pull, but it really kind of depends on how much time or practice they put into this dungeon. It, like, these were two of the time trial dungeons, and I know that s sometimes teams will be like, oh, okay, we're only playing this dungeon once this weekend. Okay, we only have to update our route just a little bit to be able to uh, see how this is going to perform. And that may have been something that, like, okay, yeah, Donuts could have done better. But at the same point, it may have been a dungeon that Donuts didn't necessarily have to do uh, 
as as well as they did in time trials. Now look at that Mistweaver, it's coming in. Temper does a great job of shearing it from afar, and that's going to be dragged into the start of the Flameheart. I like this. This is good. Now, do they do they need the two mobs off to the side for trash count? I'm pretty sure they still do, right? Well, they skip. Or do they, they play pandas? They, these two? they skip the. Sh they play pandas. They skip the shambler. Um. Let me think. I think I think that they do because they skipped that shambler, yeah. right? Yeah. Now look, I, th I, th I think what they might be doing is waiting for the patrol to come back on the left side. You can see Stove is standing way off on the left, so maybe once the patrol you know walks up behind him, he can tag them in, and that's that's how they'll kill them. Okay. Off. That would be my guess. I could, I could see that being reasonable. It's it's really dangerous for anybody that's not the tank to be able to tag because uh, those yeah. mobs, all of these walls in here are fake. Meaning that the mobs will cast right through them. <laughs> and I've been uh, murdered right. sometimes by those patrols. So you have to be cautious if you are not the tank pulling those packs. Right. Zyro. This is a yeah. bit corny. But do you mm. think that donuts are backing up the cement truck over cement gaming? <sighs> they wiped as I said that. That was actually kind of messed up. <laughs> I feel bad yeah, now. That was really messed up titles you did that to them that was you what do you have to say for well, yourself i thought that they were doing a great job and that pull i think that that's just to prove how <laughs> difficult that pull in the courtyard is I, I think we use that as a great point of reference cement gaming are an incredibly uh proficient team we saw how well they were doing in the ruby life pulls i think it's just it just goes to show how hard that pack is if you've been playing live more often than not you play that area one pull at a time maybe we do the patrol into a second pack if, if we're feeling a bit uh if, if we're feeling a bit a bit okay about our position now submit gaming is trying to do all five of those packs in one singular pull which is very dangerous well, and i in like the corner and plus they're doing the pack plus they're doing the patrol yeah, exactly. And the corner they've backed themselves into now is if they want to have any chance of coming back in this dungeon, number one, they need donuts to wipe, and number two, they have to go for that pull again and have it work this time. I mean, mm, okay, it's it's a rough we'll spot for them to the be way. in. They have lust, though. They have lust. Hmm. Yeah, if you look on the left side of your screen, too, um, like this is yeah, what we were talking about earlier. They they grabbed the, the pat at some point, and now they pulled it into Yulon. Yeah, th this part of the fight is, you know, pretty safe, right? There's not a whole lot that goes on. You just dodge the breath, and you dodge the void zones on the ground. So, perfect time to pull those two mobs and cleave them down for that extra trash count you need. Yeah, great execution. I think we, we saw Perplexed pull this in, like, near the end of the pack, and just pulled it at the start of the boss. I think the only thing you really have to avoid doing is just pulling it in whenever you're in the Jade phase, right? That's the actual dangerous part of this fight. But, you know, uh, the team went for their yeah. own different strategies. Look at this. Every cooldown in the book available. The only thing they're missing is Army of the Dead, but they have the Bloodlust, they have the Power Infusion, they have everything across the board except for the army, and here we go. Everything being pulled. They haven't... Okay, there's the Bloodlust. Just came out a little late there, and here we go. Massive AoE pull coming out for Donuts here. The, sc the scary part is actually getting this pack grouped up. Um, something hmm. that you saw there is Stove. He silenced the mob. To, uh, he silenced that Mistweaver to make sure that that Mistweaver is going to be, get in, be gotten in. I think that this pull is very, very dangerous and the, their ability to be able to set up the pack getting grouped immediately to the point where then the DK is able to pop off. Uh, Stove does go down, you know, it, it's kind of to be expected, especially with all of the lesser shaws and whatnot. The Shambling and Fester is already dead. That setup is the hardest part. And so they made it look super clean because they spent probably multiple hours being able to perfect that pull and just getting that right. That was so, so sick by Donuts. By the way, I want to point something out. We were talking about how they might drop combat after the third boss going into the fourth boss. They haven't yet. Timbermoth's sacks are still wherever they were <laughs> at the end of the third boss because of the spiteful shades, right? They, they kept those alive, pulled them in, so his desperate invoker's codex is still stacked up to whatever it is, which means every time he pops it here, uh, I'm not sure how many stacks he had, but it could do a lot of damage to him. Let's just keep an eye on oh. Timbermoth's HP. If it, when it, if, if it ever just dips to like 10%, you, you know what happened. Zyra, you hear that? <laughs> so, what? I think the cement truck is backing up over them. Zyra, oh, man. Man. so messed up. Dude. The, the chatters, they've been spamming too much. They've been spamming cement the gaming. cement truck for cement gaming, but what they haven't been doing is spamming the rat gem for, for Timbermaw. Oh, Come on, guys. Wait, that's Where's the up. support at? <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, donuts. I they 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 don't have lust for this boss. So something that perplexed it earlier today is they were they saved lust for this boss, and I think that they were able to um, save one phase because of that lust. I, I'm interested in seeing how many phases donuts gets in the Shaw of Doubt, and like what their timer is going to be looking like because. Whenever we saw Perplex run this Jade Temple earlier, they were around that 1434 mark. And we know that those are the two top seeded teams that are coming in this weekend. Um, expectations are that those are the two teams that are going to be making out, uh, barring an upset. I think that this is actually the most competitive group, but we can talk about that later. I think that Donuts needs to have a really, really competitive time with, uh, with where Perplexed were. And it looks like they're going to be somewhere in the order of like 45 seconds off. Yeah, something like that. I mean, this definitely wasn't like the, the cleanest run. There were some things that they could have done faster, but they had their own spin on things too, right? Pulling the mobs at different times onto the third boss, different pull strategies, right? In, in the second boss room, you know, opting to have them just kill it over the ledge rather than gatewaying across. There are some pretty solid mm -hmm. ideas here from Donuts, and I mean, those are the kind of things that set apart the best teams from, you know, the rest of the teams in the competition. So how the tournament is set up generally is like, some dungeons are uh, more seen on like day one and two, and less seen on like day three. It may be a, it may be a situation where like donuts doesn't have a lot a lot of jade temple or a lot of ruby life pools um, in their day two and three, assuming that they're like playing through the bracket that they kind of predicted for themselves. And it may be a situation where they they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. we can we can get away with like a fourteen fifty as well, or uh, like a fifteen ten, and we don't need to completely reroute this dungeon to make sure that we have like a perfect dungeon because donuts. They had this. They have the Shaw of Doubt at twelve percent. Again, it's important to note, Perplex killed the Shaw of Doubt on that phase that Donuts just got there. Like, that is how much damage Perplex had to be able to kill that boss. Now they did have Lust, but it, I think it's just to prove how impressive it is. As Donuts do down the Shaw of Doubt, and they're able to take take this series two to zero. That's right, a victory for Donuts 2-0. They will go on in the upper bracket to uh, face the winner of our next series. Meanwhile, uh, Cement, again, you know, having a couple of uh, tricky situations here and there with some pulls, a couple deaths and stuff, but overall, fairly close, uh, but not close enough as Donuts do move on. Uh, Dratnos, what stood out to you in that last map? Yeah, so first of all, we got to see this this big first pull working out a little bit faster for Donuts because they just pulled a lot more aggressively in this area, right? They got all these enemies all at once rather than leaving those bottom four mob or bottom three mobs all by themselves. This pull, though, was looking pretty good for the uh, the old Cement Gang. You can see this is where they actually ended up using that bubble taunt uh, out of their prop paladin to just survive what would otherwise be a really nasty pull uh, for the tank towards the end there. And a uh, really good job of, of just melting down a huge amount of trash all at once, Donut's idea in this area instead, though, was, and I'm sure it was, uh, was covered by the casters with the, the Desperate Invokers Codex on that scroll from, uh, from Dude, downtown. Dude, that's so sick. Yeah. Yeah. That thing is so cool. Uh, the the Razageth Caster Trinket. This pull out of Donut, so I, 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 uh, it always feels bad to leave behind, like, one pack, right? Like, that Minion of Doubt pack with the Shaw. But the problem is, if you pull all the Shaw, all the little Shaw at once, you can see what happens here for Cement Gaming, right? You've got, like, ten of them all dying at once here, and, you know, you have some cooldowns rolling, right? You have AG, you have Nature's Vigil, you have Blur, you have Defensives, but bang! They all die at once, and it's just, it's still just too much, right? Yeah. Like, oh, man, you, that's wild. I, I feel like you can maybe do it if you chain in late, so that you actually have, like, a couple of globals between the little ones dying in each pull, but... The problem with the way these classes work is that you kind of need all of that setup to be good. Uh, and then here's that timber running and grabbing the little bit of extra count that they needed here uh, before getting gripped on back over. So uh, if you're ever skipping anything in this dungeon, you do base Generally, you skip and then grab those mobs, right? And you uh, th that's those are some mm -hmm. nice, easy mobs that can come into this boss uh, if you want to skip something earlier in the dungeon. And there are some nasty candidates early in the dungeon uh, to be skipped. There was our first... Uh, First death and battle res for Donuts as well, landing on the Shadow Priest. Uh, but it was towards the end of this pull. Not a big deal whatsoever. Into boss. And Tethel's, like you said, the damage was looking maybe a little bit a little bit worse than Perplexed were able to yeah. deploy in their run of this dungeon. A little bit... I guess that's, that's got to be a little bit worrying if you're a Donuts fan. If you're hoping that Donuts can win that 1v1 that is potentially sitting later in this upper bracket. But uh, at least, I guess, for them, they it, it's enough against a lot of these other teams, perhaps, to... You know, especially if, if something like a wipe happens like it did for Cement Gaming, of course. 
there is a lot of questions of like how much practice have they put into Temple of the Jade Serpent to revisit their route since uh, like they, they previously had played it. Like they they had a time trial route that was assumedly pretty good, uh, all things considered, since they are the fifth seed coming into this weekend, I believe. Um, so like their their time trial times should be pretty solid for both Temple of the Jade Serpent and Ruby Life Bulls. And then it's a question of like, oh, how much of a refresher do they need to realistically do to this dungeon versus completely learning the other dungeons. There so it here's is. the <laughs> item we've all been talking about. Who who wants to explain this? <laughs> so I think a lot of it has to just be like one globaling that scroll, right? Like that's yeah. uh, that's got to be the big point of value about this thing because most of the other text on this, I mean, it's just like a single target damage trinket that uh, if you can hold combat for a long time can get a pretty low cooldown, but it actually does quite a bit of damage to yourself if that if it gets a lot of those stacks too. So you need to be careful about using it when there's no other damage coming out. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's mostly about just breaking that scroll early uh, with an easy ranged global that does a zillion damage. I know we talked about the shaman pick a little bit last weekend. I I, I want to reiterate, I really like the shaman pick in this dungeon. I think that the lesser shaw pulls that you identified as like a, a point of danger. So typically shamans this season, they run into issues where uh, their healing throughput is generally going to be holding you back, especially at like a higher key level. But in a 22... Like, uh, their, their healing throughput's definitely not going to be holding players back. On top of that, they bring the D-curse for the Mistweaver pulls. But I think the biggest thing is, like, Spirit Link for Lesser Shaws at some points. Uh, we, we saw um, Cement Gaming, they, they lost people to, the, like, the, all of the Lesser Shaws. Whereas for Donuts, whenever their Lesser Shaws start to explode, Timber just drops the Link, we all stack up in the Link, uh, pops wall, and then, we, <laughs> then we're all going to be fine. Like, yeah, we're, we're not going to be dying uh, to the Lesser Shaws exploding, whereas, like, all right, they, they, they have like anti-magic zone. They have more throughput healing with like the Resto Druid ramps and stuff like that. They also have the Prop Paladin uh, to be able to supplement that just a little bit in regards to healer, healing for the group. Yeah. But it's not really enough to like not have all of the lesser shawls blow up at once on us. That Prop Paladin was running in a very utility intensive build as well with Blessing of Protection, Improved Blessing of Protection, and Blessing of Spell Warding uh, all available as well. So a lot of... Uh, utility effects for the rest of the group or for himself on some of those uh, bosses and nasty trash pulls too. So it uh, was a cool spec. I hope we get to see more of it out of Cement Gaming later. Uh, I believe it is the main spec of the of the tank player there. So, uh, but also just a, I, you know it's one of the the top performing specs in live keys too. So particularly in the higher key levels, which tend to be a little bit more on our Saturdays and Sundays than our Fridays, uh, might be something that really gets a chance to shine. We'll have to wait and see if we uh, can check it out tomorrow. Uh, for now, though, we look ahead to the next series. Uh, who will play against Donuts in the upper bracket? It's going to be either Empyrean or who let them cook? And uh, we'll find <laughs> out. You know, We're not going to find out who let them cook. That's, that's going to be a mystery, I think, for, for the ages. But uh, we'll find out if they can beat Empyrean soon as we come back. Somebody cooked break. here. Any, anyone anyone want to make who any predictions? Cook? Hmm. Hmm. It is one of the tougher ones to call. That I think. We, we know the least probably about these two teams in the bracket. Empyrean obviously is going to be a favorite based off of their seeding, but like, right? In terms of like how much we so, know about the individual players, I I did some research into this. They competed in last. Uh, they they were they were one of the regional teams in the last TGP. So they've they've played together before. They have some experience. I think that they're kind of like levels esque in that sense of like uh, quality players. You know, individually very strong. They they raid in like a high level guild. Overall, though, not a ton of MDI experience. So that may come back to bite them. But I think that just like on an individual level, um, th these sh should be very solid players who have played together in the past, albeit in a high key situation. But um, they have some experience with one another. They they said that they played together for I think a year in the in the survey that we sent out. And so we have that as well. Something something I do know about who let them cook is they do have a warrior fanatic on their team, and we might be seeing some arms warrior gameplay. So got oh. that to look forward. To. Mm -hmm. Arms right. is arms is actually surprisingly stuff. pretty good on uh, like high target count packs. It's it's strong, but it's so unforgiving too. You really have to like be one of the best rage managers out there to uh, to make arms effective in a consistent way. So we'll see if they can do that. Either way, a lot to look forward to in our final match of the day coming up on MDI right after this.
We have returned one more time today for the Mythic Dungeon International. Your host, Dewey, here with Mr. X, Tettles, and Dratnos. Getting ready for our final match of the day. It's going to be Empyrean taking on Who Let Them Cook. Who? Anybody know? It's a fantastic name. Anyone? I have no idea. Who's it's an ethereal question, honestly. Who did let him cook? It's a, <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. Yeah. There you go. Well, well I don't know about rhetorical. Big They're going to be cooking up here, something. But... People ask, can you smell what the rocket's cooking sometimes? Well, they used to. I don't know if they do that anymore. He's more just kind of Dwayne Johnson, the movie guy now. He's yeah. full-time actor. I don't think he's yeah. doing any of the, the rocket's cooking anymore. I, I like this who let them cook team because they prepared for this event by vibing. Uh, I think that's an excellent way to prepare <laughs> for the event. <laughs> did they say that in their? Did they say that yes. in their thing? <laughs> the, yeah, <laughs> the, forgot about that. They did. Yep. Wait, well, really? there you go. Vibing. Yeah. You have? Are you new to the answers some of the teams give us in this? Uh, when we when we give no, them a questionnaire? No. Yeah. <laughs> their team name is Who Let Them Cook. Of course, it's just going to be full of memes all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I watched yeah, them. Uh, yeah. I watched them participate during time trials. I think they were streaming some of their time trial stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's no mean to get this far, we... right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of specs we haven't yet seen in our MDI that we have seen out of Who Let Them Cook in time trials. So we will see if they decide to to bring them into our best of three here. Empyrean also used a couple of specs that have yet to make it onto the big screen too. So uh, potentially, uh, of the teams, I expect Empyrean is more likely to have kind of moved over to. You know, they've tried to try out the Feral Druid Unholy, Shadow Priest even, potentially. Uh, and I, I suspect there's a good chance we'll, we will see that out of them in a lot of these dungeons. But I do also think Rogue might be pretty likely out of them. But Who Let Them Cook, hmm. I think, is maybe a little bit more likely to be just vibing and, uh, and doing some of their <laughs> their unique <laughs> takes on these uh, on these dungeons. Just vibing. Dude, this team should be good. Yeah. They, have, uh, they have three members of BDGG on their team as well. So, like, uh, again, Empyrean, we talked about that they... They rated at a decently high level. They competed in TGP. Um, for Who Let Them Cook, never competed in TGP, but they rated in one, like, world fourth BDGG. So, I mean, they, they should have, like, the the caliber of player that they have on their team should be relatively high. Now, I don't know if they can they can skate by with vibes alone, but we'll see. <laughs> you well, do a lot We will with not vibes. be vibing in Ruby Life Pools or Shadowmoon Burial Grounds this game, but uh, we will be in Halls of Valor, Temple of Jade Serpent, if we need it, Court of Stars. Yeah, now, who let them cook? Uh, they did mention that they they suck at ruby life pools and that they were terrified of the first boss on temple. So they got rid of one. Uh, they still have the other, though, uh, in effect. And uh, Empyrean, they they said that their hardest dungeon was like Azure Vaults, which isn't in this set. So uh, hmm. you, know, you already done the Temple of the Jade and the Time Trials. Like, I guess you just get rid of Shadow Moon at the end, the 23. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, makes that's sense. also Surprise the other fortified end. dungeon. So now we have three right. tyrannical dungeons in our mm. best of three here. So uh, if either team has like an edge in single target damage, has a, a better comp for that, maybe that will be uh, decisive in the series. I feel like we've seen teams try to do that. You know, we've seen variations in DPS that maybe were focused around trying to do more single target damage in some of the tyrannical dungeons earlier today. But it still feels to me that, like, nothing's going to top the big three, right? The Unholy DK, the Feral Druid, the Shadow Priest. It, it still seems well, like that's going to be doing the most damage overall, but I'm all for people trying different stuff, you know? I mean, how do you feel about Arms Warrior, Doa? I, I like Arms Warrior a lot. I think it's a, it's a very punishing class to play. It's very easy to, to mess up your rotation, but it's a, it's a class I love playing since, like, vanilla. So I'm excited to see Arms Warrior. I'm curious what you surround with it. Like, uh, what well, Halls of Valor earlier, we saw like a rogue uh, skip. We saw the priest like mind sue the skip. If you're going to skip anything here, like, what do you. I think it'll be like rogue arms... DK. Yeah. Okay. Rogue DK and the Arms Warrior? Yeah. Yeah. So then you're getting good go value out of Battle game. Shout, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just go yep. melee again. True, true. <laughs> Evoker. All the yeah, I mean, I guess. Easy healing. You already have a battle shot as well, probably from your tank, so 
not even necessarily uh <laughs> the double yeah, well, maybe you play something oh, other yeah. than a prop warrior although i doubt <laughs> i doubt we'll see that especially in halls of valor the prop warrior works so well in this dungeon there's a lot of stuff uh, that it's really good at picking up all these packs that are kind of all over the place uh like that wolf pull just a lot easier yeah. to do on that spec so i i think we'll probably see double warrior if who let them cook are busting out that arms warrior pick we'll see we'll find out yeah, oh. they are there it is oh, okay well let's get started yeah, so Tettles uh, was right, comboing the Arms Warrior with the Rogue in the uh, the DK. And the other side for Empyrean, uh, what? This is just kind of uh, what I think we've expected is uh, yeah. the DK, the Feral Druid, the Shadow Priest. Uh, they do have the Resto Shaman in play. Yeah, the Resto Shaman, we've seen some teams, some teams using the Evokers and some using the Shamans, depending on the dungeon. This dungeon has seen... Uh, a bit of a mix. Now it's important to note that bolstering is one of the affixes that we have going on right now. So this Storm Drake involved in this pull for both teams has a lot more health than the other mods and watch out for who let them cook. That thing is very large. Shaz has spell block rolling. Same same story over on the side of Empyrean, right? That is a very large Drake that is going to be doing a lot of damage to the tank, uh, especially once that spell block rolls out uh, and they, they have those frontals still coming out with bolstering stacks. That's going to be very, very lethal. Once that mob gets a little bit smaller, though, and the bolstering stacks are gone, they'll be in a little bit less danger. Yeah, who let them cook manage that well? You saw the tank jump out real quick as, uh, you know, the, the bolstering was wearing off. Now the Drake is a little bit more manageable uh, when you pull it into that first boss. But man, it's uh, such a great shot from the observers. It's so scary when that Drake is, like, just insanely bolstered and just like almost twice the size of the boss is uh looks like who let them cook they'll deal with the drake there uh, and same on the side of empyrean so both teams kind of uh executing that first pull quite well yeah the arms warrior atop the damage meters for who let them mm. cook as well so uh really well executed arms warrior the the build that Timmy is playing on that thing is uh, it's it's ramp focused, so makes sent us along some information about the uh, the build passed on from the player. In fact, uh, the idea is you use Blade Storm and you're using this talent called Hurricane uh, that gives you extra strength out of your Blade Storm and last after your Blade Storm. So you do a Blade Storm and then you have you press a big thunderous roar afterwards and it does a zillion damage. Is the idea, oh. uh, and you can see it's. It's working pretty well here for <laughs> who let them cook. Yeah, it, it's a, a spec that on live, like I think is uh, probably more recently people paying a little bit more attention to. Also running, uh, you know, the Algathar puzzle box trinket for the, I uh, know, just large chunk of mastery that you'd acquire from that. So uh, really interesting look here from who let them cook at the start, bringing the arms warrior into the mix. But uh, they're a little bit behind Empyrean. Uh, as Empyrean now, they've m moved up. They don't have a, a Shroud here, so just a Minesuit, and they're just going to run past and just grip some of these mobs in. Uh, saw this a little bit earlier in the day. This is a really nice pull. I made up some time. Yeah, this is uh, looks like a similar idea coming out for Who Let Them Cook as well. Who Let Them Cook did have Shroud of Concealment available as well and may have skipped one extra pack. We'll see what actually joins this pull for them. Oh, no, maybe they didn't. Maybe they're going... Equally as big here. <laughs> yeah, this is a big damage moment here. Now, one strength of Empyrean's comp is with the Feral Druid and the Shadow Priest here. They have a lot of off healing through Nature's Vigil and through Vampiric Embrace. Whereas Who Let Them Cook are just relying on their, their Evoker basically to heal the whole group. And other than that, it's going to revolve on everybody's individual defensives. Yeah, and I also feel like if you're Who Let Them Cook as uh, oh, the healer got really low there for a sec. If you're going to play, like, Unholy, Arms, and uh, Subrogue, like, you kind of have to pull quite large, I feel like, quite often. Like, those are three, you know, specs you really want as, like, many targets as possible. Like, the Unholy can, I know, funnel into one thing with the Subrogue, but Arms seems to just does a ton of AoEs. Uh, even with that the case, Empyrean looks like they're a little bit ahead here as uh, they're making their way up the air. Yeah, now Empyrean are starting off this pull, little line of sight coming out there to prevent the uh, Aspirant from actually leaping. You can do that down the stairs, line of sight, and then it won't actually do the cast, so it'll stay in the pack. Does still do its frontals, so you got to watch out for that. There's a lot of frontals involved in this pull. Uh, and with bolstering active as well, you got to be a little bit careful because sometimes you focus on the Aspirant and the caster, right? You actually kill those mobs first because they're the mobs that, you know, do stuff. And then you have four or five bolstered shield maidens that are just destroying your <laughs> tank. So uh, got to be careful here with that affix in particular. 
Yeah, they seem to be doing a nice job though, getting everything down at like the the same uh, pace here. Is I think they just have like three of the shield maidens left. Uh, and then I imagine that we'll see them try and pull both of these at the same time as we've been seeing a lot of groups uh, go towards that. Uh, I wonder on the boss, we haven't seen it. Um, I think we just saw it last week where you can kind of like cheese which side it's on. Uh, I think it's like so difficult to kind of get like almost like pixel perfect, right? The tank has to kind of go one way and then just jump back the other rather quickly. I wonder if we see them try and do anything like that. Yeah, Echo were the only team to attempt it or succeed on it. Last time as we have a death yeah. coming out, actually Arms Warrior down for who let them cook. That's gonna be their first battle res. No battle res now for the next five minutes. And yeah, like you were saying, that Herja strategy is one that I'm curious if any other teams have implemented. It is a nice, it's not even so much a time save if you're not pulling extra trash onto the boss, but it does make it a lot easier, right? Like it makes that fight do a third as much damage basically through uh, the boss will be casting Eye of the Storm over on the Holy side and then Sanctify over on the Lightning side. But it is, as you said, very precise timing uh, involved. You basically, you have to move the boss at this perfect time such that it makes it to the other side, breaks one of those beams and then immediately starts its cast. And if you mess that up, then the boss is in the middle gaining power from both of the mini bosses. And, yeah. Uh, it's very hard to survive then it's actually the initial burst then you, you get this eye of the storm with these uh, expel lights in the middle of it and it's it's just a nightmare it's like almost unrecoverable i think if you don't get it perfectly it's like really difficult to you know if you are able to execute it though like the, the role of the healer i mean it just becomes way easier to be able to heal through some of this big damage uh that comes out really on both sides but i'm um, period they're gonna you know, do it probably the way it was intended to and just go from side to side here uh no no shenanigans is uh you're gonna have a feast go down for who let them cook probably to try and get uh to me a food buff before kicking off this fight now we talked a little bit about the arms warrior as like a big aoe spec but it's also worth noting that arms warrior does have a solid two target niche you saw it really coming out there on that two pack the the two mini bosses before this uh, arms warrior is actually top damage on those two as well uh, because of the sweeping strikes ability so you know, Arms Warrior, you're not really uh, super jazzed about, like, you know, five targets, six targets. You're really excited about 15 targets, and you're also yeah. really excited about two targets. Those are those are the numbers where the Arms Warrior is really happy. Although, you look at those damage meters, kind of looks like the Arms Warrior is just happy all the time here. Yeah, the Arms is really just blasting throughout this uh, thus far. I do want to also highlight, like, it's going to be a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit harder here for Let Them Cook. There's just a lot of other extra healing sources that you can get on a period, right? You have that Nature's Vigil, you have the Vampiric yeah. Embrace, uh, you know, some extra, especially like with how much damage goes out on this boss, just any little extra thing helps as uh, who let them cook. You players getting quite low, but uh, the Evoker just like raw HPS so strong. Yeah, Evoker really has a lot of a lot of good cooldowns to deal with this as well. You've also got I wonder if they're playing Zephyr. They probably are too for the, for this particular fight. Yeah, Zephyr giving the group 20% damage reduction from that as well when needed. Uh, so as long as they can kill this boss before the next eye of the storm, that one's going to be the one where they're they're starting to look like they're a little bit light on uh, on cooldowns, but I think they will be able to kill it either before or during that cast reasonably safely. And a lot of people have extra defensives available of their own. You know, you you got a DK on your team, they can just hit AMS and Death Strike if they need to. Obviously, you really don't want to make your DK cast Death Strike, but they can if they if they need to. They'll just complain for a little bit. But it is Empyrean <laughs> who've got that boss down first and are now heading over. We'll see what pull they've got here. The sort of standard has been eight mobs into the corner. And it looks like that is the idea here for Empyrean as well. Yeah, as they get through that second boss rather cleanly. So they'll bring everybody here to the corner. Uh, just really mow everything down. As I believe they did mind suit the patrol. That was kind of going back and forth. So uh, they'll, he'll, they'll have him out of the way for uh, just a little bit. But who let them cook? They're not that far behind. I mean, this is such a close game. Uh, especially about five seconds of a, a death there for who let them cook. Uh, this is really... You're, whichever team kind of comes out plays the rest of this perfect. I, I feel like this is going to be a situation where... Uh, no, earlier we had the, the Ragnarok go off on God Kick Skovald and really kind of almost make a game really close. Something like that would decide this uh, first map, potentially. Yeah, who let them cook doing a very good job, despite being quite a bit lower seeded than Empyrean, uh, of putting up a really impressive run so far. Although, as 
We say that we are starting to see now a death come out for them. Another player dropping very low. Looks like no release is going to be used here. That's probably a heads-up decision. Faster to just res afterwards rather than getting stuck behind those patrols. Although, with a player dead now, you're starting to run into the risk of maybe some casts are not going to be interrupted for who let them cook. And you can sort of get a cascading problem here. And it's actually going to be the battle res here that they're attempting. Mm. But Volcanic is going to grief them. Oh. As they, uh, they don't have any good battle res available with their DK dead. And now their warrior is going to die as well. Uh, and so with that happening, it looks like they're potentially not going to use the battle res anymore. Meanwhile, Imperian are taking this opportunity to just stomp on the gas pedal, right? And just leave who <laughs> let them cook uh, behind. Like, ah, oh, there's only going to be, you know, well, one kind of fail could really decide this. Then right after that, uh, who let them cook? Uh, just yeah. unfortunate there. <laughs> uh, in the corner is, uh, looks like, a, you know, on the Imperian side, uh, they're working on, uh, you know, the first stage yeah. of uh, Fenrir. Um, yeah, hard to also, be sure. Yeah, we're, we're uh, we've got a beautiful scenic vista here on the side of Imperium, but I guess you can see on Vendor's health frame that it's being fought right now. They've probably pulled it into the the four Valor jar. Yeah, it looks like that's exactly uh, what they have just finished up here, and that's actually their second bloodlust as well uh, that's been used by Imperium, which. It's pretty good because you might get a third in this dungeon, right? And uh, you get yeah. a third right at the end of Odin, potentially. And in order to do that, you do just have to press it on cooldown with the way that the timer works in here. And they don't have a rogue to, like, uh, go out and vanish and skip some of the bleeds that come down here uh, on Fenrir. Uh, which is also interesting because uh, you know, for Who Let Them Cook, they do have the rogue. But only running with sub, you can actually run two charges of the vanish, opting to actually not take. Uh, the two charges of the Vanish going for, uh, I believe, Fave to Nothing, which is just like a movement speed increase, uh, and then just the damage taken, uh, just a DR for 10% uh, for 8 seconds after gaining Stealth Vanish or Shadow Dance. So I get a little bit more constant damage reduction, um, where you just don't have that second charge of Vanish, but on a boss like this could definitely pay off. But look at this pull on the left. The jacuzzi here, Imperian <laughs> just in the hot tub of these <laughs> these volcanoes. Yeah, both of their ranged DPS have no choice but to tank those. If any, if either of them stepped off that post, they would instantly die as all those wargs would be able to figure out how to jump on them. Uh, and yeah, this is going to be a kite for a little while here. And this should work out pretty well for Empyrean, who let them cook, meanwhile, about a minute two behind at this point. The Grief Torch comes out from Empyrean to finish off that highest health wolf, and they'll be able to go right into Fenrir. No, they're not oh, going to go right into I was Fenrir. Gonna, yeah, I thought they were going to go right into Fenrir, hmm. but it looks like they're going to go get... They're going to try and pull the bears, bears back? Could it be bears onto boss, or is it just... Tempo bears. Do bears now so you have cooldowns for... Oh, wow! Here's the boss. It is right into Fenrir. <laughs> they're not bringing the bears onto Fenrir. They're bringing Fenrir onto the bears. Wow. Yeah, this is a, an interesting spot uh, to bring the boss. Especially these bears can be pretty deadly, especially to the tanks just trying to kite this for a period of time. So I'm really interested Ooh. how they start to try and deal with this. Who let them cook are doing wolves onto Fenrir, meanwhile. It doesn't look like it's all the wolves, but it is a lot of them. Now, like you said, they do have a rogue that could, in theory, be vanishing, but unfortunately not targeted by that first set of leaps. Uh, there are a couple of other racial ways that they have to deal with that. Uh, you know, they have, they have stone form or fire blood for people that have that bleed uh, on them. Uh, and they also have... Night Elf on a couple of characters. Actually, it's Empyrean that has a couple of Night Elves uh, that can Shadow Meld when targeted. You also have a Feral Druid, which if they're in their incarn, they do get one free Prowl too. So uh, a couple of different ways that these teams have to potentially stop those leaps from Fenrir uh, or mitigate the bleed afterwards. But yeah, nothing quite as good as like a, a double Vanish Rogue for it. No, and it looks like uh, they actually didn't have the Vanish up at the start there. Uh, they do have the the uh, Dark Iron Dwarf Ooh, racial, though. Thundering uh, Sun! Clear some of it there. <laughs> this, these let them cook. are wild. Oh, and, and Empyrean having a death as well, actually. So that's their first battle res used. Spirit Link Totem and Answer as well. Who let them cook? Once again, they're having a DK down, which means they need to use the uh, the battle res here, the engineering res. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to get it off, but they're going to lose some time here. Is that's going to be Empyrean clearing those bears and the boss uh, wow. Getting to eighty three percent, which is like, uh, that's the number. Yeah, that's the number you need, right, to just get right up towards top. Uh, 
interested to see what kind of uh probably gonna see this uh jump past and then shadow meld uh just trying to break this with the dragon um yep there it is so uh, gonna move in try and go towards that last part i uh, know of halls of valor yeah Ooh, it looks like they're not even gonna bother way. waiting for mind soothes as well some of these players just uh just popping those invis pots to get right upstairs and get the the kings started as quickly as possible meanwhile who let them cook getting started with this uh, bear pull. Now you can see with the Lust Timer, Who Let Them Cook ended up having their second Lust quite a bit later than Empyrean did, which makes it less feasible for them to get a third Lust in this dungeon unless they're, you know, losing already, right? And they're way, they're way behind and they're still in the dungeon at that 23 minute mark, which uh, is, is certainly a possibility with how a couple of these pulls have gotten for them. But it does mean Empyrean might be able to land a Lust at the end of Odin, which is uh, is very good that's one of the best times in terms of how much how many seconds you can save with the bloodlust ability what do you think of those two different approaches i really kind of liked how empyrean it was like a little bit like goofy to watch off the start um but i really like the idea of pulling all those wolves at once over to the pillar which is like fairly safe as oh you're oh. gonna lose your tank there for who let them cook uh and then pulling the bears onto the boss i thought that was really interesting there uh that could be the difference maker, right? Because they got two really big poles as opposed to having this split them up into like two to three. Yeah, I do think that the way that Dire Wolves did that poll earlier where they just took like all of the wolves into yeah. boss uh, is also really, really solid. And, and Who Let Them Cook also doing a good job with that poll. So I'm not sure that was like a huge point of... Uh, I guess the, the way that it turned out, of course, it looked... It looked maybe a little bit faster and a lot safer for Empyrean, although it's hard to describe Fenrir and Bears as being safe. They just made it look safe, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess I mean, you Empyrean, see how dangerous the Bears are. It looks like they've actually had their, their beers go a little bit wrong here. You can see one of those kings is much higher health than the others, uh, and it, it looks like it actually was not activated with the four, so this is going to be a little bit of a chain pull rather than doing all the kings at the exact same time. They are doing a good job here of prioritizing their single damage into that X-marked King Haldor uh, to be able to get him to die at around the same time here, but it is going to cost them eh, maybe 25 seconds, uh, which they probably had 25 seconds to give here and then some, uh, but oh get... yeah, and look at who let them cook. They're having to fight this this uh, stag all by itself <laughs> here for a little like... bit. Yeah, I saw oh, no. them standing there. I was like, what what, what are they uh, waiting for? But yeah, I guess uh, just a, a wild stag here. As you see, uh, they're just laughing as uh, that is... Uh, you have some unfortunate yeah. things happen. A stag comes into play. I mean, what, what do you do, right? Uh, you have the sentinel here in front of you as well. I mean, just that. It's like the absolute worst timing ever, I think. Yeah, they can watch the stream with the... It's like a two minute delay or so. So yeah. at this point they know, hey, you know, we've had five deaths. The other team has had gotten through most of the hard parts of the dungeon with just one. We know we're probably not winning this map, right? So <laughs> big smiles on the team, keeping the morale high and uh, staying alive to contest in the rest of the series. Because of course, even if you lose the first game by quite a lot, you know, you win two more close games in, yeah. in games two and three and, and that you win the series, right? So uh, keeping spirits high is, is an important thing here for who let them cook. That being said, you do want to make sure that you're still fast and you're still close enough to capitalize on a mistake that Empyrean might make here. So uh, you don't want to, you know, just throw away time if you can avoid it. Yeah, I mean, what? Scovald gets off an errant uh, Ragnarok cast at the end when the shield goes down. And that's like 30 seconds right there. Like, you, you know, the Odin runes can be tough at times. Like, you never know. But yeah, yeah Empyrean making their way through Scovald right now at like 60%. They've been... They've been cruising ever since I uh, you know of death at the early stages. Yeah, the the problem here for who let them cook is they they probably do uh, need it to be like a mid boss wipe rather than like yeah. a couple of random deaths or even that Ragnarok disaster that we saw happening for for dire wolves earlier. I don't think would even be enough for who let them cook to even come close at this point because it would only cost them those you know those twenty five seconds, uh, and that's not. This It seems like right now it's like a two and a half minute gap that Who Let Them Cook are staring down. Who Let Them Cook also only at 81% here. 
also it looks like have had a king go un, uh, unactivated. They mm. are bringing these sentinels into this pool, but the <laughs> fact that they had a king go unactivated here is going to be annoying for them too, because they have to be really careful uh, to not kill the unruly yell mob and give the other two kings unruly yell, because those sentinels are going to come into this pool and give them kick immunity. You can deal with one unruly yell, but you definitely can't deal with two uh, being free cast, so... That's going to be the, the challenge here for who let them cook. They also don't have Nature's Vigil or Vampiric Embrace to top the group after those yells are going out, so a lot of pressure on their evoker. Yeah, just the extra little bit of healing resources, right, for Empyrean go a long way, especially because, like, Shadow and Feral both do really awesome damage right now. Definitely comparable to, like, Subrogue and the Arms Warrior, so uh, you can bring both of those you know, classes in and get the benefits of their healing as well as uh, who let them cook working down uh, the rest of these kings? They do have the two sentinels, I believe, in there as well. So uh, right on top is that'll be God King Skull should be dropping here in just a sec. Yeah, so that'll be a fourth boss down here for Empyrean is uh, now going into Odin, right? They have uh, you know, two B-Res, they have the Bloodlust, everybody's got their cooldowns. They're, they're set up for you know, a really nice time here in Halls of Valor. Yeah, just going to come down to this Odin encounter. Odin, not a boss that we expect teams to wipe to all that often in the MDI, because especially if you're managing well, uh, it's, it's a little bit less lethal than the other ones, and you can't really do anything dangerous like pulling trash onto it. However, I am curious to see how much damage Empyrean will be able to, to get during their Bloodlust here, because they have made it back to their Bloodlust, right? 21 minutes on the clock, uh, so we are going to get a Bloodlust probably with all of their cooldowns on the first runic oh, yeah. brand and i suspect that odin is going to die before they exit valkyr form oh i i, I completely agree because uh what you're you're gonna have you have incarn you have the bloodlust you have army uh pi of hellhole like uh yeah. i imagine this boss is going to melt as soon as uh you know they get into that uh valkyr form is uh you mentioned uh, not not super scary because you can't pull like trash onto it really here uh, in the MDI, but like on live, I know this is deadly for oh, yeah. lots of groups. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, especially that runic brand dot can be really nasty if people are struggling to find their runes or if anybody gets stunned because you have all of these orbs crossing the middle of the room during the runic brand. It's it's definitely an intense part of the fight, but here comes that brand. Everybody is playing quite near the center. Dispersion is even used here uh, to make this a little bit safer. And this is going to overlap with Thundering as well. Wow, they're going to just do so oh. much damage here for this next little bit. I've never seen a better Thundering timer uh, than just has happened right here for Empyrean. And even on 21 Tyrannical, Odin is going to go from 91% to 80% in like 20 seconds. That's crazy. Yeah, they pop the uh, the Nature's Vigil and the Vampiric Embrace there, allows their healer to just focus a little bit on some extra damage, and that'll be it, is uh, Empyrean will take out Odin. That was fast. Yes, it was. Empyrean, with the uh, victory here in Halls of Valor, they will go up one in the series. Uh, you know, who let them cook? Kept it pretty close, but Empyrean, uh, with some interesting pulls, Tettles kind of trying to, setting up a, a victory there. Else being attacked, yeah, by it, cat, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely getting attacked by a cat right now. I, th I thought that I thought that Empyrean, <laughs> specifically the Fenrir area, was uh, fairly unique from them. Not something that we have uh, commonly seen how they were pulling, you know, those bears into that boss. I thought that they, they lost a lot of time if, whenever we were comparing splits to like dire wolves. But I, I did think that Empyrean did show a lot of interesting just strategy in here. This first pull, though, this is the Arms Warrior show. I loved seeing this Arms Warrior. This is the type of pull that Arms excels at. Just look at how much damage he is doing um, and he is able to do on this first pull. You see him spinning in there, uh, getting getting in on top of all of those mobs, making sure he's doing infinite dam, killing off all the pack. You know, the Storm Drake is 70% HP. <laughs> We're got to cleat that down with Sweeping Strikes later. But uh, overall, most of this dungeon was was pretty Empyrean favored. Uh, they, they did a lot of um, pretty large pulls in situations where they needed to. I think that they could have saved some time here and there kind of merging packs together, but then there's a question of like, uh, how much time do they need to really save? Uh, we, again, I'll reference back Direwolves because I feel like Direwolves is one of their closest competitors and, and we saw them play this dungeon earlier. Direwolves was some of the stuff that they were doing. They were able to just get out of the Fenrir area faster. They were able to um, just get some of the pulls dealt with faster and while they were a little bit more dangerous, 
in some situations. Uh, I think that some of the stuff that Empyrean showed could be replicated by other teams, specifically this. From the, the Grizzlies, they get pulled into Fenrir. Um, you're also pulling some of the wargs into the boss. And we saw teams pull the, the wolves into the boss earlier. And while that is scary, I think that doing all of the bears, and that way you're able to get out of this Fenrir area almost immediately, I think that I think that this is uh, pretty smart. Uh, they did have a death, you know, but it happens. Sometimes Fenrir uh, leaps onto people. People don't, you know, prowl. We, we're out of melds. The tank has to save meld actually, because uh, and, and something that I was I was surprised out of was the tank was night elf. But this is the only reason he was night elf. That for the whole entire dungeon he was only an elf just to get in and out of this area um, with that meld. Things were going, you know, pretty pretty to plan over the course of the whole entire dungeon. They did mess up their four king pull, and it became a three king pull, which you know, not great. We would we would much preferred it the other way, but uh, I think that if they get a redo, they can save you know forty five seconds pretty easily there. That that is that is a big loss. That is a forty five second time loss by having to repull that king. Yeah, uh, it didn't end up hurting them. Uh, well, I mean, it hurt their time, of course, but didn't end up preventing them from getting <laughs> the dungeon win at least. Getting the 1-0 lead in the series, who let them cook with a little bit of catch-up that they uh, they need to do. You know, overall, the, the damage across the board, just a little bit lower. Uh, but I do really like seeing the Arms Warrior again. I think it's a really cool spec. I think the uh, the plan was was neat, using that alongside the, uh, the Rogue and the DK, but just need a little bit more with it. But uh, now we look ahead to Temple of the Jade Serpent, which, uh, of course, is going to be a, another one of our tyrannical dungeons. So we'll see if things shift there as we uh, take a look at the combat log for the last dungeon. Fairly even across the board. Uh, I, yeah. I think the in the uh, damage uh, meters of the last one, I thought you saw the, the effects of the arms warrior. The arms warrior was really good. I wonder if they end up running it again here on uh, Temple of the Jade Serpent. Uh, and also, this is one where Who Let Them Cook said that they're scared of the first boss here, so definitely a little bit worried, uh, worried for them going into that one, but <laughs> Uh, both of these teams uh, put up a pretty good uh, first map in terms of uh, you know damage about even across the board, and same with healing. Yeah, I think everybody's a little bit uh, scared of the first boss there, but uh, Tuttle's fighting his own boss. Show us your on, cat. Uh, the webcam there. <laughs> Dude, he's right here. <laughs> I don't. I don't disrupt there him. He just he just sits here. He's vibing. He's vibe. He, he, he subscribes to the <laughs> who, who let them cook yeah. ideology of gaming vibes only. Yeah, didn't look that bad in Dungeon I, One. The vibe. I will say, first boss Temple of Jade Serpent does disrupt the vibes fairly often. Yeah, like yes, for such a simple boss, right? You know, it has like two and a half mechanics and barely Dude. that. One of them is use an yeah. interrupt, right? And, and yet, and yet, I consistently die to that thing. It's uh. It's crazy. That that is a a humbling boss encounter for uh for I guess well, a lot of us. They they have an additional third mechanic this week with quaking. Do we expect to see a wipe to Wise Mari? Oh. Is is there Oh, yeah, give me a prediction. Well, I think that, I think that there's a chance. Yet. I think that we're due Maybe for yet, one, yeah? But yeah, I mean, if you want to curse one of our team's titles, yeah. I, I guess you could say we're we're I, due for one. But if you were due for one, it would be an all melee group going in here. <laughs> yes, and just that is very true. Next next week, when we throw quaking and storming together on there, is that even a, a legal affix <laughs> combo? <laughs> if I it mean, is, I don't even. I don't even know. I don't, I don't think that live. boss is possible. Then, yeah, yeah, well, mathematically it's the, uh, for now. You know, spiteful, not exactly uh, nice to melee either. Sometimes it pops out, you're not paying attention, you take a, a big couple melee hits before you start to realize. So it's uh, something else to be concerned about. <laughs> Excuse me. But either way, it's going to be the dungeon that defines this series for who let them cook. Will they get a win? Will they push it to map number three for the first time today? Or will we see our fourth 2-0 in a row as Empyrean closes it out? A lot of it does come down to that first push, uh, and then arguably the first boss too. Yeah, I mean, the g if you wipe to the first boss here uh, <laughs> on live, that would be a GG go next. <laughs> there is no, you just have to keep going <laughs> here. Yeah, the fir the first pull and the uh, the pull that are in the courtyard are typically the two 
pulls that we see the most deaths on. Um, the pull in the courtyard is likely to wipe you if you messed up. The pull, this first pull here, is uh, you just run back most of the time. Well, let's check it out. So, uh, all we right. let them cook. We get a little bit of a change, right? So they'll bring in the DK. They'll keep Ooh. the rogue, and then they're all set a fellow Oh, they took so much damage. They only lose one there. Uh, for a second, it looked like they were going to lose some more, though. This is really rough for them. They are actually going to lose their rogue as well afterwards, and their feral druid died after popping all cooldowns. The whole team is going to die here. This pack is going to just start free casting. You have all these stops and all these interrupts that you lose when somebody dies. You have all this damage that you lose, so mobs are living for longer and they're casting things they wouldn't normally get to. So that's going to be very bad for who let them cook, who are trying to keep the pole alive, but it's not going to work. They're going to have to go much slower with this. Meanwhile, Empyrean have also had a death and they've had to use their battle res, but they are getting on to boss here. So, Empyrean are potentially in danger later now without that battle res, but wow, this first pull worked out well for them. And yeah, who let them cook are in that situation where on live servers you'd be like, okay, two chests to 21. So what was this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to just, you want to just go down one? Uh, why did they make us predict if somebody would get a, a, a wipe there? And it was the first thing we saw. Is that just unfortunate because that, that, that pull is really difficult to execute. Uh, and, uh, and when you don't, it even more punishing, right? Because you don't have the blood loss now. You've most likely used, like, all of your cooldowns is, uh, see uh, another few deaths out of who let them cook here. So, uh, Look at the Imperium. smiles, though, on, uh, yeah, they're just on smiling. the face As there. soon as they died the first time, they were just smiling, laughing. They're having a ball, but uh, Empyrean, they, they make it through there. Uh, they do have that one death, uh, and now they're on uh, Wise Mary. Uh, well, one thing we've seen, uh, I know, in the, the few dungeons today on Temple of Jade Server, with uh, some groups running the rest of Shaman, that first pull, like when everything's grouped up, being able to use the spirit link right away is definitely uh, something that has kept some groups alive or at least kind of let them stabilize a bit. So uh, the rest of Shaman, you know, getting some love in Mythic Plus. Yeah, it works out really nicely in this dungeon in particular. You know, you've got, like you said, Spirit Link Totem for these big bursts of damage on kind of random players or all players. Uh, you, get, you get to have everybody kind of health potioning in there and healing everybody. And... Uh, it also brings the curse to spell in this dungeon, which is really nice, right? Who let them cook do have one curse to spell in their in their feral druid if they want it, but it's a lot more awkward to cast out of that, and that's that's not usually something you'll see feral druids do willingly. Whereas Empyrean have the feral druid with uh, with it if if they need, but they also have it on their healer, which is really big. That's uh that's really nice for those mist weavers later in the dungeon, and you have an interrupt on a very short timer uh, on that shaman, which is also really good. I mean, when you think about that first pull that, that Who Let Them yeah. Cook wiped to, you got like five casters in there casting Tidal Burst and Hydro Lance, and uh, if your healer is able to kick four of those casts instead of just one or two, that's that's really big. Yeah, the rest of Shaman just brings sick utility, right? With all that, you know, cap totems for other parts of the dungeon as well. Um, and then also with the buffs to like Acid Rain uh, recently, I think yeah. they're like something like 120% damage or whatnot. Like, uh, the amount of damage they can put out with just like lava bursts and just healing rain down is actually like pretty significant. Uh, so looks like Empyrean actually dealing with Wise Mario quite well here. Uh, no, down to six percent. Who let them cook will make their way to the first boss, but uh, they got to be so careful. Uh, you know, no B res is here available uh, for them. No bloodlust either. Yeah, they are fifty-seven percent of the boss's health bar behind. They also have 12 more deaths than Empyrean, which is, oh, 13 uh, more deaths that, than Empyrean. It's the all melee group, man. Oh, 14 more quaking. deaths. We saw a quaking there. It's, uh, that is unfortunate. I see that they're, they're just, uh, I love the spirits, oh, though. I kind of mentioned in their sheet that they're Let's just go. vibing. Go bear form, yeah. As uh, uh, you see uh, Mungi in the bottom oh. right just laughing like uh, they know. Look, when it rains, it pours here on uh, Temple of the Jade Serpent. Oh no, and that is our our Wise Mari wipe as predicted. Not just the first full, but also Wise Mari and Empyrean here just need to avoid disconnecting. They just gotta keep their internet connection stable and they should be able to keep this one <laughs> in the bag at this point. There are 17 deaths separating the two teams. That's a minute and 25 seconds, plus a full boss's health bar, plus all of this extra trash now that Empyrean are starting to get. And this is uh, quickly becoming quite an insurmountable lead. Ooh, look at look at what their healer is doing here, putting some damage into that scroll downstairs by hopping onto the uh, onto the wall there. That's a really good way to start that RP. As soon as, if you can kill that scroll early, yeah. 
uh, then you can get that RP going. We saw Timber Maw from Donuts even using a special uh, trinket from Razageth to do a lot of damage to that. It does not look like that is being used, however, by Empyrean, uh, just with a little bit more of a standard Broodkeeper's Promise Whispering oh, Incarnate they... Icon setup. It get, gets really low, though, uh, as uh, Empyrean drops down, but uh, looks like they're going to be able to keep everybody healed back up. Yeah, we've seen a, a few uh, you know, groups where uh, if you have the Resto Shaman, they're able to jump up onto that railing and put some damage down into the scroll. Uh, earlier, we saw a group with a Warlock actually use a gate from on top of like that area and go all the way down. As uh, Kyrian almost making their way to the second boss here, just a little bit more trash to go. Is uh, who let them cook back here on Wise Mari? Fifty six percent. So uh, we'll see if they're able to you know, get that boss down. But like you mentioned, they'd have to make up a ton of time here uh, in in a tremendous comeback to be able to do so. Yeah, I mean they are. Seven minutes into this dungeon, and they are close to seven minutes behind at this point. It is uh, very, very catastrophic what has happened here for who let them cook. Uh, that being said, you know, the rest of the dungeon is hard. You could imagine Empyrean, if Empyrean wiped late light. into a boss twice, then maybe who let them cook could catch up. That's the best path here if you're a, uh, a fan of who let them cook, which, you know, it's hard not to be given... Uh, Given the the team vibes and the the arms warrior from last key and the, the camera with the the big smiles yeah, on even as things are going wrong, the bear oh, form. Wow, so, <laughs> who let them cook to... lucked out there with the uh, direction of that wash away. If that had gone the other way, there they would have been in some trouble. Wow. Yeah, as uh, for Purian here, uh, working on peril and strife, uh, they did end up. Uh, you know, having some cooldowns to send in this uh, nature's vigil, they ended up using a PI here. Uh, see, they're like about you know, 40 seconds to army. You probably hold that because you're going to do that big courtyard pull that comes up after this. But uh, looks like who let them cook in or up there on the uh, wise Mari looking like a, this This could be a kill here. 5% is uh, no, from now on. I think if you're them, like you keep those vibes, you keep them rolling, right? Yeah. Like if, if you just have to play pretty, pretty perfect from here on out and then hope there's some like unreal shenanigans that happen with Empyrean, but uh, they'll actually deal with the Peril and Strife rather quickly, and uh, now they'll move on to what we probably expect is going to be a rather large courtyard pull. Yeah, so who let them cook? Keeping spirits high after finishing up Wise Mari progression. Empyrean are going to be using a Shadow Meld skip here to get past this first Infester. Their tank got in combat with the Infester. Everybody else just ran on past, and actually it looks like they have a healer in combat with it as well. That's not good. That's not supposed no. to happen. So they're going to actually have to recover here uh, because that Infestor was certainly there. They were trying to skip it, but now they've gotten combat with it. And so they're actually just going to slow down. This isn't going to be catastrophic for them. And it's very good that they didn't continue with their plan and they correctly called, okay, come back. Let's just kill this. And then we'll go into the courtyard. You know, we are slower by one pull than we would like to be now as a result of this happening, but we can live that, right? We can. We just don't want to have uh, start wiping and start wiping with this one minute run back that you'd incur at this point in the dungeon. Yeah, and I'm super curious how they ended up actually end up pulling this over because uh, the tank brought it to the side. Everybody kind of ran around, right, and then melded. Uh, but it looked like the infester maybe like spawned the like little ads, which maybe. I don't think should like kind of target but maybe uh if the tank jumped back and then had a heal on them like sometimes like aggro can kind of get funny and then like maybe the the healer would have had it and got some of those ads but uh killing that though maybe now there's a, a possibility you can there's really not much to skip here right it's just maybe those two people that usually pull on the ramp yeah. uh, down on the opposite side you probably skip them now yeah you don't need those for count anymore so i suspect we will see those not played at all and Empyrean are going to be taking this courtyard in two medium-sized pulls, which is a little bit of a, a contrast to the donut strategy of doing it in one very large pull and then one very small pull. Uh, Empyrean instead are doing three packs and then three packs instead of five and then one. So, oh, look at that triangle right in our camera. That was really nice. The, uh, the world marker had come down for Empyrean as they're starting to plan out how they're positioning throughout here. Meanwhile, who yeah, let them cook? Getting started on second boss. So not yeah. too far behind. No, I mean, it's really just when you have those wipes at the start, it's just really unfortunate. And I, 
I think on uh, the Empyrean side, you may have actually ended up splitting this up, because I think they actually ended up using some of their DPS cooldowns uh, when they actually had the Infester up, and they mm. pulled some of that other stuff on the ramp, um, because they came out of that second boss with the army, and now it's on six minutes, so I imagine they may have actually used some of their bigger DPS cooldowns there, uh, and then not yeah. had them to just do a big pull here. Probably figured at that point, like, you just play it save all throughout uh, to get up to this next boss. Yeah, the army timer for Unholy is a, it's a little bit of a bait as well because it does it does get reduced by a lot. It gets reduced. You can see it's already down to four minutes here for uh, for Heart on the side of Empyrean, but it definitely was used on one of these three pulls. And yeah, I'm curious if this was their plan as well, or if they if they made made an adjustment, uh, like you said, because of that investor getting pulled. Definitely seems possible as they go straight into the third boss. This one can be pretty nasty for prop warriors, particularly between 70 and 30% health. Those Jade Serpent Strikes do a lot of damage and put a huge healing absorb on a spec that doesn't have a whole lot of answers for it uh, once you start getting deeper into the fight. So we'll see how they decide to cycle defensives to get through that. A lot of it's going to be healing as well. Spirit Link really powerful against that as well, so may see that coming in for one of them uh, to just mitigate it almost entirely. Yeah, I'm probably going to see all the DPS cooldowns sent uh, at that point uh, on this boss, trying to get through that as fast as possible. Uh, and make Ooh. sure the tank can uh, live uh, at least a little bit easier as uh, everybody's going to clear here as I'm uh, getting very close to that boss transitioning, and now they will into that Jade Essence. So uh, now you're going to see you know, things like the Incarn being used there from the Feral Druid. Lots Ooh. of DPS cooldowns used here. <laughs> All the the oh wow and link actually forced out here for empyrean they end up pressing the link to try and uh, save what looked like an almost dead warrior but now they don't have link for the next one so we have two charges of shield wall one of them is getting used on this one and then just bombing heals into the warrior and that's going to be enough to get through this jade serpent strike but we probably have to deal with two more we have one more charge of shield wall we have a last stand available there's also Spell Reflect and Spell Block, but those aren't too helpful because Spell Block doesn't help much against the Dot, and Spell Reflect also uh, not very much of a DR there, although better than nothing, so looks like they're going to have to deal with one more of these. But they have saved both Shield Wall and Last Stand, so should be totally safe here. Ooh. It actually looks like one charge of Shield Wall is even going to get saved for the, the Trash Pulls in their future, so really good here for Empyrean. You just see by the the, the warriors help art though, just like how how much damage they take. It's so difficult. Uh, they do a nice job also, like the DPS just stopping there for a second, exiting, allowing the tank to kind of regain aggro uh, when this dragon comes out. A lot of times, I uh, you know the dragon resets aggro sometimes uh, can end up taking out a, a DPS or two. But who let them cook? Actually, uh, making their way to the courtyard, so uh, they're gonna get a big pull in here. It's, uh, Looks like trying to make the way around the corner, maybe trying to clear. Yeah, they're going to get the, the clear there. Uh, not pulling everything, it looks like. Uh, just a, a little bit of this front section. Now going to get the rest of it. Yeah, oh, and they're, they've lost their Feral Druid, unfortunately. They do have a battle res available here. Timmy's going to have to cast that, which is annoying as an unholy DK, trying to pop some cooldowns here, losing a global and some runic power to that. Looks like a fear cast has gone off as well for who let them cook, potentially as a result of having a player dead. And that's going to lead to that same player dying once again. Somehow everybody else is still alive. Somehow their warrior is alive too here. Spellblock and shield wall going to combine to really handle all of those tank smashes for a little while here, but once that runs out, they're going to be in a lot of trouble here. Meanwhile, Empyrean getting that next pull going. They're not going to do all of this at once. They're going to do this half and half, it looks like. Yeah, and I was going to say, for who let them cook, they end up losing their uh, healer there. The rogue ends up popping cheat death. His, uh, they had to use so much early on uh, because so much damage. Uh, they had actually nothing left there uh, to be able to survive through the end. So uh, they'll have to do a little bit of a redo there in the courtyard. But uh, Empyrean? Uh, they're just pu pulling this stuff to the door. They, but they've played this pretty safe, I would say, right? Like, from the Infester on, I feel like they've played it uh, a little bit safer than we've seen, you know, uh, where teams have pulled, like, yeah. almost the whole courtyard. I feel like they have to have an idea, uh, you know, where they are in terms of the game and uh, know what's going on and who let them cook side and uh, realize they don't have to, you know, fully send it. It's just smart, right? Like, you, you know you're five minutes or more ahead. 
let's just not wipe, right? Let's let's just pull these half and half. I have no doubt that Empyrean could do that whole room all at once if they yes, wanted to. I, I bet they've planned it. I bet they've practiced it. But I doubt it's a hundred percent success rate, right? So. No need to mess around with something like that when you are this far ahead. Uh, just close the door, finish out strong, and uh, and take the pull a little bit more safely, and, and there's no way you could lose by doing that. Yeah, and uh, you see with the Vampiric Embrace, just the extra healing, uh, you know, from that uh, Shadow Priest, quite large, right? Getting up to, like, 47k HPS uh, at some point. Same, uh, you know, Nature's Vigil uh, from the Feral Druid, but now a little bit of HPS as well, and then they're going to Get right into the shot of doubt here at the end. Use a spirit link. Make sure everybody's going to get uh, topped up here as close as possible. Uh, just trying to like stabilize maybe a little bit. It's ascendance pumped as well. So going to be working on this boss. But man, they, they have uh, set a really good time thus far. I mean, what? 16 minutes. Uh, first uh, fragments of doubt come out. Get some stuns down on these. Get some damage. Uh... Uh, but this is uh, completely, you know, in their hands at this point. Yeah, Empyrean uh, have such a they have such a nice comp for this fight as well because you do have that Shadow Priest casting Mass Dispel on those two debuffs, and that that makes it just a lot easier to deal with it. You have Ursul's Vortex as those ads come out, and they're just getting gripped up nicely. You have Abomination Limb and Single Death Grips as well. So once you get to this boss fight, especially. I will say, evoker healers in general as well, th this tends to be one of the hardest fights to heal on an evoker healer, so being the Resto Shaman team is a nice is nice on this one as well. Uh, you can dump some heals into the person that is being targeted pretty nicely, whereas that's kind of a weakness of evoker. You don't have anything that feels quite as good as healing surge to dump into whoever is being, uh, being afflicted by that debuff. And yeah, Empyrean just got to get through the last two-thirds of this boss's health bar. Their lust is available, it looks like it's probably going to be after this ad phase that they are going to pop all of their cooldowns and lust. We'll see, though. Yeah, there's a, a vortex down, so that'll start you know gripping all the ads back up. They'll actually end up using the nature's vigil and uh, incarn here, but uh, you're going to have uh, PI army here used in the you know, a bomb limb if you want here. Maybe we save that for the next set of ads potentially. So this will be the blood lust, and this is where they're going to try and get a bulk of the damage down uh, onto the boss. Yeah, this is the full lust, the full cooldowns, the power infusion landing on the Unholy DK. One of the reasons that we see Shadow Priest and Unholy DK paired together so often and doing so well together is the fact that power infusion is a two-minute cooldown, Abomination Limb and Power Rune Weapon, also two-minute cooldowns. Unholy Assault, you can save. Uh, it's a 90-second cooldown, but you can you can save it for those two minutes when you are going to have the PI. And all of those combined together, and you can just see on the damage meters just how much value is added to that Unholy DK uh. from that Power Infusion. So a uh, really strong synergy between these two. Does look like we're going to get one more ad phase here for Empyrean. I believe this was the cast that Perplexed were beating, uh, but neither Donuts nor Empyrean seem to have... Uh, done that, although I will have to go back and count to make sure that I'm on the right cast here. Uh, still very good DPS coming out from Empyrean. And they're going to finish off they those like fragments so quickly. 40% of the boss's uh, health down during that uh, bloodlust window, so uh, really sick damage. Puzzle box used there by uh, the Feral Druid, so a little bit of mastery here to end it out, but like you mentioned, I mean, uh, Unholy DK and the Shadow Priest combo has been so sick, and then I also think just like Shadow Priest with the Mass Dispel, the Vampiric Embrace, like, uh, PI, just so much to offer here in this dungeon. I feel like you're going to have to see a lot of groups, uh, you know, bring this pretty consistently, as that'll be the whole thing there for Empyrean. Uh, they take this 2-0 over who let them cook. That's right. 2-0 for Empyrean. They will move on to face Donuts in the upper bracket uh, tomorrow. For now, though, who let them cook? Going down to the lower bracket. They are going to face Cement Gaming tomorrow in uh, their match for survival. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, what what can you say? The, it's a it's a tough dungeon, isn't it, Tuttles? Yeah, I mean, for who let them cook? It was it was what I was talking about. The first poll of the dungeon, very challenging to be able to deal with. Uh, sometimes, if you lose like one or yes. two players, then the poll can kind of get away from you because then you're letting Hydro Lances go through. You know, the Water Speaker casts aren't getting interrupted. Then your healer dies, and then we're full wiping. Obviously, they had that. Wipe on the first boss. I don't really want to harp too much on who let the them cooks failures. I think that that like, you know, it's tough dungeon. 
you don't practice for that. More often than not during practice, if you make a mistake of that caliber, you zone out and go again. For Empyrean, I kind of questioned some of their pulls. And so some of their stuff was really conservative. This, I don't expect to see tomorrow. Like, uh, the, the first couple of pull, pulls in this area, I don't necessarily expect to see tomorrow, especially if they believe that they can beat Donuts in any capacity. Like, they're, they're going to need to play a little bit more aggressive in here. But I bet that they looked and they were like, oh my gosh, who let them cook wipe to the first pack? Let's play this really slow, hold W, and just make sure to not wipe in this dungeon and get out of here. Like, they, they had, I will say, like, 1830 was their time, maybe a little bit higher than that, 1850-something. Whereas Donuts in their previous Temple of the Jade Serpent was at 1521. And we know that the uh, winner of the series, which it does end up being Empyrean, is going to play Donuts in the first map uh, that of their series is Temple of the Jade Serpent. And now Empyrean at 1857, they wouldn't be close. But I think that the pulls that they were doing were more suited towards, okay, who let them cook white? We can play this a lot slower as opposed to, oh, we are playing against, you know, a, a top rated team. We have to be able to play our best Temple of the Jade Serpent. If that was their best Temple of the Jade Serpent, I would be very... Um, I'd be very surprised and concerned for them tomorrow, but I think that overall, what they what they did for Empyrean, it was fine. They they were just trying to get out of this series, but they need to make sure that their Temple yeah. of the Jade Serpent looks good tomorrow. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think you know the teams obviously are paying attention to how each other are doing the dungeons, and if you do see that one team fall that far behind, you do take your foot off the gas a little bit, I would imagine, and and save it. Right? I mean, it's only day one of the weekend. You've got uh, another uh, couple days, theoretically, at least one big day tomorrow of matches. And so you want to make sure that you, you know, like you said, play as conservative as you can. Just get it done. For, make sure you secure the win and then put everything out there tomorrow. For me, if I'm Empyrean, though, I don't necessarily know if I want to play conservative. I, I feel like I would have liked to have gone full speed as like ut utilizing this as more of like a practice hmm. run because we do have that Jade Temple as like the first. Um, oh, there's that side tomorrow. of it, too. Like, yeah. Yeah, like I, I think that there's two sides of it. I think there's like, oh yeah, we could play it safe. We just win the, we just win the map, right? Like if we, if we lost the map to that, that would be ridiculous. But at the same point, I feel like there's also. I the mean, other we've side seen like, both, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we we've seen, I feel like we've seen teams like Echo definitely take their foot off the gas a little bit in some of the dungeons, and you know, say, all right, we're gonna whether that's saving, you know, something that they want to show later, or that's just, well, we know we're ahead, we don't have to push it, you know, to the utmost limit. And then we see other teams that, like you said, yeah, use it as a practice run. So it comes down to the team sometimes. Because we do know uh, Empyrean, what, in their time trials on Temple of the Jade Serpent was 1609, so two minutes uh, plus faster. So no, they can do it faster. They probably just kind of <laughs> yes. get their foot off the gas there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I, I do agree. I think I agree with Tettles on this that like being slowing down because you're ahead and you just you want to pull a little bit more conservatively. I mean, they were far enough ahead. They probably could have just still done their big thing, wiped and then come back and then pulled more slowly yeah. and still won. <laughs> yeah. and, and I That's do think, that, yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's a difference as well. What Echo does where Echo is like, hey, we're we're going to do our 14 minute route instead of our 12 minute route because we can win anyways and we want to hide the strat. I think that's a little bit different than like, hey, we're, we're just going to not do this really big pull because we're a little bit ahead. And I think, I think, yeah, maybe thinking about that kind of stuff, like when you see teams that never do that, those teams are usually like, they have a higher ceiling than the teams that uh, sometimes slow down when they're ahead and, uh, and are a little bit more willing to, you know, to take their foot off the gas. This is just a series that Sounds I feel like, like you should go all out on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like we will see teams you... go all out tomorrow, that's for sure. In the lower bracket, like it is do or die for Boar's Money Crew and Ducks Can Fly. <laughs> and then Cement Gaming taking on Who Let Them Cook. Uh, <laughs> we will see our upper bracket <laughs> matches before that. Uh, I, do, yeah. I do agree with Tettles, though. Like, you have one opportunity to test, uh, not really test, but like just in a live match state, like, you know, do what you've planned to do, right? Like, there's a difference between practicing it, right? And like, you know, being able to just kind of do it over and over, like, just to have that little extra pressure. And I think like you said, Dranos, they would have had to wipe their what, three times probably to like, <laughs> yeah, have it like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> so here's our, uh, uh, here's... our map pools tomorrow's. Ooh. We've got some unbannable Azure Vault at the end of our day that we didn't get Ooh. to see any of today. Shadow Moon Burial Grounds as well. We're so guaranteed to see those maps. But there is going to be a little bit more of the uh, the temple early in the day. So 
Yeah, Tuttles, like you said, this is an important map for a lot of teams, depending on their position in the bracket, to really prepare for because our rule is you can't ban that first map in the series, right? That that one is always unbannable. The other four, uh, you can you you got to ban, so you can sometimes have a, a map that you're not ready for. But if one of them appears in your tournament a lot in that first slot in particular, you got to have a good idea for how you want to deal with it. I'm I'm interested in seeing how Direwolves versus Perplexed shapes up tomorrow in that Court of Stars. Direwolves had uh, court that they played today, they, you know, I think they could have gone a little bit faster in their court of stars. I, I got a DM after the fact saying that they, they could have saved you know twenty to thirty seconds here, twenty to thirty seconds there. Um, they think that they could have improved on their time by a significant amount. And I wonder just like how much practice they put in that court, like over perplexed, right? Like is perplexed going to show up and be this number one seed in this group and absolutely just dominate direwolves or dot are direwolves able to kind of play spoiler in match five? Like what's really going to happen there? I think that the, I think that that map pool is, I don't want to say direwolves favored, but I think that it is pretty good for them. All things considered. Well, looking down at the rest of the matchups too, donuts, Versus uh, Empyrean. And that one you'd imagine is going to be a bit Donuts favored, but you never know. Yeah. I mean, the, the teams are a little bit... They're a few minutes apart in time trial times, but actually not that much. And both teams, I would say, showed some vulnerability today, even though they, they won fairly convincingly in 2-0 fashion. Uh, so I think that, especially when you look at the bracket it's likely that both teams really focused on that match between the two of them as, as probably the first point where they're really going to have to uh, have their maps super optimized. So we may see a, a higher level of precision and uh, execution out of both teams in those, in those dungeons in particular. Now, Perplexed has, I mean, they're a longstanding team. I think Shadowlands... Uh, so in BFA, they were dominant. Like, they, they were absolutely one of the top teams. They, they were putting it to Echo every single weekend, you know? Um, absolutely one of the top teams. In Shadowlands, they kind of fell off a bit. Now, three out of the top four teams had a mistake in their runs. Um, Perplex is the only team that really didn't have a mistake at all. They had one death in two dungeons, and they didn't have any, like, boss healing. There was no, like, uh, king issue in Halls of Valor. There was nothing that, that happened in their runs where they were like, oh, this is something that we have to be better about. Perplexed looked perfect. If they are going to maintain that level of consistency, I feel like it's going to be a straight sweep through this weekend. Yeah, certainly looking like the favorites at the moment, but you never know. We have a, a big day of matches tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm curious, as we close out day number one, uh, what, we, we got to get some learnings from our casters, from our analysts, as, as we usually do. We'll start with you. We'll start with our desk, our, uh, our desk guest for the day. Mr. X, what, what did you learn today? Uh, I learned that the first boss on Temple of the Jade Serpent is very, uh, it's very unforgiving. Uh, and not even just the first boss, that first trash, uh, because when you go around that corner and you pull everything and you pop bloodlust and you send all your cooldowns, if you don't kill it, you are in a world of hurt. Uh, that's what Tettles why, why Just look at the camera. Uh, I'm that's looking what, at that's you. what I learned today. Well, there you go. We're all making uh, oh, what did you learn very today? uncomfortable. What did I learn today? Yeah, I I learned that uh, maybe I do want to give arms another try. It's a it's a fu it's a fun spec, and I've been resisting it because I'm frankly not very good at rage management. I'll admit it. But after seeing it today, I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe I'll give it another shot. I think that's the ninth class. I know you want to give a try. I just love, <laughs> I want to. If I had time, I would play every class in the game, but I don't. So I play everyone ten minutes at a time. Dratnos, what did you learn? <laughs> Well, yeah, definitely learned a lot about how ARMS works. I also was pretty excited to see the Unholy. We saw the Bursting Sores playstyle uh, make a little bit of an appearance, like in that, I think it was the Ruby Life Pools, right? Where the key is low enough, the pulls are big enough that you get to get some value uh, out of really the Bursting Sores, like big AoE damage, uh, instead of just being kind of the more balanced Ebb and Fever setup. So that was cool to see. Um, a little bit more of like the old school Unholy setup too. So we that was cool. We saw a shine bust out the goyle in Temple of the Jade Serpent as well for uh, boss dam, and they, I think that that was one of the big reasons they yeah. were able to push that boss faster, is busting out the goyle. Yeah, that's right. Big combo with PI as well. So, yeah, 
uh, very, very cool to see these little build. Yeah. You know, sometimes we see MDIs where it's like, oh, Group A weekend, there's like 10 comps, and then Group B and C, there's two, right? Or there's one. This time around, it's like, oh, if anything, there's more diversity that we're seeing and more experimentation and more build swapping, I think somewhat based on how the, the talent system works, but so much cool stuff is being tried by these teams, and uh, yeah, really excited to see what they've got for us. There are a couple dungeons we haven't even seen yeah. yet, right? Like Algothar, Shadow Moon, Azure Vault, all these dungeons. Yeah. Uh, much more still to be seen this weekend. That's right. So on that note, we will see you all tomorrow. It's going to be six matches. We're going to see some teams get eliminated. We're going to see some teams move on, but it's going to be a great day of dungeons either way. So thanks for watching today, and join us again tomorrow for the Mythic Dungeon International. We'll see you then.